can I just see test if anyone can hear me? I'm having some sound difficulties. We can hear you, Patrick. Can oh, you hear me? I can hear you, Kevin, loud and clear. Thank you. Yeah, we can yeah. hear we we can hear and see you, but I think you were just yeah, you were having trouble. But it's, maybe just leaving and rejoining has I think started. that's done the trick. <laughs> yeah. Good, good morning. Morning. Morning, everyone.
Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, hearing session for the examination into the Stroud Local Plan. Um, this morning, we've got a fairly focused session um, for a couple of hours where we're going to be looking at strategic transport issues until we uh, have a more detailed discussion later on this morning and into this afternoon. I am going to be leading this session. Um, I am Victoria Lucas, one of the inspectors um, appointed by the Secretary of State to conduct the examination to the Stroud Local Plan. And my colleague, would you like to introduce yourself? Good morning, everybody. My name is Yvonne Wright. Thank you. Thank you. So for this morning's session, um, I can see on my screen, we have somebody from National Highways. If you'd like to introduce yourself there. Uh, good morning. I'm Lisa McCaffrey from National Highways. I'm the Spatial Planning Manager um, of the Southwest Region. And I've got my colleagues from WSP with me. Okay, thank you. And we also have Gloucester County Council, I believe. Um, who's going to be leading for yourselves? Morning, it's Nathan Drover. Um, I've got um, colleagues on modelling um, and local transport plan who can help out on some of the subjects. Thank you. And then we also have uh, Stroud District Council. And uh, Mr Russell, will it be yourself leading this morning? Um, good morning, inspectors. Good morning, everybody. Um, probably not today, actually. I'm going to be taking a, a side a side step uh, for my colleague from um, ACOM, Chris Carter, who's our transport consultant. But I am available, obviously, to answer questions on behalf of the, local, uh, the council. So I'm head of planning strategy and economic development. And I have my colleague, Conrad Moore, principal planning strategy officer with me. We also have... Um, Alex Fortin and Wayne Dyer from Arup, who will be able to answer questions on the infrastructure delivery plan. Simon Drummond Hay from HDH Planning and Development, who, um, if viability matters come up, he's available to answer questions. Although we do note that uh, matter 12 is, uh, the, is the, the primary area for considering viability matters. And finally, uh, Martin Evans, uh, our solicitor from One Legal, if there are any legal or procedural matters. Thank you. Thank you. And then we also have South Gloucestershire Council with us this morning, um, who will be leading for yourselves. If you'd like to just introduce yourself. Good morning, inspectors. I'm Patrick Conroy, the Strategic Planning Policy Manager at South Gloucestershire Council, and I'm joined today by my colleagues, Dan, Dan Jones, Principal Planning and Urban Design Officer, Miles Kidd, South Gloucestershire Council's Development Control Transport Manager, and Kevin O'Connor, Senior Transport Planning Officer. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's covered all the organisations that we should have in this session. Um, if there is anyone else here, please speak now. No, okay, excellent. Um, hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. I'm assuming someone would have shouted before now if, uh, if there was a problem. So I'll, uh, I'll carry on. Um, in terms of, sort of microphone and, and video protocol, there's only a few of us in here today, so I'm quite happy if you want to leave your video on if you're not speaking, but if you're, if you're not speaking, please do mute yourself so we uh, have uh, minimal background noise distracting us. Um, if you would like to speak, please use the hand raise function and I will bring you in at the appropriate time. Um, the first session this morning is only a couple of hours, so I imagine that we're going to kind of do it in one go. Um, so I'm not envisaging that we have any adjournments, but if we do, please stay logged in. Um, and likewise, when we do have the comfort break at half 11 before we carry on with uh, matter 11B, if you stay logged in and then um, other people will join the session um, at the appropriate time. Um, I think I heard, Earlier, someone was having a few issues with technology and as was discovered quite often, if you just log out and come back in, that normally resolves it. But uh, if, if anyone does have any problems, please do shout and uh, make us aware and uh, I'm sure the programme officer uh, will try and uh, assist. Um, you might notice whilst you're speaking that I'm not watching you, I might have my head down. That's purely because I'm taking notes. It's not because I'm not interested in what you're, you're having to say. I'm, I'm just taking notes for my own purposes. And also just a reminder that the hearings are being live streamed uh, this morning. Um, there is an agenda um, for this morning. It 
I'm largely pretty much going to sort of follow the relevant MIQs, but in a slightly different order, just to make sure we kind of try and get everything covered in, in this morning session that we need to. Um, just a reminder, I've read everyone's sort of representations uh, on, on sort of various issues. So there's, there's no need to kind of go into any in-depth uh, dis discussions on that. Um, other issue that's been raised this morning is that there is a uh, moment silence, minute silence at 12 o'clock, which I believe is to mark a year of the war in Ukraine. Is that correct? Please correct me. So, sorry, I'm just from the council. Um, it's it's not. It's to mark uh, the third year anniversary of COVID lockdowns. It's it's a national event. Ah, I, I do apologise. No I do apologise. I'm I'm trying to sort of uh, catch up on emails flashing across my screens as to the reason why. Um, so for those of you that would like to mark that, um, that's obviously entirely your prerogative. So uh, to accommodate that, we will be starting the session at one minute past 12 to allow for that. Um, and I believe the programme officer has made the other participants aware of that. So unless there are any questions, can't see any hands raised, we will start this morning's session. So the first thing that we, we wanted to understand really, and this, this is focusing on the strategic highway network this morning, we're not sort of talking about local roads, we're talking about essentially the motorways um, and the A38 corridor. We just wanted to understand um, what exactly are the infrastructure improvements that are required and why? So I don't know who would be best placed to perhaps the council might want to lead on, on that just to, to kick us off. Okay, I'll, um, I'll start off with that on behalf of Stroud District Council. Um, so this is, the, the, in terms of the motorway network, um, there was a strategic piece of modelling carried out um, which forecasts the effects of background growth, the effects of development as part of the Stroud Local Plan um, up to a year of 2040. The parameters of that strategic model has been, have been agreed between all of the parties and that's set out in the statements of common ground and um, effectively that identified impacts at junctions 12 and junctions 14 and um, a mitigation package was investigated for each of those locations um, which uh, effectively identifies that a um, that an additional bridge structure and large um, so effectively the strategic solution is likely to be a large roundabout um, signalized um, junction that, uh, mit that can, uh, can mitigate the capacity impacts forecast up to 2040. Okay. And is that um, predominantly due to the growth in proposed in the Stroud local plan, or is that background growth, or is it a combination of growth in the local area? It's a combination of, of, of all of those factors. Effectively, there will be a lot of background growth up to 2040. There is a, um, as, because we don't fully know, that we haven't got development plans identified with um, pro sufficiently progressed within the South Gloucestershire area and the JSP area to the north. Um, there has to be a forecast of the likely level of background traffic growth up to those points. Um, as a result of that, um, which would then be refined into the, into the future, but it effectively is a, a reasonable proxy for the scale of growth that's likely to occur. Um, and then it is also the Stroud development um, growth on top of that, which um, which results in the in in the identified need for the schemes through that modelling report. And for the proxy that you used um, to look at neighbouring growth, um, how did you go about that? Um, so effectively, it uses um, an industry standard approach called Tempro, um, which eff effectively it, there's a DF DFT forecasting package. Um, so that um, that basically puts into into the model a range of parameters regarding um, housing growth, um, economic growth, and just general background growth in traffic. 
um, which results in the level of traffic um, growth on an annual basis being being factored up. Um, and this is based on, um, I believe that the growth forecasts were, were done in the model in about, um, I think uh, the, the modeling was, it was agreed between all of the parties, but these modeling growth factors were were undertaken, I think in um, around about 2020 was the, the point where the model the model growth up to 2040 was was calculated um, and that effectively is, is one part of the um, of the jigsaw in building traffic com conditions from the present day up to the end of the local plan period so when you say all parties that was yourself well stroud um neighboring councils the county council and presumably national highways as well national highways Gloucestershire and Stroud District Council were parties to the model development and we understand that South Gloucestershire um, don't disagree with the um, with the process used to build the model and I think all parties agree that it's the it's the best available tool in order to look at traffic conditions in 2040. Could I just have um, South Gloucestershire view on that is that correct you don't disagree with the the basic parameters of the model that was used to forecast growth? Yeah, sorry if, if I could if I could speak if I may. Um, we we agree with the use of tempo. It's 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 the more detailed where the growth is allocated that we have difficulties with, because if it's allocated close to junction fourteen, then obviously it has a very severe impact at junction fourteen, whereas obviously our our, our district is is much larger than that. Yeah. Okay. Can I just come back on? On that point, because that yes, we could we agree that that's um, that that's South Gloucestershire's position. Um, Tempro effectively, um, it, it's a very it's it's quite a general approach because it because we don't have those allocation locations within um, within South Gloucestershire to be able to uh, put in a more specific um, approach. And I think that's I think that's borne out in in our um, statement of common ground with South Gloucestershire Council. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's more of a, a broad brush approach looking at growth across the general area rather than sort of focusing into the specifics of where that growth is going to take place, per se. Outside of the district, yes. Within the district, it's more specific because we, we are proposing the allocations and those, are, those aren't included within the temporary growth. Those are added specifically to the model. Okay, thank you. Okay, so in terms of the actual schemes that have been proposed are there any actual detailed worked up schemes at the moment that have a design that you can sort of look at that's going to give you a rough estimate of what's going to need to be <laughs> so i thought comrade was was coming in but um no the um so what we what the modeling has has done is it set out the scale of the scheme needed, and at, at this um, at this early stage in in scheme identification, effectively what we what we know is that it needs to be effectively a large um, a large roundabout spanning across the motorway um, with signalised slips um, on each of the on each of the approaches. Um, there is previous work undertaken at junction fourteen, um, which has um, which. Um, has been supplied by um, by national highways to give us an idea an indication of um, that of a project of a scheme that could be introduced however I think this is probably going to make this this point um, it's a previous piece of work that isn't related to this project um, and ultimately it's a it's a scheme of a similar scale but it is not specifically the modeled scheme or the scheme that has been been further developed Thank you. Okay, I am going to talk in a bit more detail about the scheme itself a little bit later. So I don't know if National Highways would prefer to come in then, or did you want to come back on that point? Yeah, can I just come back on your original question? So from National Highways perspective, perspective um, we do agree that strategic infrastructure is required at both junction 12 and 14. Um, just to add to Chris's point or what Chris didn't say is that we also agree something's required at 13. Now that is 
specifically related to developments around 13 and it is considered more small scale but I just want to pop that in there that the local plan sets out the need for schemes at all three junctions. So the ones around junction 13 are more specific to Stroud rather than the general background growth and what's going on in neighbouring districts? That's correct. It's specific to um, the Ecotricity Stadium development and North West Stonehouse, I believe. Um, yeah, OK. Is Qued Quedgley around that area as well? Is that? Uh, Quedgley is, um, is Junction 12. Junction 12. Um, yes, and we understand that those schemes are currently being at, at Junction 13, that is currently being addressed through the development management process. Okay. And it's also, it's it's a significantly smaller scale than we are talking about for 12 and 14. I apologise, I can't work out how to put my hand up, so please excuse my, me if I just jump in. Okay. Okay. Right. It might be useful because I, I, I was looking at the um, diagram on page yeah, 24 okay. of um, the local plan itself, and it's it's not very clear where the different junctions are. Um, I must admit, I was looking at it last night. So um, just as sort of a, a, a wider point, it might just be useful to, you know, for someone that's trying to have a look at and understand the plan and sort of work out where different places are. Um, it's... Uh, it's a bit tricky when uh, the junctions aren't labelled uh, to sort of place uh, what goes where. Um, Can I come in on that? Sorry, uh, to yeah. just just as a point of clarification, um, the local plan on page seven. Page seven, which essentially is a map of the district identifying a number of um, features, railway stations, um, motorway junctions, and various environmental constraints. So if you see um, on page seven, you'll see sort of running broadly north to south, you 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 have junction 12 towards the north, at, at fairly close to the edge of Gloucester, junction yeah. 13 to the west of Stonehouse and Stroud, and junction 14 is actually in South Gloucestershire, but, but clearly right at the, the southern end of the district. Yeah, it's, it's generally sort of useful to kind of like merge the two, really, because then you can sort of see where the growth is. It's just, um, yeah, it's just a little bit, just a, a, a bit tricky to try and sort of, you've got to fold that page over and look at the two. But and anyway, OK, thank you. Um, we will carry on. Um, right. So Junction 13, smaller scale. Have you got a price um, worked up for that scheme? You know roughly how much the cost is going to be? Is that a realistic assumption that that's going to be able to be funded through the development management process? Council or National Highways can come in on that. There is a cost in the LTP. I will just dig that out for you, Inspector, one second. Was that... Sorry, was that Junction 13? Junction 13, yes. Um, yeah, again, as um, Chris said, that has been led by um, the applicants that would bring for, forward the site. The one thing I would say is that at the moment, it doesn't appear to be in the IDP, and we feel it should be included in the IDP, Junction 13. Um, I'm not aware of the cost, but I think someone said they'll pull it out for you. OK. Um... Is there a particular reason why that scheme isn't mentioned in the IDP council? Uh, it, it is included in the IDP. It's included in the the, shed, the project schedules that we issued as part of the original IDP in, in 2021. The updated IDP refers more specifically to the updated evidence on the basis of the, the work that Chris and his team have been doing on the funding and delivery plan. So obviously that focuses more specifically on junctions 12 and 14, but it is included in the original IDP. So they need to be both read together as an as the addendum and the original IDP. 
Okay. I was going to, looking at um, statement common ground between um, Stroud and National Highways, I've noticed that there are um, a few requests that National Highways have made about modifications to policies to include various reference to infrastructure. So it, I was going to suggest at the end of the um, agenda that we sort of go through those and perhaps probably useful for you, the two of you to sort of go away, have a chat about it and come up with a list of something that you can uh, agree on um so probably try and bottom out that issue there and then come back to us with uh, with an agreed position on it okay um so in terms of the actual site allocations themselves just to sort of probe this issue again of the sort of connection between um growth and the infrastructure required. Are there any particular um, site allocations that are dependent on um, these junction improvements being delivered? And as, as I understand it, the junctions are operating at capacity or is it above capacity at the, at the present time? Are you specifically asking about Junction 13 or are we now broader on to 12 and yeah, 14 sorry, as well? We've, we've, we've moved on from Junction 13 and on to 14 and 12. Okay. Um, so the timing of the need for the schemes are um, is something that would be agreed through the development management process. The um, the I think it's it's fair to say that the need for the scheme for Junction 14 is, um, is significantly earlier um, and um, what the funding and delivery plan does is it identifies the proportionate impact of um of each of individual sites within the Stroud district on each of those um on each of those locations so perhaps from national highways in in your view is are those junctions 12 and 14 are they acting at capacity at the moment or are they above capacity at the moment um, they are, Junction 14 does operate with mainline queuing, so um, one would say at peak times that would be accommodating above capacity. Junction 12 again will experience short periods where queuing may extend onto the main line. Um, Inspector Nathan Drover from GCC has his hand up. Sorry, if I can just continue. Um, in terms of the point um, with regard to when, um, we have made it clear in our reps that the when testing hasn't been undertaken. And it is our view, noting that mainline queuing can occur, that um, schemes would be required quite early in the plan. And from a national highways perspective, it feels too late to wait for the development management process to be able to determine that they would need to bring forward a scheme. We'd also be reliant on a number of developments coming forward at the same time to be able to fund the scheme. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Drover? Thank you, ma'am. Um, yeah, uh, I'll just... Um, you have Gloucestershire County Council's representation. So I just wanted to pick up a ancillary point. I won't distract around away from Junction 13. It's very interesting. Um, you mentioned the statement of common ground. Um, you'll find that um, South Gloucestershire National Highways and the County Council are aligned in their concerns about um, the M5 junction costings, cost apportionment, funding and deliverability. The thing I wanted to clear up, you have um, uh, SG04 um, from GCC. Um, so that statement of common ground 04, um, uh, that deals with um, early consideration of transport matters, future collaboration. Um, uh, I think we agree concentrated growth strategy rather than dispersal. Um, and um, we agree the conclusions to the modeling. Um, uh, what I want to clear up is that was a um, an earlier position, 2021. Um, what happened was the... Um, very recently, the minerals position, and I think Stroud can confirm what was agreed in the minerals, was updated, um, and then the statement of common ground just rolled forward. Uh, so you have a February 23 statement of common ground from Gloucestershire on the examination library, uh, but it's a um, it's a uh, it's before it's time to quote Mr. Fong. So it's um, 
uh, we have been working with Stroud on a more up-to-date one, which deals with all the other concerns. And it, not surprisingly, it will just mirror South Gloss and National Highways um, on these issues. I just wanted to flag that. So it may be that we'll get a, um, a, a, a completed statement of common ground, but I don't, I don't know that it's... I'm, I'm quite happy to park it there. You have technical note three from us that deals with our concerns on, on this subject. Okay, so from from your point of view, with regards to the updated position, there isn't an up-to-date statement of common ground between yourselves and Stroud at the moment? Uh, no, there isn't, but it will broadly mirror um, the main points that the Junction 12 and 14 are under-costed, um, the um, with concerns about apportionment of costs and deliverability. Um, we hadn't made any representations about 13 and I'll just, whilst we're on 13, um, I think it's, I'd be reasonably confident that um, assuming there was a policy hook in the plan that that those could be dealt with um, um, by local mitigation. You will, we're not dealing with emission sites, but there are emission sites there that would vastly change uh, the intervention at that junction. Uh, or significantly change it, but uh, the ones, um, the the signalisation of the existing grade separated circular A2 carriageway, and I'm not speaking for national highways, uh, would would be probably something that would be dealt with um, through development management if there was policy to support it. So, I think it, in my mind, it's quite useful if the if we if we dealt with in the agenda we've got identification of issues relating to strategic road network, which we're doing through now. But if we dealt with maybe if we dealt with 12, um, and then deal with um, the infrastructure improvements necessary, the funding delivery strategy um, and contingencies and alternatives, which is in the agenda, and then maybe flip to 14. Um, and it, 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 we might be able to get through it a lot faster then than, um, than um, anyway, but we, should we, in terms of 13, I think it's probably useful just to, in, in a, to bottom that one out that it could be dealt with through the development management process. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Townend. Thank you, Inspector. Um, just two points um, following on from Lisa McCaffrey's uh, previous points. Um, I just wanted to highlight the cumulative impacts and therefore the when as to um, each of the improvements would need to be delivered um, wouldn't be able to be identified by assessing developments in isolation through the DM process. Um, looking at the planned build out and delivery um, phasing plans um, that accompany the local plan, um, most developments appear to be built out over the same period. Um, but which would obviously lead to cumulative impacts that um, would build and um, have an impact on when each of the uh, improvements would need to be delivered. Um, and secondly, just in relation to the IDP, um, we do note that there are listed to be many contributors specifically regarding to the Junction 13 scheme, um, but the Transport Funding and Delivery Plan doesn't mention Junction 13, um, whereas there appear to be eight uh, developments listed to be contributing to that um, within the IDP um, as opposed to the IDP addendum. Thank I'll, you. Thank you. I'll just... Jump in there just to say if if Mr. Carter, if you're coming back on the point about Junction 13, um, we we we've just decided we'll take that conversation offline. Um, I don't want to get drawn into into that um, at the present moment. I can see your hands gone down. So uh, yeah, thank you. Um, what I'm trying to understand from National Highways is, are are we at a point where you know is, is there a level <coughs> of development that could be accommodated? from the Stroud local plan, um, or are we at a point where national highways are going to start issuing holding directions? You know, is, is there a, a certain level of development that could be absorbed with the existing arrangements before the need for these infrastructure improvements would be required? Or are we at that position where you would be issuing holding directions preventing development in the plan from coming forward? Thank you. Um, it's something that we don't know because the when testing hasn't been undertaken. It's just an end of end of plan assessment. 
we don't know and that is our concern and again it's made in our reps certainly at junction 14 we have um had a grampian condition on development that's now bringing forward a scheme to accommodate their growth only we have um two holding recommendations on two schemes that are speculative that are trying to work up a solution to accommodate their growth only so it is highly likely we will have to put grampians on however without some assessment to look at 2025 or 2030 we we don't know thank you and in in your experience at national highways where you've you've come across I mean, it's, it's not unusual for a local plan to require um uh, junction improvements at, at a motorway um which can be of more significant nature or, or less so but where you're talking about fairly significant um junction improvements being required particularly high cost in your experience have you ever encountered it where it's been sought to be managed and dealt with via the development management process um from my experience yes we have from my experience, it hasn't worked particularly well. And what we've had to do is put grampian conditions or holding recommendations or refusals to applications because they can't come forward because the infrastructure is not in place. Um, again, from experience where authorities need large scale infrastructure early in the plan, they have gone through um, a bidding process to the DST or HIF um, to bring forward that scheme. And that has run in parallel. So you've, you've not had that you can think of a parallel situation where you've got fairly significant infrastructure projects with no specific regional or national funding identified that is being sought to be delivered via the development management process and particularly where there's an element of cross-boundary requirement going on? Not at this scale, no. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Carter. Um, just as a point of clarification, we're not seeking to solely deliver this scheme through the development management process. The development management process is the, is the point where we're likely to identify the exact point where the scheme is needed. We've all, um, as part of our statement of common ground, we've all agreed that there needs to be further work over the next um, over the next few months and years on developing that scheme and progressing external funding opportunities. We, as Stroud, did um, consider that at the moment there is a reasonable prospect of um, that um, of, of that of scheme being able to be delivered, and we can come on to exactly the basis for for those reasons. Um, at this point. Um, whilst we agree that it would be beneficial to have a um, to have a kind of a more in-depth timing and phasing approach to um, to modelling, we have a situation where the development plans outside of the district, and bear in mind Junction 14 is in South Gloucestershire Council, where we cannot make any, we can't make, it's not that we can't, it's not that our assumptions are wrong, we cannot make any specific assumptions on the locations of development in those areas or the timing of development in those areas um, in order to um, in order to actually progress some of that um, some of that earlier stage modeling um, i think as the whilst we whilst we could debate the exact proportions what the modeling does show is that um, the proportion of impact um, from the stroud development plan compared with um, background growth and compared with external with, with external growth um, is very low um, and ultimately um, we're in a position we're in a situation we're in not due to not being not due to not wanting to carry out the work but not being able to progress some of these some of these elements and as we've set out in our in our statement um, we completely support um, and we'll work very collaboratively with everyone else in terms of progressing that those um, um, funding bids um, and um, moving this and uh, moving this forward it's just 
we we aren't currently in a position to do so and that's why we feel that the timing is something that can be established through the development management process and there's two further points on timing um the first is that you may be aware that the department for transport are currently looking at um at road traffic forecasts um they are um they've released a report called the national road traffic projections 22 which in december discussed um the potential impact of the pandemic and um the growth coming forward not quite as fast as so a traffic growth proceeding not quite as fast as originally forecast there has been a, a new update to the temporary growth forecasting in 2023 which obviously would need a very specific technical ex exercise to go through in this modeling process which effectively is likely to set to, su to suggest that growth is not um, and in fact the national road traffic protection report states that in, as of december 2022 traffic growth had not recovered to the car traffic growth had not recovered to the level that it was in 2019 so effectively the, the background growth is is likely to be slowing um, and i'd also just like to bring mark in on the um on the housing trajectory that we've progressed within that that is being proposed within stroud let me just come back on that point before you do um so if if the model does get updated and um you know it does show that background growth is slowing would that be of a scale to suddenly change the view that these infrastructure improvements are not required given that we've been told that there are times at junction 14 in particular but also junction 12 where there is mainline queuing so there are times mm. when it's at capacity i cannot say for that say for certain there what the outcome of, of that would be but I do I, I think it um and I don't think anyone would disagree in the room I think what it it doesn't necessarily remove the need for the scheme but it might reduce the urgency of a scheme I, I see so I, I I understand the point you're trying to make but I'm just sort of trying to understand that if we're at the point where the schemes are in in essence required now as a result of just background growth and what's happening on the, the network now, unless we were in a situation of negative traffic growth, then that's not really going to, in yeah. essence, change the outcome of, of what we need to do through the planning process, if, if you see what I mean. Yes, but I mean, the need, whether the scheme is needed now is um, is, is not necessarily established. And I, I think it would be interesting to, to, to see what National Highways is evidence on saying that it's the scheme is is needed now is so perhaps um, that could be elaborated on uh yeah i think um before we bring in mr russell about the housing trajectory point I'll, i'd just like to hear from um Ms. mccaffrey um on on that thank you um so again we haven't said it's needed now because we don't have when testing what we've said is our understanding is the network experiences mainline queuing and therefore knowing we've got gramping conditions and or have had gramping conditions and holding recommendations, it is likely it's required now. Um, back on the point of not being able to do when testing, um, I disagree. I think when testing could be undertaken. Um, a forecast and assumption has been made for 2040. The same could be done for a closer period of time. In terms of the point of um, COVID impacts and background growth, that will have to come out of the findings of the DFT. Um, we undertook some traffic counts in May last year and the year before at Junction 14, specifically with regard to the developments that we had coming forward there. And that has shown that the traffic is at near pre-COVID levels. Therefore, if we were to go back out again now, I suspect they are at pre-COVID levels. Thank you. Mr. Russell, did you want to come in on that point? I think it was just a point about the trajectory. Um, uh, obviously, we've we provided to the examination an updated trajectory uh, requested by the inspectors, which is uh, attached as an appendix to, the, to our matter statements um and just as a just as a matter of um clarification really about the the pattern of growth in the south if we're talking around junction 14 
then um, the uh, projections indicate that the, the, the vast majority of the growth at the Sharp Nest New Settlement, Sharp Nest Docks and Wislow New Settlement will be taking place post 2030. So just, just for the sake of figures, I can provide them if but you can certainly do the calculation if, if you wish yourselves. Um, we are identified, uh, identifying around 700 new homes in from those strategic allocations between 2025 and 2030. So that's just over 700. Between 2030 and 35, we are we are estimating the figures being 1,700 dwellings from those three allocations. And then from 2035 to the end of the plan period, uh, 1,770 dwellings. So the in terms of the and this I, I appreciate there are other other sites and other impacts and and hopefully just bear if you can bear with me this is just an indication that those broad strategic that those large strategic allocations which are most likely to have an impact on junction 14 are are pro projected to be pr predominantly impacting from 2030 onwards um, I should also add, though, um, that and this this is really the comes back to the point that you were asking earlier around the proportion of growth and where where that's actually happening. Um, and I'm sure Patrick will confirm from South Gloucestershire. Um, there are currently around 1,100 new homes in the South Gloucestershire's housing trajectory for. Um, uh, at Thornbury and Charlfield, which are the, the two nearest settlements to Junction 14. So uh, on the one hand, I'm saying in terms of the Stroud local plan growth, it's predominantly towards the back end of the plan period. But I, I don't want to underestimate the impact on the junction now from background growth, because we, we have evidence that there are, as I said, over, uh, over 1,100 dwellings in South Gloucestershire with permission, which which are currently within the, the trajectory. So it's from my perspective, and I'm not a transport expert, um, background growth, uh, growth that's come through the development management system, including lost appeals, I should add. And uh, South Gloucestershire, unfortunately, lost an appeal very recently for just over 500 dwellings, um, uh, 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 which would impact uh, on Junction 14. Uh, so, so it's a it's a current issue. It is it is it is an issue of background growth predominantly. However, the local plan, the Stroud local plan, will impact on the junction. But as I said, predominantly the impact will be post twenty thirty. Thank you. And see your hand up, Mr. Driver. So I'll, I will bring you in uh, in a minute. It's, uh, I'm I'm not ignoring you. Um, but I just wanted to ask, um, Stroud Council, whether it's uh, Mr. Russell, or Mr. Carter, if National Highway's position is that if when testing had been undertaken, there would be a little bit more certainty as to what would be required and when. Why hasn't that been done? Predominantly, but due to the lack of um, the lack of information on where housing growth might may be, and the um, and the fact that um, it would have been not possible to reach agreement with all parties on the parameters with um, with regards to the impact on Junction Fourteen. Um, without that such um, with, without such key inf pieces of information, you also um, you also have a, a strategic model, and it's not a um, it, it's 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 not a, a um, it's not a light touch exercise to create additional modelling scenarios within such a model. Thank you, um, Mr. Drover. Yeah, I, I think Lisa made the point predominantly, but the the, um, the when and proportionally who needs to contribute, whether it's uh, the JCS area, um, Stroud or or South Gloss is is interesting. But the, I, I think Gloucestershire County Council's main issue was the underestimation of the funding. If the transport funding and delivery plan had come back and said, well, th these are two junctions which are not fit for purpose for any level of significant growth irrespective of when it gets triggered um, and that it, they, they are they should be instead of 27 million it should be 60 million instead of 9 million at 12 it should be a similar order of cost um, then we 
the, the discussion probably would have significantly advanced. So I'll draw a parallel with the JCS area there. Junction 10 is coming forward now. So there's a development consent order um, going in later this year for that junction. Um, and the housing sites are coming forward and they are they are paying a proportion. So it's partially have funded, um, partially JCS funded. There's 8,000 units and there's a, a chimney pot tax um, which is subject to viability. So that sort of, dis I, I just felt that th there wasn't much point in discussing apportionment. We don't agree with apportionment and, um, because the cost difference is so fundamental that, that there's not an, actually a realistic prospect of, of delivery, even if you carve that up equitably between the strategic function of the road, which national highways have a function, the, and the growth needs of South Gloucestershire, the County Council, so yeah, I, I'd be interested. I mean, in terms of today, whether we can move forward on the costs, um, uh, because the, the it was our, our opinion, Junction Twelve was based on the JCS growth package, and that's why it was um, a more modest level of cost. It wasn't based on str Strad's needs. Uh, but if we could get to a more realistic cost apportionment, uh, sorry, re more realistic initial costing, um, and if it's 60 million at Junction Twelve, 60 million at Junction Fourteen. Um, and, and then what is affordable, um, apportioning that amongst the uh, big sites or small sites, and I mean, that's a detailed strategy matter, um, then we would be a lot further forward. And I wouldn't say it would necessarily be unaffordable. We might say that might determine when things come forward in the plan. Um, and that then turns to the when argument. But I think it's worth spending some time on the actual costings issue as well. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McCaffrey? Thank you. Um, just a couple of points. So um, Mark mentioned something and it was just clarity. How can Stroud guarantee that developments in the Stroud local plan will come forward at the end or 2030 timing? Um, because we get developments coming in as and when there are developments coming in for the local plan that are yet to be allocated. Um, and then just a point on our um, circular, so the DFT circular um, was um, replaced, they were updated in um, December this year. So there was O213 and now there's O122. They are they're broadly the same. Some of the paragraphs have changed and there's a bit more detail on local plan and there's a bit more detail on vision and validate which is the new process we will all be working to but the previous circular which this um, plan would predominantly have been um, produced under paragraph 36 does make it quite clear where a development will be brought forward in phases any mitigation will need to be assessed based on the opening year of the final phase. However, it may be necessary to implement some mitigation measures in line with the opening of certain phases of development according, um, according to the impacts they generate. Um, so in regard to this, um, we are, we're not certain how the local plan fits in line with um, DFT policy. Thank you. Um, I am going to uh, pick up on um, timescales for delivery of the um, the schemes and how that fits, but that's a little bit later on in the agenda. So I, I will come back to you on that. Thank you. Um, I do actually want to move on to um, the detailed discussion regarding the improvement to this point and start looking at um, costs and timescales. Um, so um, if I can see Mr. Carter, Mr. Russell, you've got your hands up. So um, if you could make your points as as brief as possible, and then we can um, move on to the, the next part of the agenda. Uh, Mr. Carter? Okay. Um, yeah, just coming back on um, on Nathan's point there, I think it's it's agreed within our statements of common ground with uh, with National Highways, um, and um, it was intended to have been agreed with, with GCC, but the, the statement hasn't yet been, been published. Um, and it's in our representation to this hearing um, that we're not um, we're, we're not disputing that the schemes are likely to be under undervalued as they currently stand, um, and that we will be supporting um, applications for external funding. Um, and we can I can happy to talk about the types of external funding that may or may not I'd, be available. I'd rather not this but, minute because we're going to move on to costs yeah. in a minute. So um, that's okay. a very valid point, but. 
we'll I'll come back to it um, in in the next bit of the agenda. Um, indeed, I'll come to you first, um, Mr. Russell. Um, it may be appropriate for me to come back later as well, but um, I'm just just picking up Nathan Drover's points about. He, he was implying that, that, that essentially the, the if we had a higher and agreed costs, then the, then we could have progressed further. And it's absolutely not the case. He referred to a chimney tax. He referred to apportionment. How can we apportion growth and the implications of growth when, when neither the joint spatial plan authorities to the north of us nor South Gloucestershire Council to the south of us are in a position to be able to give us uh, information on the scale of future growth. That is that is the fundamental impediment which is preventing us from progressing. And I, I you know, with, with all due respect to Nathan, costs is a secondary matter in terms of why we haven't progressed it any further. Uh, I, I do understand that costs is a matter, but that's a matter that we, you know, that we can we can resolve. And, uh, and and agree to collectively um, seek public funding. But just that point, we have done absolutely as much as we possibly can. You have statements of common ground in front of you, inspectors, particularly from South Gloucestershire, which make it explicitly clear that they cannot give us the amount of growth and the distribution of that growth at the moment. They, w- they wish to do so. Uh, it's just they cannot do that at the moment because their local plan processes have not progressed sufficiently. And that fundamentally, in a nutshell, is is why we haven't been able to progress these matters any further. We not through the 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 want of trying, I I, I should I should add. I'll, I'll say no more at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. So um let's move on to costs. Um so in terms of the costs, I've seen um, representations from um, South Gloucestershire National Highways and then also the County Council that the um, the figures put forward for the schemes are um, an underestimation. Um, and I think it's fair to say uh, Stroud have, have perhaps come around to that um, view as well. Would that be correct, Mr Carter? Yes, we we accept that external funding would be required for these schemes. And in terms of, um, and I know it's difficult without a, a specific scheme because you can't really get you know much detail. Um, it's also to do with property um, examples, isn't it? But is there a sort of an agreed view as to the rough ballpark figure you'd be looking at for, for each junction improvement scheme? I don't believe there is an agreed figure. Um, as with the stage that we are at, at the moment. Um, I also think that there are certain um, certain points about whether, um, for example, um, whether the existing bridges um, over the motorways, whether they could be reused or not. Um, we, are, we are hearing that it's likely that they may not be able to be reused, which then of course brings into the question of, is this a new scheme or is it effectively maintenance of an existing asset? But there is clearly a, um, I, I would say that based on the um, based on the benchmarking schemes, we are probably looking in the region of sixty million pounds. Is a there is no science behind that. That is the closest number that people have been using um, in the discussions that we have been having. So, from from what I've read, my understanding is the bridge would be scheduled to be replaced as part of sort of just the routine asset management um, in a couple of years anyway, is that correct? So it's National Highway's view that they would be looking for a scheme that involved bridge replacement. I mean, from what I've read, um, the I think the bit you are referring to is a commitment in the, um, in the unpublished RIS-3 for resurfacing rather than replacement. Ms McCaffrey's, could you come back on that, please? Um, yeah, I am not aware of any plan to replace the bridge at current time. Um, the structure, at, and we're talking about Junction 14 here, so the structure at Junction 14 was um, built in the 70s. So it is getting to a point where National Highways would inspect, but we quite simply don't know. The advice we've been given is that if you were to add a new structure there, given the age of the existing structure, it may be just as co- cost effective in the long term 
to start again and replace rather than tack into what's existing. And just to come back on a point, I wouldn't describe either of these schemes as maintenance. They are very much um, strategic scale upgrades to accommodate planned or forthcoming planned growth. Okay. So from, it's difficult, isn't it? Because obviously from sort of trying to understand the implications, um, a scheme that requires a bridge replacement versus um, upgrade has cost implications. But from National Highway's perspective, as I understand it, there's no plans then to upgrade, but your position is if there's going to be a new scheme, it would be preferable to have a replacement bridge because that's probably cheaper in the longer term. Is that-, that that's the advice we've been given? Yes, because we when we take on a new scheme, whether we deliver it ourselves or someone else delivers it, delivers it on our behalf. Um, if someone delivers it on our behalf, we take a commuter maintenance sum of sixty years of life of that asset. Um, so if we've got something that is in the 70s and you're adding in in the long term it's going to be more co- more cost effective to replace um at the moment we've got some studies ourselves but um the Stroud team haven't gone as far as to look into the detail of of that at this stage um which can be quite normal okay and from my understanding as well when you're looking at the costs that have been looked at through the work done by Stroud, there's a number of thing emissions as you see it. So there's been no inclusion for uh, traffic management, which is quite often very costly. Um, I think you've said up to 50% of total scheme costs potentially. Um, there's no allowance for the commuted sum, um, which you've just mentioned for ongoing maintenance by national highways. And then there was something to do with the depth of the surface not being too high highway spec so there was some issue around that was that correct yeah um the the because the details that we've got are quite high level the um the information that our qs has given is again very very high level and what we've said is we don't believe the costs on the table at present are representative However, it's very difficult for us to give a figure. Um, We have pulled out some examples of other schemes um, within the area that have been delivered in recent years. And what we do need to consider at the moment is cost inflation as well, which really has increased um, the schemes or deliverability of schemes. Um, National highways figures, I think, say anything between... um, 60 million and 120 million per per scheme. Um, The more detail we have, the more concise we can get with regard to those figures. But at the moment, we simply don't have enough information to say. Okay, so in in your view, um, uh, Mr. Carter's reference to a figure of 60 million would still be at the lower end of your estimate based on your knowledge and experience of delivering similar schemes. At the moment, we wouldn't ha- we wouldn't be able to say that was the correct figure. Um, it, it would feel reasonable, but we just don't know because we don't have the information in front of us. Um, junction 1 M49, the junction itself cost 50 million and that was delivered in 2019. Um, but we know the link grade is going to cost considerably more. Um, but costs have gone up since then and it's not a like for like example. Um, we just don't know and that's why we're adding, uh, adding some um, contingency in there. And um, Nathan Draver's spoken about schemes at Junction 10, but that is considerably more than the 60 million. So it's just just to put it out there, we wouldn't want 60 million to be a number that was then run with because we don't have enough information to say that's the case at this stage. Okay, thank you. And is it um, correct that as it stands at the moment, there's There's no uh, national or regional funding identified. It's not in any RIS going forwards. Are there any plans to um, potentially look at these schemes? Because obviously with it affecting a number of 
authorities as a as a you know certainly a sub-regional um argument for you know requiring it. Um am I on me? No, I'm not on me. Sorry. Um that's right. I did um write a statement and I did send it to your um case officer. I don't know if it made it to you because it was after the point of what you said you would be taking further representations. Um there is no schemes at any of these junctions identified within the current RIS. Um, RIS 3 is yet to be announced and we won't know what's in RIS 3 until 2024-2025. Um, on the back of REACH strategies, which um, is something that's led by another part of National Highways, um, some work has been done um, talking with local authorities, stakeholders, etc., which has identified an area of interest for national highways from junctions 11 through junctions 14. And national highways are undertaking a project control framework stage zero, so a PCF stage zero study looking at those junctions however that we don't know what the findings would be from that study and that doesn't mean the study would then come up with schemes to sit within RIS 3 um, and anything that would come out of the RIS would be to accommodate the existing issues we experience so where we talk about mainline queuing it wouldn't be to accommodate growth um, and that's the point we need to make quite clear. Okay, so um, some initial work going on at the moment, very early doors, not really sure of the outcome. Um, even if there was anything for this sort of area, then that's just going to accommodate existing background growth. It won't take into account planned growth arising from local plans. And then even if all that did happen, we're not going to find out until 24, 25 anyway. Is that a reasonable summary? Yes, and even if there was something that was funded that may not sit within RIS 3, it could be RIS 4. So, yeah. And what would the timings of RIS 4 be? Um, so RIS 3 will run from 2025 to 2030 and RIS 4 will run from 2030 to 2035. Sorry, I had to work backwards. <laughs> Thank you. So that's some way uh, off into the distance at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Drover. So I just wanted to, uh, just expanding on what Lisa said, the, the bigger picture is um, Junction 10 is um, programmed to be done in um, uh, 2027, following the DCO. Um, and with the fact that, incidentally, the, the first consent of that housing goes to committee tonight um, with a um, with an apportioned cost of £9,000 a unit. Um, and that, that apportionment is subject to viability. But So that big picture is that one. And then moving further north, we have Junction 9, which is A46, which is the, in the pecking, County Council's pecking order. That's the one we're working on at the moment in association with Ash Church. Um, and then um, obviously moving to Junction 12, from the County Council's per perspective, that would be the... Um, there's quite a lot of growth around that. We would be moving to that one, and we've agreed with Stroud we're going to work collaboratively of them. But, but I mean, that is the the Junction 10 one is uh, a 250 million pound package with um, with optimism bias. It would take it to 340 million. Uh, the core costs for the junction on that one are 200 million. But in terms of intervention levels, low, medium, or high, that would be that's a free flowing slip road junction. So it's a lot more expensive than um, the um, the interventions we're looking at, Junction 12 and 14. So they would be sort of the medium cost bracket. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think it's important not to agree a figure because these figures stick and they get bandied around. But um, the, the, the 60 million pound, this goes back to my earlier point, that if we had had um, a reasonable um, uh, cost estimate in the, in the first place, and I don't necessarily agree with um, Mr. Russell that costing is secondary. Um, is fundamental to viability. But if we'd had that apportionment, then we might have been in a position to say, well, the JC, uh, Junction 12, the JCS area had a proportional impact. Um, 
at that junction and will have a proportionate impact in the future. And there's a, a there's a national highways need to do something as well, and there's a Stroud need, and we could have. It, it, not very scientifically, but we could have got more certainty at what level of caution, cost apportionment might have gone uh, to Stroud, reasonably gone to Stroud at Junction 12, and similarly, might, what might have reasonably gone to Stroud at Junction 14. I think that would have given us a much better handle on viability. So if you've got 60 million and 60 million, um, and um, I don't know, a third of its apportioned to Stroud at 14, and a third of its apportioned to Stroud at, at 12, then you would have. 40 million overall. And I, I mean, I don't know the numbers in the IDP, uh, but um, you would very quickly get a handle on whether or not um, there would be a realistic um, approach to apportioning that cost amongst uh, those developments that benefit from that infrastructure. Because obviously, they don't, if they don't directly use those junctions, they won't want to be contributing to it. But anyway, so I just want to make this, the point about the big picture, really, that there, there is, there are these junctions um, coming forward. Um, to support growth and they, they uh, 12 and 14 will come forward in that sequence the when is uh, i'm not saying it's not important it, what we wanted to go to to get the costing agreed and then a broad level of apportionment agreed and in in your view if if you were starting from scratch now and you were still at the evidence gathering stage if you were sort of sat in a meeting now with the information that you now know in your view, would there be scope for you to sort of go away, do a piece of work that could then get to a point where there is some level of agreement about costs and apportionment between all the councils involved? Yes, we could, yeah. I mean, um, we've heard about the, the change um, in the approach because of climate change. Um, so uh, the, the predict and provide is going out the window. We are now... Um, Lisa mentioned vision and validate. I mean, that's a Homes England approach. Uh, we've got decide and provide uh, the traffic we want. Um, and those sort of changing the trajectory, the traditional approach to forecasting and just building more concrete, uh, wider decks, bigger junctions is not going um, is not going to happen in the future. So there, there will be a discussion around um, are, are these forecasted level of growth going to going to hit? But I still think to make these junctions fit for purpose for any level of growth you will have to have some degree of intervention at 12 and 14 that needs a second deck um, and that, that then you get in the discussion whether that that grade separated junction would be three lane gyratory or uh, two lane gyratory and you know that impacts costs and things like that but there's definitely yeah, we could definitely um, have a discussion if we had firmer costings on it of how those costs might be apportioned and how that might affect viability and interestingly, the, the smaller sites, this has come up on um, in our recent discussions in the JCS, the smaller sites seem to have much better viability. Um, so the um, the one that's, for example, the ones going to committee that don't have strategic SUDs, don't have a secondary school, don't have a primary school, um, they're much more able to contribute towards these um, strategic um, infrastructure interventions. And uh, so we don't necessarily agree with where the, the cutoff is on on um on who doesn't who does pay but anyway yeah quite happy i mean we've still got um, plenty of plenty of time we've still got some time to have that discussion and if if that sort of if those discussions were to take place would you <coughs> envisage um because the other thing that i wanted to sort of i'm just jumping around a little bit but um it's just relevant to ask now is obviously normally if you're looking at a large um strategic infrastructure scheme you would want someone who is um leading that, who is the scheme sponsor, who's coordinating, who's gathering funds, who's pushing it forward, who's, you know, potentially lobbying for regional national funding. Would you envisage that if, say, you did go away and some discussions took place, would you then be in a position to come back with an agreed way forward of everyone working together um, because obviously this is a, a sub-regional issue that's affecting lots of different councils um, of a way of leading. Someone will lead that project going forward and act as that scheme sponsor, coordinating all the different monies coming in and, and planning um, the different schemes that need to take place. Uh, I'm going to be very careful what I say here. The, the county council do act as promoter. So we will, uh, at the moment at Ashchurch, we are 
facilitating the growth we're delivering the uh the infrastructure and at, at cheltenham uh, with junction 10 we are um i think we'd only do it if we had real confidence that um we weren't going to be left holding the, the proverb and we, we weren't being left hold fixing a problem uh that is not uh, reconcilable with um, the funding streams that that are available but yeah there are i mean there's lots of examples where i don't know um the m11 they have a hif rolling fund so um, homes england fund junction 7a on the m11 and um and then the developers funding creates a rolling fund to to build the strategic transport, the public transport infrastructure improvements and those sort of packages. What, what I'm more concerned about is the when. So if we had a spatial strategy that um, allocated growth at 13, where there is capacity, and then uh, you had one that impacted at 12, um, and then 14, there, so there was a timeline to it, that would be a bit easier. But um, as picking up on Lisa's point, we can't really control. If they're in the plan, it's going to be much harder to control when they come forward. Um, and that's the difficulty. But yeah, the county council. So I don't want to be quoted. Uh, so I mean, be careful that we're only going to put ourselves as forward as promote it if there's a reasonable prospect of it all coalescing. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I mean, what I'm essentially trying to sort of find out is, is it's not a, a firm no, absolutely not. We're not even entertaining it. You you sort of open to discussions to have a look at the issue and and talk about it further. Would Absolutely, you? yeah. So, yeah, in the next version of our LTP, we'll have a mass rapid transit um, package as well, and um, and we'll be wanting to work with the um, local planning authorities to help deliver that and fund that. So, um, it's in our interest. So we'd much rather be building sustainable transport initiatives than than building motorway capacity. But it's at the moment, it's a reality that some of these junctions need fixing. It's, I suppose, it's a, one of the concerns that we've picked up and from reading um, some of the, the representations, not just from people sort of in the session now, but also um, from those attending this afternoon is if, if we sort of went ahead with the situation as planned and um, developer contributions come in from Stroud, I mean, I, I have I do have sympathy with Stroud because you, you're trying to deliver your growth and you're sort of, you know, you, you're trying to get forward, you're trying to deliver your plan and, and get going with it. And the fact that your neighbours aren't quite up to the position where you are, you're, you're in a tricky position and I, I have sympathy with you. But then at the same time, you know, as, as inspectors, we, we need to make sure that you're not then left in a position where you're trying to deliver your development, but national highways are putting grampian conditions on everything and they are putting holding directions on stuff. So in effect, your plan isn't being delivered. It's only on paper. You're not actually getting those houses built because the motorway junctions haven't been improved to catch up with what you need. So it's, it's trying to sort of find a way through that that is going to work for everyone and I appreciate that is very difficult and fully appreciate you've probably been talking about it for years trying to sort it out um, but obviously as, as inspectors we, we need to be sort of conscious of government policy that requires us to have a reasonable level of certainty that these infrastructure improvements are going to be delivered when when they're needed so you've got the sort of issue that Stroud if you take some development contributions towards it, you're going to have a little pot of money, but then that's not going to be enough to deliver the, the infrastructure required. So there would need to be some coordination with your neighbours in terms of them contributing. It also looks like there needs to be some further discussions um, exploring certainly the next RIS. Um, are there any other funding options that you might be able to tap into, something like that? Um, and it, it just needs a bit more coordination at the sub-regional level. Um, right? And that's also the, the feeling I'm getting from reading a lot of the reps that have um, responded to our MIQs in order to give us that certainty. So what I'm trying to sort of understand in my own mind is if we're at a position where the parties are saying there is a potential if we went away and had a little chat about this, that we can find a way through it, that we will be able to come up with a situation where we are reasonably certain that these infrastructure packages can be delivered, then it may be worth exploring that idea 
um, to see if we can get to a bit more of a certain position. So as inspectors, we're not signing off on a plan that is basically not going to be delivered. What, what Stroud wants to deliver for the people living in your district, because that, that's why we're all here, isn't it? Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to understand if that is, a, is the case. And also what I don't want to happen is for the parties to go away and you talk, but then nothing comes out of those talks because then no one is any further forward. It, it, it would only really be worthwhile doing that if you can sit down in a room, come up with a way forward and at least have some sort of structure. And, and I appreciate that Gloucester County Council is not gonna want to sort of put, put your hand up and this situation now being live streamed on YouTube and saying, yes, we, we're happy to do that. Of course, you, you're not going to be able to do that. You need to go away, think about it, have some discussions. But if it is a possibility that that can take place and you can find a way through it and there is an outcome to those discussions rather than just an agreement to talk a little bit more about it. I'm sort of of the view that that's perhaps something that's worth you sitting down and having a little chat about it, um, Mr. Carter. Um, yes, thank you, Inspector. Um, that's been a really um, astute summary. Um, so I just want to, um, can I come on to, can I pick up a few points which will hopefully move us move us forward? Um, so in the lead up to this, to this hearing, um, between um, us, National Highways, Gloucestershire, South Gloucestershire, um, we were seeking to, uh, we had our statements of common ground individually, and then we we started drafting a more strategic statement um, that related specifically to matter, to matter 11. Now, as we went through that, it kind of, it became quite clear that actually we were just covering all of the elements in in our individual ones, and it didn't actually make a huge amount of benefit to, to finalise that and submit it. Um, however, at the end of that was a final page, which was effectively our agreed next steps on um, on how we took this forward. Um, and I think we were reasonably close to getting to a point where those next steps were were close to being agreed. Um, so if I might suggest that, um, that we recirculate that um, and aim to try and put that back into you um, as a brief one pager of what we feel the, the, um, the next steps are likely to be for this, hopefully that will will move move things forward. Um, just to sort of pick up on a on on a couple of points, um, I think Mark's Mark's point wasn't specifically development has to come forward here at certain time periods. I think the point is that there is a a varied spread of development coming through from Stroud, much of which is focused within the centre of the district, um, and Stroud has a very healthy five year land supply. So whilst whilst we can't direct development to come forward in certain in certain areas what we can do is we can have confidence that if holding directions do get placed on um on some development um that there is a um that that that, that will still enable us to continue delivering um housing for the district and i think that the um whilst not my area of expertise the the housing trajectory is uh, is based on a reasonable degree of um, of science on in in that res in that respect um so actually the, the implication of placing holding directions is is not critical for the um for the for the delivery of the plan as as a whole um i do want to clarify that the 60 million figure i was i was very clear that this is not a a scientific figure it was a, effectively a, a ballpark based on various discussions and it should not be at all relied upon i just want to con confirm that um we think it's great that um, the National Highways has, has commenced this study. Um, we do see it as a as a sub regional um, as a sub regional matter. Um, we have, um, as is evidenced by the degree of the, by the, the different sources of traffic growth that go into each of these junctions. Um, on in terms of existing issues, I might just just ask whether we understand the study is due to, to address existing issues, but whether that means existing issues as in right now or whether that means existing issues as in um, existing issues that would continue in the absence of Stroud or South Gloucestershire's or anyone else's local plans, but would just be resulting from background growth, whether there is a future uh, horizon on, on that point. Um, I think it's also important to say that, um, <clears throat> that yes, we do need clarity on um on who would be a scheme promoter um and i think that that is um that's really fundamental 
um, from all of our perspectives. And it doesn't, whether that's national highways or whether that's Gloucestershire as the highway authority. Um, and that is really the, the how we can drive forward funding applications. Um, so there are countless, um, well, not countless, obviously, but there are a number of um, publicly funding, public funding sources of, available at present. Um, and there have been um, similar such um, schemes. So HIF is now, um, it, HIF has now been completed, but we, um, there would be successors to, to schemes such as that. Um, and we don't know what infrastructure funding package will be in place over the next few years, because there could be future budgets, could be introducing infrastructure funding schemes. But it's quite important within HIF, one of the criterias for applying for funding was you had to be a top tier authority. Um, and Stroud is not a top tier authority. Um, so it's uh, it, it's that recognition that this is the sub-regional issue that is that needs to be sorted for our growth and um and and the wider benefit of the um of the wider network um and i think everyone i think everyone appreciates that we have a we all have a collective need to to address this issue and come up with a way forward we're just all at different stages of of our individual processes um, but I think the pieces are coming together and hopefully that um, statement on what uh, we feel the agreed next steps are, if we can, if we can aim to get agreement on that in the, um, in, in the near future, um, then I think that would be of benefit to, um, to yourselves. Yes, yes. And I, th I think also the point that if, if you are able to reach agreement and have a coordinated approach, so it's a sub-regional thing that everyone's driving forward, then then it, you are presented more as a, a coordinated body that, as you say, that opens up potentially a bit more funding application opportunities because you're you're all working together as one, aren't you? Um, so that's, I can definitely that, that, see that's, that. That's that's very true. I don't think we are. I think one of the one of the slightly limiting factors on being able to really accelerate those funding applications is is effectively having a made plan in Stroud and also having a very clear. Um, indication of where housing um, development and, and employment is going to be in the areas around the um, the junctions as a as a whole. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Russell. Yeah, so I just wanted to echo Chris's um, point about you know we, we we've always tried to work constructively. We put together the funding and delivery plan very much. Uh, as as the basis for, for 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 the kind of thing that you're looking for, you know, we 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 tried to seek agreement over costs. Although obviously we we we're still a way off that. Um, we we tried to agree an approach to apportionment. Um, unfortunately, uh, until adjoining authorities get to certainly progress well beyond the initial reg 18 stages and and arguably up to reg 19 stages we we really don't have that um that certainty so um absolutely we'll we'll attempt to work with all parties to to deliver um to deliver the um that, that certainty you need but but you know I, I don't want to label the point but we're we're sort of potentially suffering from the failure of of plans in adjoining areas and and that that really is something that we you know we, we want to break break this um break this this problem try and not kick that kick the can down the road we do want to make progress um as chris has said it's uh, we, we can and, and you'll see from the trajectory there is a significant amount of growth in the trajectory which doesn't impact directly on junction 12 and 14. Um, I mean our initial calculation would be um, well over a six-year supply that doesn't require any development at junction 12 or 14 um, to, to uh, so, so that that point I was making about post 2030 before um, before the not just the impacts but also in terms of impacting on our on our delivery of our housing uh, for, uh, requirements for the district. Uh, so, so we do have some time, as Chris has mentioned, we do need the certainty of a, a made local plan to be able to unlock public funding and um, provide the level of certainty about future growth. Um, I still remain sceptical that we are in a position, and Patrick may be able to comment on this, 
that we will be able to agree with our adjoining authorities an approach to apportionment because that ultimately is based upon spatial strategies. I think Nathan mentioned the importance of spatial strategy. We have a spatial strategy in this, in this plan that's been approved by our local communities. It's in front of you now for, uh, for examination. We don't have that, that level of certainty. We don't even have a draft spatial strategy for either the adjoining authorities to the north or to the south. And, and, and I, I'm sure Patrick will make the point that, you know, it would be inappropriate to do so at the moment, <laughs> given where they are. So um, I, I agree we can make progress on costs, identifying costs. We can agree on the, the kind of um, uh, mechanism for implementing a scheme in terms of who's going to who's going to be the scheme um, sponsor and, and delivery agents. But um, you know, I just don't want I just want don't want anybody to think, oh well, it's just a case that you know you need to sit in a room a bit more and, and try and try and get that 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 agreement. That, uh, again, it's not for me to say, but I I really don't see looking at the time scales for. The South Gloucestershire local plan in our statement of common ground and the statement of common ground with our joining authorities to the north. Um, so just to refresh you, uh, I'm sure Patrick will update, but I, I believe that there is a Reg 18 consultation in South Gloss uh, later this year and um, autumn winter, I think, uh, possibly. Um, uh, and in the JSP authorities to the north, we're, we're told uh, we were told summer and now we're told later in the year. So I can't see any certainty over uh, housing growth numbers and a, and a firm preferred strategy in those in those two areas. I would say before at least 2024 and and certainly in terms of uh, uh, being examined well, well beyond that. Uh, so it, so we are in a we're in a bit of a pickle, as you said, Inspector. Um, and I don't want to make light of that. And it's not an excuse. And we can and we were, we're certainly committed to doing as much as we can to developing a, a coherent delivery strategy. But you know, I am still slightly at a, an odd uh, to understand how we're going to get over that point that that the adjoining authorities will not be able to identify with any certainty at all the scale of growth that will impact upon those junctions and therefore the scale of growth that could contribute proportionately to um to the infrastructure provision but um i'm i am a glass half full person so i i do want to progress as far as far as possible but that is essentially what we have been doing and and i had thought we had got to the point where you know we had as much certainty as we could possibly get from uh, the, the current sub-regional position, but but I, I will let others speak now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. St. Hayward? Yes, hello. I just wanted to um, speak about this uh, point that was raised a few times about the uh, scheme promotership and taking the lead. I think, um, so the uh, Junction 12 scheme is clearly identified in Gloucester's local transport plan. So it clearly is a scheme priority for us. So we're you know, happy to work together and um, explore options on how we can resolve the situation there. I think where it would be a, a become a problem for us is if there are any um, financial or liability um, um, obligations that were put on us. So I don't think we could sign up to say we are the scheme promoter for a scheme that we haven't uh, seen the details of or know how much it costs um, and any risk, financial risk or other risk that would be put to the council would need cabinet approval for us to take something like that on. And that is, you know, we obviously went to cabinet to take a scheme like Junction 10 on. So um, I think that would be the limits of what we could agree on. So um, as it stands at the moment, there's nothing in um, Gloucestershire's uh, transport plan regarding Junction 14. Is that correct? I think it's mentioned, but it's obviously not in Gloucestershire. So it's not directly one of our schemes, but I think the need for improvements at Junction 14 is recognised, but it's not listed as a scheme. Thank you. Purely on the basis that it's not in Gloucestershire. Uh, Mr. Conroy. Thank you, Inspector. And I appreciate that for the majority of the discussion so far, it's been really between Stroud and National Highways and, and yourselves, 
but we have been mentioned a, a couple of times as as references to the discussion so i thought it was timely if i joined your discussion at this this point really some specific points um can i first of all just say that i very much support mark's cautious approach to whether further discussions around a, trying to agree a, a further joint joint statement and joint commitment for cooperation would would be beneficial at the moment i i wouldn't disagree with the points that mark mark made i think there are still some significant fundamentals which remain outstanding as as you have led the discussion this morning and the parties have identified in their representations and their statements of common ground where those where those exist any further joint working and cooperation um inspector i think would also need to involve the west of england combined authority they're not represented here and they haven't been a party to the Stroud examination um, plan preparation to date, as far as I'm aware. The combined authority are effectively the transport authority and would be responsible for delivering any, any major schemes. And to date, I'm not aware that Weka have been involved in any, in any detailed discussions with, with Stroud or Gloss County, but they would need to be. If, if there is going to be some wider coordination and brokering of that, that more strategic position to make the make the strategic case for, for for significant investment in J14, and more importantly, see how that investment in that motorway junction would sit with a broader transport investment strategy that the combined authority is delivering, bearing in mind it represents over 1.2 million people across three neutral authorities of which J14 is a peripheral motorway junction at the very northern end of the combined authority. And effectively, um, the combined authority is, is primarily focused on sustainable transport measures to improve access to movement around Greater Bristol. So it, there, there are some sort of, you know, significant fundamentals, as I said, that would need to be to be resolved. And my, my third sort of point in this in this flow is really around a mark Mark very much um, recognised it and, and accepted it, is the, is the emphasis around the formulaic approach to apportionment and the 80-20 split. And you have our views on that in our, in our October 22 letter and our statement of common ground. And I think to be fair, Stroud have, 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 have largely accepted that. I would just draw your, your pen, um, Inspector, to our statement of common ground. And I think paragraph 3.7, very much takes you through the position of both parties, which is a point that is is agreed. And 3.7 then needs to be um, read in conjunction with 3.32, uh, which is what we you were largely leading on the discussion this morning around the matters that are are agreed or not agreed regarding any certainty around being able to bring the junction forward. The, the main reason why South Gloss is, is here and why we've continued to be involved in the Stroud Local Plan to date is that we feel it, it's essential that any outcomes of the this this examination and the final modifications that you may want to make the Stroud plan doesn't inadvertently or directly end up predicating the ability for South Gloss to deliver its spatial strategy. And those are reasons that are accepted by Stroud and are set out in paragraph 3.7 of the Statement of Common Ground. So it was on that basis that we were largely content with how Stroud had sort of started to reconcile the challenges and largely accepting that they, they no longer saw growth in South Gloss having to be having to come forward to primarily pr deliver the junction where that ability to control that was beyond their their gift and as yet a matter which South Gloss in terms of its, its democratic plan making processes has yet to make any final decisions on and I would just emphasize that that South Gloss is a is a district that is um, effectively 60% of our population live within the greater Bristol urban area. And that would probably be where the majority of our spatial growth would need to be, need be, need to be focused. And any, any kind of additional growth across our Northern Belt would need to be proportionate to, to the needs and, and requirements of, of, of the district. So you, you, you understand from our statement of common ground the level of housing need that we're likely to be needing to plan for 28,000 homes over a 20 year period of which circa 16 to 17,000 already committed and effectively will be building out through our housing trajectory over that period. That actually leaves a relatively small amount of new development to find. And given the sums of money um, now recognized by Mr. Carter 
and a roof tax proposals that would need to come forward, as alluded to by Mr. Mr. Drover. It's 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 not really agreed by us that the 80-20 apportionment would be a would be an effective mechanism. So I think there is some further kind of technical considerations that the, the parties involved in delivering the Stroud local plan would need to further consider. But our points are set out in our statement to common ground and you can see, um, Inspector, the matters that are now agreed and the matters that, that remain unagreed. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carter. Yes, I just wanted to add a couple of points of clarification. Um, WECA have been involved were involved in our transport working group discussions um, for a, a period up until the um, the SDS um, I think not quite sure of the exact terminology for it, it went into abeyance um, prior to so prior to that effectively port being work being paused on that WECA were involved in our local plan working group um, and haven't been since that point um, I do want to I do just want to clarify the 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 reference to formulaic um because that there is an implication in the term formulaic that it's um it's kind of a back of a fag packet calculation it it was based on um on a fairly in-depth methodology using the best available and agreed tool for traffic modeling so whilst there are limitations to what happens on on south Gloucestershire side and yes, that does need to be that will will need to be refined as it as it goes forward. Um, it, it it wasn't finger in the air. Thank you, um, Ms. McCaffrey. Can I? Um, I can see you've got your hand up, so um, obviously make the point you were you were going to make. But um, I just wanted your response on um, uh, a point that Mr. Russell made about um, them having essentially a, a six year um, supply of housing land that, that could be delivered without requiring any junction improvements. So um, as I understand that in Stroud's view, they could, by do, sort of bringing certain sites forward in their housing tra trajectory, um, avoid the need for any junction improvements until sort of year, six seven onwards within the plan period um not in not early in the plan period what would your view on that be i think <clears throat> sorry excuse me i think that goes back to the question i asked earlier how can stroud control that um experience of other local plans and spec developments or allocated development is that i'm not certain they can so um in essence, when you're talking about control, um, those... How could they prevent sharpness, for example, coming forward on day one of adoption? I'm not sure they can. I, I see. So you're worried more about the, the sequencing of development and that it, in, in essence, once it's in the local plan, any of those allocations could come forward for development. They could. That, that That's my understanding. Yes, they could. And... In, in your view, if, even if um, housing developments are delivered, say, in, in the central area of Stroud, um, you know, away from the, the motorway junctions, um, would, that, would that then have no impact whatsoever on, on the motorway junctions? Um, you know, it's not, it's not going to you know, contribute to any level of um, traffic growth. It probably wouldn't be no impact, but I think it's fair to say it would probably be low to very low impact. So there would be less of a concern. Um, but again, we obviously look at the plan as a whole rather than looking at individual sites and site locations. And again, we haven't really had that level of testing. As I've said before, we've only had that 2040 testing. So it would be difficult to say for certain. But the further you get from the junction, I'd agree, the impact will be lower. Okay. Thank you. Can I just come back on a couple of points? So your, I think your original question was, um, would it be beneficial for everyone to get in a room? And I, I'd agree with everything everyone said. To be honest, we have, um, have worked proactively and collaboratively um, with the authorities without 
this when testing of future further evidence i'm not sure further discussions would be um really move us along at this stage um just a couple of things chris mentioned a next step page i have to be really honest and i'm not sure that's something we're aware of and then in reference to um national highways could put a number of holding recommendations and it wouldn't affect the delivery of the plan. Again, it goes back to your question and my original point. How do we know? Um, no one likes a holding recommendation or a grampian condition. Um, we only use them when we have to. A grampian condition, quite often, if you've got an allocation that says this site needs to contribute X to this major infrastructure, the way a Grampian condition often works is if a applicant has options over land, they actually can't bring the option forward and therefore they can't deliver the site with our Grampian. Therefore, national highways often get seen as a blocker at that stage in the plan. So I am quite concerned that Stroud may be open to accepting a number of Grampians or holding wrecks because that doesn't that doesn't feel right. And in in terms of just to sort of um, explore that point further, when you talk about the timescales for the delivery of large scale um, infrastructure improvements like motorway junctions, um, they can potentially be quite long in terms of the planning stage, getting funding, taking it through the planning process. Um, so, in your view, if, if sort of we were to take the point that, well, OK, there's six years housing land supply. So, you know, up until year six of the plan, it's fine. But then year seven, we get to the stage where those infrastructure improvements really are going to be required because that's when those sites are going to start delivering. If we're at a stage now of, you know, year zero of the plan, would six, seven years be an adequate time scale for those infrastructure developments to be built, available and ready to start facilitating the development that's going to start requiring get from year six, seven onwards in the plan? We'd certainly want to start now. Um, and there would still be no guarantee we would be there in six or seven years time. Um, Nathan, I don't know, I see your hand just gone up. I don't know if you've got timescales of Junction 10, but um, other large local majors I've been working on, I've been working on for five years and we're still not sure if they will get the funding. Um, so that is quite a clear example. And that one, if that will be delivered, it will be 2029. So actually we're talking about a 10 year period as an example. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Drover. Yeah, just for following up on what Lisa said, the um, so Junction 10 was in the JCS IDP in, I want to say 2015, uh, with delivery now in, if the DCO is successful, in, in um, 2027. So you've got 12 years there. Um, and again, based on my personal experience, I, I put one in a unitary development plan in 2003 and um, it's only just being built now. So I think and that was let fun one was um, let funded, one was hit funded. Um, so, yeah, 10 to 20 years. Um, all things being equal. I think the, the other factor is um, um, going back to getting in a room and, and funding is, um, I mean, I don't know Homes England criteria um what they are now but they, they they do there needs to be a sort of coherent story about the the settlement garden community standards um public transport access land value capture and things like that um and the, the problem with a lot of um with, with um, garden communities ending up on borders there's a lot of garden communities that have border in the title um is that they quite often don't have that a story and I, I mean, i'm not I don't, I don't know um uh, the detail of the the um the vision around um junction 12 but if we were going to have any confidence in a if settlement there there would need to be a cross-boundary vision of how uh wadden hardwick hunts grove phase two tritech symmetry all 
to gel together and, and added some value. Um, you know our opinion on um, sharpness and the promoters aren't here, so I'm not going to discuss that anyway. Thank you. Um, Ms. McCaffrey, did you want to come back on something? Yeah, if I can. So, um, as Nathan said, 10 to 20 years feels uh, like the, the number of the, the amount of time that we'd be thinking of. And I just want to add to what we need to consider that that's two junctions in, in that time period. It's not just one, that's two. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Carter, Mr. Russell, you've both got your hands up. So which of you would like to go first? I don't, I don't mind. I'll, I'll kick off if that's OK. Um, so to, just a couple of points from um, from Lisa's um, submissions to you. Um, so we produce the trajectory now. It's really important that local plans can be identified as being deliverable. So, and I'm sure that that trajectory and other uh, evidence from developers is going to be part of the uh, one aspect of the scrutiny you'll, you'll give to the rest of the plan and, 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 and the timescales. But, but ultimately the trajectory is based upon evidence, it's based upon ev working evidence with the developers and with other um, uh, uh, delivery mechanisms to identify a robust approach. So, so the first thing to say is it, it's not, us finger in the air. It, this information, the trajectory, is is evidenced by um, by the work that we've been undertaking with the developers in terms of the sites coming forward. The second point on that is, um, uh, I think Lisa referred to Sharpness. Well, Sharpness is a new settlement. It's a very large development. It will take time, a long lead in time, to get up to speed. So, um, you know, with respect, the idea of Sharpness. Pinging, pinging up thousands of houses tomorrow is, is just not going to happen. And you'll see from the trajectory that there is a long lead in time, particularly with garden communities, Nathan's point, you have to plan them properly uh, and you have to put in place a whole series of um, uh, key delivery mechanisms. So, so, you know, in terms of sharpness and Wislow to a lesser extent, because that because that also impacts on Junction 14 or to a lesser extent, they have long lead in times because that is the nature of that level of growth. They do take time. We have a healthy supply of existing commitments and smaller sites, which will come forward in the interim. Now, the point about a six-year supply, that, that was in the context of your question around um, uh, the first, the, the, the next five years of the plan, so essentially 25 to 30. I haven't done a calculation as to in terms of Lisa's point about a 10 year build, we're more than happy. And indeed, the trajectory is in front of you. So if you wanted to have a look at, uh, well, let's have a look at the trajectory in terms of what de where delivery is expected in the next 10 years, then um, the information is there. And we can certainly make submissions if you're in any way concerned that over a 10 year period, the um the plan would 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 start to falter in terms of delivery. I haven't I haven't looked into all the scenarios. I, I gave you a, a a sort of high level six year on the basis of those strategic sites in the south of the district and where the current trajectory is um uh, uh, uh is is expected and junction 12. So I I looked at both of those, but I I haven't looked at the 10 year period and what these the, the disaggregation of the housing figures and what the calculation of the, the five year land supply would be, but I'm happy to do that. Um in, in terms of um uh you, you you'd have heard that uh, unfortunately um uh, Lisa also um was slightly un, um not that encouraging about further discussions. Uh, you've already heard that from Patrick. So, um, I, I, you know, as I said, when, when I first raised my hand, very, very happy to undertake those discussions, but you've already heard two of the four parties have expressed doubts that we're going to progress any further at the, at the current time, which, which you know, we have to break this deadlock. And unfortunately, that's that's that seems to be the position we're in. The other issue about the county council, and I do welcome Nathan's positive um, commitment to work with us, but as you know, the county council is objecting to both Sharpness and Wadden as sites. Um, so I I put I put again a little bit of note of caution whether 
whether the county will be able to separate out any objections they might have to those sites from a more um, from entering into a positive dialogue around Junction 12, which is obviously, you know, one impacted partly by Wadden and Junction 14 impacted by Sharpness. But again, that's for others to say. Final point I wanted to make was in relation to Patrick's comments from South Gloucestershire. Um, now, I, I didn't really want to get into the debate about where speculation about where development in South Gloucestershire it, you know, it, it could be put. And I'm afraid, I think Patrick did open that particular I, uh, I'm Pandora's not sure box. I'm how useful <laughs> that's going to be, given we've probably got about 10 minutes left. Um, so I, I don't necessarily want to get into that, because that's not really going to take us any further forward in trying to sort of bottom I, out this particular issue. It, I think the only point I want to raise is, is that there has been a significant growth in the north of South Gloucestershire and to turn that tap off suddenly is, I would suggest, is going to be extremely difficult. I would also point to the new permission, the permission for uh, Charfield Station, uh, which has now got permission. Now, um, again, this is my view, this is not South Gloucestershire's view, but I would suggest that uh, a station at, at Charfield will make that settlement a more sustainable location for development. And therefore, whilst I agree with Patrick that most development will go towards fringes of Bristol and to the south, I cannot see any, any material reason why the level of growth in, in the north of South Gloucestershire, which has taken place around about 230 dwellings a year, um, uh, certainly the last five years, at least 230 dwellings a year, which uh, scaled up over a 20 year plan would be four and a half thousand houses, which would considerably dwarf the figures in the Stroud local plan. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. OK, th thank you. Um, so assen essentially what what we're saying is, is potentially there may be some development further away from the junctions which may possibly be able to be delivered potentially with less impact potentially around five to six years worth give or take needing some more detailed work to bottom that particular issue out but then from year sort of six onwards then the developments are going to start coming forwards that if everything goes to plan, and I take National Highway's point that, you know, things may come out of sync and, you know, um, may, may come forward early than that. Um, development's going to start coming forward that is going to require these junction improvements to take place. And then we're going to end up in a situation where we've got the gramping conditions and holding conditions potentially from National Highway's. Then we've also got the sort of um, pick, pickle, to use the word, that um, you know these large schemes optimistically are going to take ten years um, to deliver, and that's that's even if we had a scheme ready now. But from this morning's discussion, at the moment, there's no agreement on cost. We've not touched on apportionment, although um, lots of people have made references to it. But I know from what's been submitted that there is no agreement on apportionment of, of costs. Um, so given where we are sort of time wise for this session, I, I'm, I don't think there's particular merit in getting into a big debate about apportionment because I know that you don't agree. <laughs> and I, I'm getting a feeling that as it stands at the moment, you're not going to agree and certainly not within the confines of this session. I think you probably need to go away and have a little bit of a chat about that offline. Um, so the, the, the difficulty we have then as inspectors is from you know, year six, seven, you know, we, we're going to need a level of certainty that those infrastructure schemes are going to be coming forward. And really, that needs to be the case where we have some certainty now that, you know, there is funding, things are being taken forward through the planning process. But what I'm hearing from this morning session is there's still pretty fundamental disagreements about some fairly basic things that really need to be bottomed out before we can have that level of certainty and I, I totally appreciate what everyone's told me that even if you go away and, and talk about it you protect you're skeptical I think is probably the word that further agreement can be reached or that you can break the deadlock or that any any you'll be any further forward 
But then that also then doesn't help us as inspectors looking at the Stroud local plan, you know, from say year five, six onwards, where that infrastructure is going to need to be in place. So what I'm what I'm kind of thinking really is I'll I need to have a chat with my colleague. Um firstly really and we need to have a have a little think about this and what we do going forwards um because obviously our roles are is to help stroud get get your plan in place that's what we want to do that's that's what we're here for um but we also need to be fairly satisfied from a national policy point of view that certain things are going to fall into place as and when you need them and that you know the plan is viable it is deliverable um and you know they're 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 fairly chunky issues to to grapple with and I, like i said i have i have every sympathy with stroud because I, I fully appreciate you know where where you're coming from that you're sort of just trying your best in the situation you find yourselves so you know we we do want to work with you we want to work with all the parties try and find a, a pragmatic way forward so i think it's a question for my colleague and myself to have a little think about and I think probably it would be useful um, if the sort of um, national highway, well, essentially everyone here um, can, you know, have a have a little think and think if there is a is a way forward and if there is a way through through this that can because essentially it's it's not Stroud's problem alone. It's, a, it's everyone's problem, isn't it? You know, I mean that that jun- those junction issues are going to affect all the sort of sub-regional um, neighbouring authorities. So, you know, at some point, someone's going to have to sit down in a room somewhere and agree what you're going to do about it. Um, Mr. Jover. Thanks, ma'am. Yeah, I, I mean, I, given what you've just said, I was going to go on to the A38, but I don't think I'll, I'll bother now. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, so just on, on the A38, yeah, they were, it's a moot point now, but we were a bit more relaxed about that. I mean, the costings aren't right, um, but we were more relaxed about it because they are directly impacted by the sites, and um, um, and they would have, they would have been resolved one way or another. The only one that's not on that shopping list is St Barnabas, and you'll hear about that um, in the Wadden session. So um, yeah, I'll shut up there. Okay, uh, we've also got this afternoon session um, where we can have a, a bit more of a, a chat about the A38 and sort of hopefully pick up any anything there. Um, Mr Carter? Um, just to say that, um, just to correct um, Ms McCaffrey, the um, the next step statement is at the back of the um, the, the matter 11 statement of common ground that we were we were seeking to appear and I've, I have her, hers and her colleagues comments in, in front of me. Um, broadly speaking, they, um, apart, aside from a couple of areas of semantics and wanting more detail on funding and phasing, which we are happy to to include, um, we feel that that statement on what we feel the next steps are can be produced and circulated. And from my perspective and from Stroud's perspective, we can either circulate that with agreement from all the parties and submit it into examination, or we can submit it to the examination directly if um, if the other parties don't feel that they can agree. Um, from our perspective, given that it affects a number of, you know, there's the South Gloucestershire, there's also the County Council, it would be more helpful if you can get agreement from, from everybody. I, I totally agree. And if you can't get agreement, set out what you can agree on and what you can't agree on. That was more helpful for us as inspectors. Um, and then I was going to say something else, which is, oh, the, the other um, thing that is also quite useful is in terms of agreeing a list of what you agree and what you don't agree, what would be really useful is an actual practical step forward. What is going to happen next to solve this issue? Um, so I think to sort of quote Mr. Russell, it's, it's not just about kicking the can down the road. You know, we need some practical steps that could take place. I mean, it's easy to question of sitting and down and doing some further work to get some more certainty so that national highways can be a bit more certain about what needs to happen and when and costs. You know, is that a potential option? Um, I don't know. I think you need to sort of sit down and have a think. Is there a way forward through this? And then um, perhaps come back to us within as inspectors, if that's the case, 
and also this list of things that you can agree and disagree on. And then as inspectors, we are going to have a, a chat and a think about it and um, yeah, decide um, what our view is and what if anything um, needs to happen. Uh, I can see Ms McCaffrey's got her hand up, but video off. So I don't know, is that a legacy hand or are no. you? Can you hear me? Sorry, my video dropped out, so I'm going to have to restart um, during the break. Apologies. Yeah, my hand is up. Just um, a couple of points to come back on. Um, you did ask if it would be worth getting in a room, and my answer was without that when testing. We don't think it would be. Um, and I want to make that clear. It's something that we've been asking for at least two years. Um, in terms of the next step, thank you, Chris, for... Um, reminding us of what that is and again just to make clear actually national highways and wsp requested that was included in the common ground that you haven't seen and everything you've um mentioned in terms of how we move things on accountability time scales we have raised um we've been extremely collaborative we do want to positively respond at the moment we just don't know the when and that makes it tricky for us Thank you. And it, so in, in this, because I've I've heard um, from yourselves that you would like the WEM and I've heard from Mr. Russell that due to, um, you know, the difficulties of not knowing spatially in terms of growth, what's going on in neighbouring areas, that WEM is a bit tricky at the moment. So uh, this statement of what everybody agrees and disagrees on, it would be useful for us if you just set out National Highway's position as to why you would like WEM, what the benefits of it would be, and why in your view it is possible for that to be undertaken at the present time. And then from Stroud's point of view, it would be useful to have your view why you haven't done it to date and why in your view it's not possible, um, because that will help us as inspectors to just have that set out quite, quite clearly so we can understand um, where everybody's coming from. Um, the the other thing that I just wanted to pick up on is I know that National Highways have flagged some issues regarding the wording of some of the transport policies and site allegations. And we've, we've, we've already touched on this, too. So if you could both just make a note, Stroud Council and National Highways, to just come up with an agreed list there, um, preferably of any potential main modifications that you do agree on and um, that's useful and then we can consider that um and then where there is disagreement if you could then set that out um and your reasons why there's disagreement and then you know we can we can take a look at that and uh, consider it okay mr russell yes just just to confirm um we're, we're very happy to 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 discuss detailed wording, policy wording changes. The, um, the, the to, to summarize, I think um, National Highways want the um, the results of the highway mitigation works, um, ex particularly regarding the motorway junctions, explicitly referenced in the site allocation policies, and we we have no problem at all with doing that. And I think uh, they also want to reference in policy EI twelve. To the um, to, to to ensure that those improvements are are identified in that policy, and again, we don't have any issues with that at all. Thank you. That's that's fine. Um, I, that's just reminded me as well. Actually, I don't think I I asked for this in in what I was just saying before. When when you've mentioned about um, house the housing trajectory and a certain number of sites being able to be delivered um, further away from the junction um, that would have a lesser impact on the motorways I think it would be helpful for us as inspectors if you just set that out so we can have a look and see which sites and where and then then sort of mid sort of from year six onwards what would be happening then with that housing trajectory which sites and where would be would be coming in um sort of if you divide it into five so year one to five five to ten five to fifteen and then we can have a look and, and see I can see my colleague's got her hand up, so please, please, please come in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just putting a pointer there in relation to the trajectory that this we will be having significant discussions about the deliverability of sites and the um, reasonableness of the trajectory. So 
I was just going to just raise the issue of whether that work in relation to what you've just asked uh, Mr. Russell to do <clears throat> needs to be done actually after our discussions, because it could be that sites need to be moved. Yeah, I, th I think that's good because then it's that probably I would imagine from um, Stroud District Council that the, you don't want to be doing work twice, do you? So, <laughs> so I, ju I just wanted to, I'm sure that, that was in the back of your mind, but I just wanted to make that clear and we won't be having the matter 7a um, discussions on the housing supply and housing trajectory in its totality until that's going to be pushed into, uh, well, June, July now. June, July, yeah. I, I suppose from... Um, it's whether you want something now, are you considering that? Yeah. That, so from the trajectory as it is now, it would be useful to have that. Yeah. But just with the thought in the back of your mind that things are likely... To change. To change, yeah. because we have concerns about the trajectory. So I'm just putting it out there. Thank you. For certain sites. Thank you. Good, good point. Um, yeah, so perhaps um, it would be um, simpler and easier rather than um, tweaking the trajectory at this stage if you just flag to us which sites would be sort of be able to be delivered um, early on in the period um, that would, in your, in your view, have less of an impact on, on the motorway junctions. Thank you. Uh, Mr Conroy? Mr. Conroy, you there? Thank Hello? Yes, we could just hear you then. Yeah. I'm conscious of. Oh, you've got a really bad connection. You sort of keep dropping in and out, and I can see you've turned your video on. Uh, um, no. Yes. I am. Can you hear? No, your your connections keeps dropping out. We're not we're not getting. Really? No, you you've got like a, you keep dropping out in between speaking. I'm having... No, that's not really working. That is it. Um, I'm conscious, okay. of South Gloucestershire. You're not here this afternoon, are you? So it's not even as if. Um, I don't know if you've got a colleague that could contact you by another means to get the point that you were going to make I think he's left perhaps he's going to come back in again we'll just wait a couple of minutes because I don't want to end the session if he's uh... I'll, I'll let him I'll look out for him let him back in yeah, thank you so just while we uh we wait to see if he uh, hopefully we joins um in summary, there's um, a couple of things that um, I've asked to be submitted. Um, and then in the meantime, um, myself and my colleague will have a little bit of a think about uh, this morning's session. Um, and I can see Mr. Conroy's come back in, just connecting to audio. Mr. Conroy, are you there? No. Yeah. No. Can can I'm you? I'm here. Can you hear? Uh, yes. Hear me now. Yes, I can. Yes. Not very good, still. No. Um, no. It's uh, it's not very good. Um, okay. That's that's good. Um. I just wanted to clarify really in terms of how you wanted to take the remaining, whether well, there's any remaining items from this session and the agreement. I'd re any improvement now? No, it's not brilliant, is it? It's not great, but you, you wanted to clarify about what we were taking forward from this session and any improvements, was it? Well, it was, it was really whether um, you wanted I agree with the programme officer yesterday that we wouldn't South Gloss would weren't needed to attend the the, the afternoon session effectively the session from twelve o'clock with the other participants. I know we're list, we're on the the list of participants, but I, I think in a discussion with yourselves, um, the feedback was that we we weren't needed for that session on the basis of this this focused discussion. Mm -hmm. And I just 
just wanted to confirm really before you before you finished um, this morning. Yeah, I mean that, that's in it since if you would like to join um the later session, you are more than welcome to do so. But um if if you're unable to, um then you know that's that's if that's up to you equally. Um if, if you are content that you have sort of made the points you wanted to make, um then that's that's fine. I think I think we are effectively on the basis of what um the limited input South Gloss has had um this morning based on the questions that you've asked and the participants that you've asked to to respond to we've, we've expressed our views and um adjoining authorities on on the call um have given their their, their, their thoughts back and that's uh, that's all understandable you have our statement of common ground position um which does clearly set out the matters that are agreed and disagreed between the parties and i i just would reinforce that um the contents of 3.7 and 3.32 are agreed effectively and i think that's a point of record um, and then the matters that aren't agreed are effectively matters section four of the statement of common ground so that's just a, a just a, a, a note for your your hearing i i unless you feel otherwise i don't think south gloss can contribute anything else that hasn't been discussed this morning um no that that's fine i mean we we are going to talk about the apportionment um because that is in the miqs but i I think I've, I understand South Gloucestershire's position fairly well, which is basically you don't agree with it. So, um, yeah. Well, it's just that we don't see where 80% of the development could currently be generated in South Gloucester with any certainty to fund what is now or make a significant contribution, which is now accepted to be at least a £60 million junction. I mean, it's just it's just it's just the fundamentals like like, like that, really, which are the, um, the the points of concern to us. But those matters are set out in our statement of common ground and Stroud have accepted that, to my understanding. Yeah. And um, also um, this sort of um, further sort of list of things that are agreed and disagreed between the parties and potential way forward. Um, I'm hoping obviously South lost um, South um Gloucestershire are going to uh, contribute to that um so that's sort of a, a further opportunity for you to just clarify exactly what your position is um and, and we'll we, we we will that. and as I as I said in my um comments earlier I really would recommend that WECA are involved in those conversations as well because they are the major um partner regarding any genuine progression of a, an investment strategy for J14, it would need WECA's complete support and the mayor's support for, for, for that to be, be a reality. And would um, Stroud have an objection to um, WECA being involved in, in that discussions? Um, just so we, we're kind of fairly sure that all the relevant parties have had an input into it. Yeah, we have no objections. Um, clearly, they have a large infrastructure pot as well, which um, no doubt South Gloucestershire will be looking to uh, to uh, support their spatial strategy when their local plan um, gets to Reg 19 stage. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, that would certainly be useful then if, if you can involve, involve WECA in the discussions. Um, Ms McCaffrey? Yeah, I was just going to say, when we break, I will leave in the break and rejoin to hopefully get my tech back. So could someone please look out for me? Thank you. Yes, that the programme officer will uh, no Thank doubt you. look out for you. Uh, OK, right. Uh, sorry, we, we overran slightly uh, there, but um, we've not done too badly. Um, so a brief comfort break and we will start again at one minute past 12. Thank you, everybody, for this morning.
Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the hearing session for the examination into Stroud Local Plan. Uh, we were just starting at one minute's past just to allow people to observe a, a minute's silence who had requested to do so. Um, so the session starting now and running on into this afternoon, we're going to be looking specifically at matter 11b, which is looking at uh, strategic transport issues. Um, I'm aware it's, it's always um, slightly tricky when you're talking about transport not to mention um, sites, but I would just like to just put in a plea right at the start to try and refrain yourself from doing so in, in detail. Obviously, we have specific sessions um, for the sites um, allocated. And if we get too bogged down in detail talking about individual sites, we're never gonna get through our list of questions that we have for today. Um, so if everyone could just uh, bear that in mind, that would be uh, useful. Um, so my name is Victoria Lucas. I am one of the inspectors who has been appointed to uh, conduct this examination. And my colleague uh, is also here in the session. Not Good afternoon, to... my name's Yvonne Wright. Thank you. Um, I am going to be uh, leading today's session, though Yv Yvonne uh, may well uh, come in um, if she has a, a question or a, a point she'd like to make. Um, in terms of the council for this session, um, Mr Russell, you're going to be leading today, this afternoon? Uh, thank you, Inspector. Um, I think it will be my uh, transport colleague, uh, Chris Carter from ACOM, who will be leading on the on the detailed transport matters. Uh, I do have my colleague Conrad Moore uh, from the council, uh, who's also at this session, and we have um, consultants uh, Alex Horton and Wayne Dyer from Arup, who are here to answer any questions relating to the infrastructure delivery plan. We also have our viability consultant Simon Drummond Hay from HDH Planning and Development. Uh, to uh, respond to any specific viability matters relating to this issue. Although we do, as I've mentioned at the beginning of the day, we do have a specific session on viability under matter 12. Uh, so I'm assuming that more detailed matters will be dealt with at that session. Uh, and we also have our solicitor, Martin Evans, present. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, in terms of the uh, other participants, I'm um, obviously listed on the, um, the published hearing programme. As there are a number of you, I am not proposing that we, uh, we go around now. What I'd just like to request is that when you do speak for the first time, if you could just say your name and who it is that you're, you're representing, that would be useful for us. Um, hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. Um, if anyone has any problems either hearing me or um, any IT issues, um, then please let us know. Quite often if you just log out, come back in again, um, that quite often resolves any connectivity issues or if your video goes off, but um, Programme Officer um, is, is available um, if, if you have any help, uh, issues rather that require help. So uh, please, please let us know. Um, in terms of uh, microphone and video protocol, um, it is nice to see faces. So I'm quite happy for people to leave the video on um, when, when you're not speaking. I'm equally happy for you to turn it off if that's what you would like. Um, but if you could ensure that your microphones are muted, if you're not speaking, um, then we'll minimise background noise. Um, if you would like to make a point, um, if you could use the um, raise hand function and I will bring you in. Might not always be immediately, um, but just because I'm kind of in the flow of a conversation, um, but I will bring you in, um, don't worry. Um, also, if you could just make sure not to speak over one another, because then obviously uh, I can't hear what people are saying, which uh, isn't useful for me. Um, if we do have any adjournments or assumptions, then um, if you could just stay logged in um, and then um, we'll just resume once uh, the session gets going again. That's the same for lunch. If you can just stay logged in, and just switch your microphone and video off. Um, you probably notice that while you're speaking, I might not be looking at you, might be looking down. That's purely because I'm taking notes. It's not because I'm not interested or listening to what you're saying. I'm just literally um, writing at that present time. And just a reminder that the hearings are being live streamed. Um, so in terms of the format for this particular session, we've got our published MIQs. Um, so I am just going to work our way through them. Um, we have 
just got specific questions as a chunk of them that we put in an, another later session. Um, so we'll just work our way through, see where we get to. Um, we have got a lunch break about one o'clock um, and then we're aiming to finish at four, may run on potentially longer, but ideally aiming to finish at four, certainly no later than half past four. I don't want to be still sat here at seven o'clock. I saw, saw a few eye rolling there. Don't worry, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, go, go on for much longer than that. Um, if if we do um, end up um, not covering everything that we wanted to do, we, we can just put the questions down to um, one of the other sessions. Um, that's fine. Um, okay, so if we start at question two, and just can't see any hands up at that point. So I assume no one's got any questions. No. OK, so we'll start at question two, um, which asks, have all the essential transport infrastructure elements been identified? And does the plan adequately address these needs in its identification of the scale and location of proposed development? Uh, so, Mr. Russell, perhaps you would like to uh, start with your council's response to that. Um, I'm going to pass straight on to um, my Mr. colleague Chris Carter uh, yes. for, for, to deal with that. Thank you. Okay. Um, without going too much into our into our MIQ statement, um, basically we we consider that the transport issues have been considered by the from the earliest stages of plan making. We've been working collaboratively with um, with the highway authorities and uh, and with the um, and with national highways and adjacent planning authorities um, we've produced a sustainable transport strategy and we've produced a tra traffic modeling report um, with addendums for those um, submitted to the examination um, uh, approximately a year ago um, the we feel that those are comprehensive in terms of how the um, the level of mitigation that has been um, that has been developed and provides a very firm basis upon which for strategic um, mitigation measures to be taken forward, and also for um, a, 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 and also for um, smaller individual measures to be taken forward at the development management process. Thank you. Has anyone got anything they would like to say in response to that? Can't see any hands going up at this stage. Okay. Oh. Mr. Stage Coach. Uh, no one, I think, ought to be too surprised that we have had very little discussion at all so far today about public transport. Um, the plan does require require significant mode shifts towards sustainable modes generally. Um, the plan is looking at some numbers that I think to people who are not transport specialists look quite modest, you know, five, 10% reductions in car use, moving to sustainable modes. Uh, in fact, the implications of that in terms of mode shift are quite significant um, and require significant work to identify, if you like, what needs to be true for everybody to be able to rely on um, those assumptions being met. Um, it's no surprise in a district like Stroud, public transport use is, is, is not very high at all. In fact, it's quite modest. Um, the good news is that the network is stable, actually, believe it or not, more stable than it is in most parts of the country or even most parts of Gloucestershire. So that's a relief, uh, hopefully, to everybody concerned that the baseline is stable. Um, but in reality, we would need to see um, even to just get a two or three percent mode shift away from current car use um, towards bus would effectively require nearly a doubling of bus passenger boardings. Is that achievable? I believe yes, it is. Uh, have we been working with, uh, as far as we can, with with Gloucestershire and with promoters to to, to sort of state how how that could be achieved with specific measures? Yes, we have. Um, has that been reflected in what is currently in published plan and its evidence base? Sadly, no, it is not. Um, I think what I would say just to kind of wrap this little statement up is this, is that we have, uh, as I trust you've seen, uh, Imams, um, that we have 
worked hard with to, to, to constructively engage with the plan, both formally and then behind the scenes with, with the promoters. Um, we've done all we can to identify ways to achieve a sustainable transport strategy where bus can achieve the greatest possible role. And the vast majority of allocations, I think I want to assure you, are uh, sites where we believe that, that there are identifiable packages, deliverable packages, scalable packages that can be put in place. Um, the, uh, the, the, the clear and obvious exception, of course, is at Sharpness. So I think that's all I really need to say right now. So just to sort of um, close off that point a little bit, in in your view, what changes would be need to um, would need to be made to the plan to to reflect that? Well, we would expect to see the costs that we've put forward to promoters and, and, and to Gloucestershire to be reflected in the IDP. We would expect, uh, you know, some some feedback really from other part from the planning authority and from the highways authority that they were satisfied that uh, that those things that that, that we've we've offered and and agreed with with promoters were in fact appropriate um we would obviously need to see that translated into policy because clearly there's 106 requirements and reg 122 to be satisfied that the costs and in, firstly that the package that we would be looking at was actually effective enough and therefore met the tests of relevance uh and then thereafter that the costs of of, of delivering that would also meet uh the, the the legal tests in sill um it isn't just about a site by site approach it's about actually how this sits within a wider uh sustainable transport strategy i mean the bones of it are there the corridors are identified we agree with those strongly as you know um but it's like what else needs to be true to achieve these outputs um, you know, there are areas, for example, where we've indicated we would really want to see bus priority. Um, and we believe that, you know, but until we get further engagement, really, with, with about the feasibility of that and agreement to that from, from all concerned, then, you know, we find ourselves a, a little bit in a, in a policy lacuna, Marms, I think it's fair to say. So it's all there. The work's been done. Um, and um, I know there are many people around this table that, that I've been working with. Uh, diligently over many years, including um, folk at Gloucestershire. Um, so uh, uh, just to be positive, it, it, it's it's not the case that there's a sort of huge great amount of work that needs to be done to, to actually kind of define things. It, it, it's it, it's actually translating that into the plan. Obviously, with respect to, 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 um, to sharpness, as is, you know, I don't need to repeat my reps that that's these are things that you're going to deal with in due course. We, we will always work with any promoter to do the best we can where, to, to deliver a, a package that that works that's 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 relevant um you know and I think the fact we not don't feel we can achieve that for for the sharpness sites it's not just one it's several it, you know I think is is a, is a clear indication uh of, of, of some of the difficulties in that area thank you. Could I just ask for the council's response to those points raised by Mr. Small um, in terms of uh, the costs um, for these um, bus packages not reflected in the IDP, um, perhaps some feedback needed from the council on submissions made, um, and also the highway authorities, I assume that's the county council, um, and perhaps a, the, a feeling that the, this hasn't been uh, translated or reflected in the relevant policies. I, I will, I'll respond on the majority of those points. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's positive that, uh, that Mr. Small agrees with the sustainable transport corridors and the, um, and the, and the, stra and the strategy as, a, as, a, as, as I said, as a strategic approach. Um, we were pleased to have his attendance at a workshop in 2019 where we started building that strategy together um, and we've also been working quite closely with Gloucestershire since that point to gain agreement that the sustainable transport strategy is, is appropriate. Within that strategy, as, uh, as Mr Small correctly references, are a number of um, a number of corridors where we've identified them as a need for focus on bus investment um, and it talks about bus priority it talks about service frequencies um, and we also um we also within each of the, within 
um, site allocation policies. It also talks about um, uh, about the need for those sites to be investing in those in those policies. So, if there are, if there are any specific areas where it's felt that those that that does not translate fully through into the um, into into the policy, then we would be we'd be more than happy to 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 hear them and and, and discuss in, individually. The, um, we also think it's very positive that um, as some of the sites are coming forward um, through the planning application and pre-application stage alongside this, um, that there is um, that, that there is more in detailed engagement um, happening between the site promoters and uh, and Stagecoach and, and Gloucestershire on the subject of um, of brass priority, um, which gives the inspector confidence that these uh, that these sites will be well served by public transport, notwithstanding. Um, concerns that Mr Small has raised on, on, on other matters. Thank you. I think that would be useful if you could have a discussion offline between Stagecoach and the Council and just agree, um, you know, what policies, if, if anything, need um, potential modifications um, and then submit that to the examination and then uh, we mm. can take a look at that. I think the, the, the question from our perspective is, is there any are, are there any areas where they feel that the hook within the policy wording and within the um, the IDP and the uh, the various core and delivery policies are not is not strong enough? And if if um, that and in that that can't be addressed at development management stage, um, and we are we are very happy to um, to hear that. Um, and I think also you, I know you talk you want to talk about this in in one of the other sessions. I think it's really. Um, it re it's really important when we talk about sustainable transport and achieving mode shift that we link into um, the questions you've asked on core policy CP6 and um, and E13, I hope I've got the numbers right, which effectively set the strategic principles of you invest. If there's an if, if there's a mitigation, if there's an impact address um, needed, you focus first on sustainable transport. And if that is not, um, if that is not possible to fully address the, the mitigation through that, then, um, then that's when you start looking at high risk capacity. Um, and I also think it's, um, I know tone is important. We've talked a lot about motorway junction schemes and that is the nature of, um, of the discussion needed on infrastructure at this point. It doesn't mean that we don't feel that sustainable transport is equally important. It's, it, it's just those are the, the knotty issues as, uh, as you have correctly identified. Yeah, in, indeed. And, um, you know, we, we have got a, a separate session of Master 11 where we, we do focus specifically on um, sustainable transport, where we can look at that in, in more detail. But certainly, um, I think that would be a useful piece of work for um, yourselves and Stagecoach to uh, go away and uh, have a look at what, if anything, needs to be um, changed in the policies and submit that. And then, you know, in, in the spirit of the previous uh, session probably uh, where you can't agree then uh, flag those as well and then um, you know we can as inspectors we can have a look at those and, and take a view okay I, I've tried to make sure at reg 19 and at the reg 22 stage we flagged all of this up so I, I don't want to repeat any of that and it's not appropriate obviously to talk about individual sites but I would hope that what I'd already submitted to the authority would have would would indicate exactly those kind of policy hooks as, as you correctly folk have correctly identified we, we um, I'm not in a position to do a huge amount of more work on this to be perfectly frank um and I don't actually think there ought to be a huge great need to do so this this material has been in front of the council for quite a considerable period of time and its consultants so yeah I'm obviously happy to have a conversation but I I, I don't want people to go away feeling that that, that this uh that the, 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 there's a conversation to start now. We've we've had many years during which these things could be agreed. I have to say, no, I, I appreciate that fully, and um, I'm just conscious that I don't want to take up a great deal of session time with a sort of detailed tit for tat of specific policies that should have words changed, and and that that's the only reason why I'm saying if you could take it offline, then hopefully that's a, a more efficient way of of dealing with it. Thank you. Mm. Um. Mr. Flanagan. Good morning, ma'am. Yes, mm -hmm. Conor Flanagan on behalf of Taylor Wimpy concerning the G2 site at Wadden. And with me today, I've got um, James Darrell from Transport Planning Associates, our high risk consultant. Um, just on this specific question, um, I wanted to answer with benefit having watched this morning's session, if I may. Um, and just to 
really to, to, to kind of highlight that I don't think it's uncommon for plans to be adopted um, without the exact funding streams of infrastructure projects and the exact timings of infrastructure projects to be known. Um, it, it, it's quite commonplace for them to um, follow. Um, and we also need to be mindful that, you know, the Stroud plan is, is, a, is a much more far reaching plan. It's not just about some strategic allocations and improvement schemes to some motorway junctions. The, the plan goes a lot further than that, um, which we need to be mindful of. Um, the, and just going on to thinking about how those solutions come forward for those junctions, you, in our experience, um, developers and promoters need plans to make progress. And then with, with the progress of the plan, that gives some certainty and confidence to be able to invest in preparing planning applications. And then it's often those planning applications that then lead to the procurement uh, the relevant authorities getting engaged and, and the funding options being properly explored. And indeed, sometimes you're not able to apply to certain funding pots without being at that advanced stage. So I think it's commonplace for that to be crystallised after the plan is adopted. And Mr. Drover gave you the example this morning, Junction 10, I think, the Northwest Cheltenham strategic site. So it's in the adopted development plan for a number of years, and then it takes, takes time to come online. So relevant to the Stroud plan and how, how, do we, how do we assess the Stroud plan? Well, if you look at policy and MPPF paragraph 22, that gives you the context of taking a longer term view, really, on strategic infrastructure. So I don't think you can expect to have all the answers right now before the examination. And, and I find that, you know, commonplace and, and quite appropriate. And also the... Um, PPG um, has a very useful paragraph, I thought, um, 059. The ID reference number, ma'am, if you want it, is 61059-2019-0315. Have you got that? Or, I, I have. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and what that says in the PPG, it says, where plans are looking to plan for longer-term growth through new settlements, or significant extensions to existing villages and towns, it is recognised that there may not be certainty and or the funding secured for necessary strategic infrastructure at the time the plan is produced. In these circumstances, strategic policy-making authorities will be expected to demonstrate that there is a reasonable prospect that the proposals can be developed within the timescale envisaged. So I think, I think that should be the focus of what we're looking at in terms of the, the key infrastructure. And we heard from the authorities this morning, the county and highways England, in terms of you know, the real world, if you like, how long it takes for these projects to come online and be delivered. And, and, and we need to be realistic, but the plan will help facilitate those projects coming forward. You need the plan in place to be able to give the impetus for those discussions, those funding options to be crystallised and moving forward. No, that's our point. Thank you. No, I suppose to sort of put part of that quote back to you about um, a reasonable prospect of the infrastructure being required within the timescales envisaged. I suppose that's the, the key point, isn't it, really? Um, and what we were talking about this morning, that if the infrastructure is envisaged to be needed within years six to ten, but the evidence indicates that that may not be the case, then that's the rub, really, isn't it? Well, it, yeah, and it, it depends how you define reasonable prospect in the context of a, of a plan period. And as I say, MPF paragraph 22, looking at kind of longer term objectives. In a perfect world, we would have the Stroud local plan, the South Gloucester local plan and the JSP all moving in tandem. And you know, a perfectly coordinated plan, but that that's not reality, I'm afraid. Um, you, you we can't um bring those all line, and the plans will never be aligned, they're probably as close as they're going to get. So I think the question is, is is there solutions for the um mitigation required? Yes, there is solutions. Is is there um development schemes coming forward that contribute to that? Yes, there is. Has that been evidenced in the plan? Yes, there is. So I, I would suggest that, you know, you, you have got reasonable comfort that they will come forward in the plan period. 
And what, what specific are these mitigation solutions that you're referring to? Well, I think in terms of the parties looking at, at the, the, um, the infrastructure crossings that Mr Carter has done um, as part of the evidence to the local plan and like the schemes are, for, from our perspective, and I don't want to go site specific, we've looked at highway mitigation deep relevant to us, um, but but in terms of the plan, there's, there's mm -hmm. estimates and costings, but you know, I don't think the detailed schemes have been um, consulted upon at this stage, but that goes back to my point a bit similar to Junction 10, you wouldn't necessarily expect that to come forward at this stage, the defined detail of those. So, I mean, you don't really need to get into the site specifics because, the, I mean, really the big ticket items are the, the, the junction improvements that is what we've been talking about this morning. So I'm, I'm still not quite clear what the, um, just trying to understand your point that that's all, um, what the solutions for mitigation are that are sort of there in the plan. I, I think the, the, the solutions aren't, aren't readily available and on the table. I think that, that that's in, in terms of, you know, are we can, have they been consulted on schemes, etc.? No, but the point being that in plan making terms and looking at policy and the PPG, it's not unreasonable to expect those to follow post adoption um, that the development management process does crystallise those schemes. Clearly, the, the developers and land promoters and, and those involved in the local plan all have got a common interest in the plan coming forward, being adopted, and then those parties will work together in terms of crystallising those solutions thereafter. Because clearly, you know, the schemes cannot get planning permission without the um, infrastructure being in place, which is exactly what's happening at Junction 10 with the North West Cheltenham site. Um, so, and as I say, I think in, in our experience, that seems to be pretty commonplace, that you don't have all the answers at examination stage. Thank you. Uh, Mr Trover. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yeah, um, I'll, I was going to try and dodge site specifics. Um, yes, Mr. please, please do. Very well. <laughs> the, I, I'm going to mention one just in the, but you'll see the point behind it once I've made it. So, um, so the, this, this question has got two parts and um, uh, transport issues being dealt with at the early stages of the plan making, which is fine. I think all the statements are common ground. Won't disagree with that. Uh, and then um, um, the scale and location issue. So on the scale and location issue, this is where I'm going to straight. Well, you've heard about our, our views on sharpness, about um, whether it's compliant with paragraph 105. Um, and now the promoters have said that the delivery of PS 36 allocation is not dependent on the rail. I think the discussion around um, express coach options is all that more important. So and the reason I'm raising it is uh, Mr. Small may not be around for the, um, for the, I think it's reconvened in May, the May session for sharpness. Uh, so I'd be, um, personally, if he's not going to be around for that, I mean, I know his evidence in, I just would, would like to hear uh, more from Mr. Small about um, uh, the reasonable prospects of Express Coach. Um, it's probably going to be covered in one of the later detailed questions, but under the context of paragraph, um, uh, sorry, it's the scale and location issue, the viability of uh, longer distance commercial services um, is probably quite important. If Mr. Small, perhaps you just want to pick up on that point while uh, Mr. Yeah. Travers made it. Makes yeah, sense. no, absolutely no problem. Um, again, all of this has been covered in repeated representations at every stage. Uh, Reg 18, there was more than one Reg 18 con, as you know, um, madams. Um, and right the way through to Reg 19 and at Reg 22. I, I, I trust I don't need to repeat that. Where you have a site that is offline of any clear existing public transport corridor, bus corridor, coach corridor, doesn't matter. Um, you, you get into problems where, where the problems are that you have to divert a service off to, to get to that place. And it introduces a lot large amount of delay where you're looking at a entirely new service that is trying to meet demands that are expressed to a significant number of different locations in all different directions, you have an even bigger problem because the demand is split. Yeah. 
again, I've made this point in, in my reps, so I don't want to over over egg them. So the actual amount of demand you've got it to anyone in any one direction, never mind to any one dis destination, is attenuated. When you're looking at entirely new settlement, very relatively distant from any of these, these destinations, you have the additional problem of cost, cost of operation, but also the further compounded by the relevance of that service compared with driving. So this is why the whole issue of meeting housing need as close as possible to where that need arises is hugely important if you want to maximise the contribution of public transport. And the simple reason for that is this, is that any public transport journey, that journey time relative to driving is going to be more competitive. Not only that, th within a given cost of operation, you can offer way more frequency you know, to, to those destinations and create that relevant service with, you know, choice of departure and arrival times and all the rest of it. So we have a national problem with remotely located new settlements. And this is reflected in reps, not just to this local plan, but to as many local plans as I'm putting reps into. Yeah. Um, where we have got remote new settlements, relatively remote new settlements, we're finding that the public transport packages uh, to support those uh, uh, allocations are failing. Good example. Good example would be Upper Hayford in Oxfordshire. The third problem is phasing. In other words, the rate at which demand evolves. So, you know, even looking at final build out, that demand is 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 split. Yeah, creating a problem for for economics. We've got the problem that that demand isn't all there at day one. It may take 10, 12, 13, however many years to build out. So during that intervening period, how is that service, those services going to be funded? It's phenomenally expensive. So in the public record, and again, I could submit this, but you don't want any more evidence. Chalgrove, the new village in Oxfordshire, great example of this. Um, we put jointly with Oxford Bus Company, both Stagecoach and OBC put in response to the planning application for that, putting a price on it. And it was £15 million just to provide one route every 15 minutes to Oxford because of the distance and the frequency that people wanted. So, you know, we've got this problem of cost, very high cost over a very large number of years while the demand evolves um, and, and, and we're waiting for that demand to, to appear. We've got a problem with the fact that that demand in itself is split. So we're having to run to multiple services, not just maybe one or two, um, possibly three or whatever, um, you, you know, and the distances involved were, were these new settlements to be close in, uh, very close in. It, it's not a problem. You know, the number of vehicles and driver and driver hours involved is relatively low. Um, that the economics are hugely uh, easier to to deal with um, uh, over a shorter period of, of, of pump priming as well. You know, of, of, of initial revenue funding. So that's really where we are at with 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 this. Um, with these sort of situations, not just at Sharpness, but anywhere where you're proposing a relatively remote new settlement um, that, that 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 straddles labour market areas, which, which which because of its location looks in multiple directions. Mom, um, I must insist that we have a right to reply to that. Um, can, it, excuse me a minute, because I will bring you in, um, but I'm just going to work my way through um, other people's hands, but I, I will bring you in. Um, I'm conscious. I, I don't want to, I'm obviously, we're touching there on sharpness. I don't want to get into a big tip for tat about sharpness. Different parties' yeah. positions, but or, perhaps if you if you just come in um, with, with the point you want to make now, but I with the caveat that I don't want to get into a big tit for tat about sharpness because we no, have a session on that. That wasn't the session today, and, and Mr. Drover has introduced it just to help Mr. Small. Um, Mum, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Mr. Allen, as well. But um, firstly, Stagecoach is just one commercial operator um, with a business as usual model, which I'm afraid in Gloucester is in decline, in significant decline, and the county council is having problems with their service presently. Um, but we are not just talking about bus operators, Mom, and you will know from paragraph 104, well, sorry, paragraph 104, that we, we do start with uh, walking and cycling first, and that is translated in the new circular 1 of 22 for the Department of Transport, where it's looking at designs and how we reduce our short distance journeys by walking and cycling 
And then we look at other modes of transport, including train as well. Uh, all of that is encapsulated very handsomely within Sharpness and done very well, which is why the county and the district council are pushing for that form of sustainability. Uh, so we can't just rely on one commercial operator, Stagecoach, not being able to get out and reach out to um, new settlements. And we can't rely upon a business as usual um, development process when the government is asking us to turn a corner in order to get sustainability. And that's quite quite easily seen by in decarbonising transportation, the government document, as well as um, gear change, the active travel document. But I'm going to bring in my colleague, Tim Allen, who is our transport consultant, just to talk to Mr. Smalls, Mr. Drover's points here in, in a wider concept, please, if I may. Because I, I, just to re repeat, I, I understand the point and, um, you know, obviously you're going to want to reply and talk about more sustainable transport options to sharpness, completely understand that's the point that you're going to make, but that's that's not actually what we're meant to be talking about in this session. And all no. we're doing is kind of eating up time. So, um, I OK, fine, um, bring your colleague in to say something, but just if you can keep it short to the point, because I really don't want to get drawn any more into, into sharpness, because we do have a whole session. No, thank you, Mark. Well, I understand. We'll, we'll, keep it, we'll keep it to the questions if and, we're and okay. Likewise, that goes for sort of uh, Mr. Small and the uh, and the, uh, Mr. Drover as well. I, I don't want to get drawn into a big sharpness um, d debate on uh, today. I understand that, Mom. I, th I think I can probably be helpful in a, in a more general context. I think the approach we've taken has been to look at wider and emerging business models that are occurring now in the public transport sector. And certainly the sort of old traditional model of having, you know, fixed timetables and running services will always have its place and it will have its place in certain locations. But we know there are more emerging models of more direct services, more more chartered type services, uh, demand responsive services. And if all of those are underpinned with things like mobility as a service with mass um, uh, apps and, and, and sort of foundations that allow people to access lots of different ways of traveling for the, to meet their needs wherever they are in the district, wherever they're traveling to, then actually that's the kind of solution that we've got to be working towards, um, not just at Sharpness, but at all the sites across, actually across the country. Um, and that's certainly work I'm doing elsewhere. We're looking at how do we deliver uh, across all of the different available modes from walking, cycling, wheeling, all the way through to different models of public transport, different business models. And so uh, from that point of view, I think we sought to look at what is generated, what trips are likely to be generated by, in this case, Sharpness, and look at how do we pick the low hanging fruit, if you like, how do we deal with those uh, mass movements? How do we deal with groups of people that are traveling uh, from, from Sharpness to wherever they're going to work or whatever they're doing? Lots of them will be able to travel locally to the local employment that there is around that Barclay cluster area that uh, I'm sure we'll look at in future. But that range of, of different modes, I think, is really significant. And, and so I think it's important we don't get fixated on particular business models and particularly business models that may no longer work um, in the sort of new world that we're that we're starting to inhabit, we've got to look forward to solutions that are going to deliver against the sustainable transport aspirations that we've set ourselves in policy. Well, just, just to, to finish on that point, I just want to just make a. We we do have a specific session talking about sustainable transport, and that's not today. Um, so th this is all very useful and informative for us, but that's that's not essentially what we today's session is focusing on so if if you would like to make a further point fine but then I really want to get on and move through the agenda um, so we can sort of cover um because we, we want to kind of really be looking at delivery and um, viability um and I really want to get through the first part of this agenda before we break for lunch I'm, so, I'm happy for you to move on there Mark Okay. I'll be led by my colleague, Mark, but um, the, the, only, the only final point I'll make is just to direct your attention to paragraph 13 of the Department of Transport Circular 1 of 22, uh, which Mr Ridley from the Council has uh, put on the website, I do believe. Thank you. So, 
with that caveat in mind, I think we've we've kind of um, gone off the rails from the uh, the agenda and the MIQ slightly here. So um, if if we can all just refocus, <laughs> um, otherwise we will be here all day, um, which we don't want. Um, so has anyone got any points that they wish to make specific to question number two, which I know is a fairly broad ranging question, but I do kind of want to work our way down to some other questions. So, um, Mr. Mr. Gaze from the Parish Council, please. I think your hand went up next. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Um, I'm from Brooks, Paul Gaze from Brookthorpe with Wadden Parish Council. Uh, looking at sustainability and uh, I'm just a simple person. So unlike some of your professionals who are quite familiar with buzzwords and acronyms and planning policy guidelines and all that stuff. Um, I'd just like to draw attention to a few things and uh, it relates back to Mr. Small uh, Stagecoach. And the Wadden development, I know that's a separate issue to be talked about later in the programme. But in terms of mitigation and sustainability, there seems to be this mantra of walk, cycle, catch a bus. Uh, well, walk, um, if I try walking from my uh, residence in Brookthorpe to, Stone, to Stroud, the footpath is in a terrible condition, raised with highways department. They say they've got no money to maintain it. So, Walking obviously isn't a priority, okay? Cycling, well, take your chances. And we've got areas within our G2 site, Nars Lane in particular, that it would be suicidal to try riding a bike down that road uh, because it's no more than a donkey trap. Um, but going back to Mr. Small, where he said about some of the options he had, and on his submission, on his uh, replies he's done, um, he actually contradicts what he was saying because he says in his reply here, we have yet to see any clear evidence that buses will not be caught in chronic peak congestion between the site and the A38 of Barnabas Roundabout. So although they've got a um, memorandum of understanding with Taylor Wimpy, which was signed in 21, their later submission, virtually most of the document here, relates to the G2 site and issues with problems of sustainability, getting a route that will run up to Gloucester without the congestion at Barnabas Roundabout. Um, nobody's got any answers to it. Nobody's got any money for it, it's, it would seem, because it's such a, a huge cost. Taylor Wimpy say they've got a solution for the Barnabas Roundabout. We haven't seen it. They've never shared it with us. They've kept it uh, withdrawn and cloaked in secrecy under commercial uh, interests. So it's really struggling. What is sustainability? Thank you. I think probably the the session um, where you can sort of have a bit more detailed discussion about that it will be the site specific one. Um, That's this, right. Yes. Yeah. Looking at the more high level stuff. So um, yeah. I know uh, probably the consultant representing um, the housing developer may well be in this session. But again, I, d I don't want to get into a tit for tat over sites because that's not what this session um, is about. That is for the site allocation. So um, I. Right. OK, will... just finally, then. Um, as I said, the uh, mitigation and all this sustainability is really aspirational. Whether it can be delivered or not is really down to finance and the ability to actually put the facilities in place for it. And, and they're not, not within the plan as I see it. Nobody can show me anywhere where it's actually going to work. And, and going back to Stagecoach, Mr. Small's uh, department submission actually shows more problems than there are solutions. Okay, thank you very okay. much. Thank you. And um, I have a Rubicon iPhone. Oh, no, sorry. Not, quite, not quite sure who that is. Or... <laughs> sorry, ma'am, that, that's me, Tim Partridge from Tritech Symmetry. 
I'm having to call in off my phone. I'm out on site at the moment. Um, I just wanted to raise something from this morning's session, and you were asking about capacity at the motorway junctions, specifically Junction 12, and about national highways issuing holding objections. Our application at the moment on allocation 43, the national highways holding objection has been withdrawn. Um, and there is capacity at that junction for our proposal, which is in accordance with policy. The issue might be that the policy is uh, <clears throat> a broad employment policy, uh, and our application is for B8, which has lower traffic generation figures. But the application is in accordance with policy, and national highways have withdrawn their holding objection. So just as a point of clarity, there is some capacity at Junction 12. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cockett. Thank you, Ma'am. Um, my name is Andy Cockett. I'm from Litchfields, representing CEG and Charfield landowners. So primarily, Ma'am, concerned with Junction 14 infrastructure. Um, just a few very quick comments, Ma'am. Um, we agree that obviously Stroud has sought to engage from an early stage on on transport matters but clearly those discussions to date haven't been effective we don't think the plan adequately addresses the essential transport infrastructure and i think in your summary at the end of the last session Marm, you summarised neatly that there's still fundamental disagreements about some fairly basic things in relation to the uh, the plan obviously sites reliance on the delivery of significant and costly um, interventions on highways and no clear plans for funding um, and delivery. I think Mr Carter talked about comprehensive detail being provided, but without a plan of the actual junction works, which could have been provided in outline showing the land take, the associated costings and a sort of funding pathway of how that could be delivered. We've heard that the cost has doubled um, since the examination has, has started, so it's circa 60 million um, now. And I take Mr. Flanagan's point that obviously certain detail can come into play down the line. These This infrastructure takes a long time to come online. National Highways, we're talking sort of 10, 12 years. But obviously there's, there's got to be a reasonable certainty on up front and with some fairly basic detail just lacking and not in existence at the moment. So I, I don't think it passes that test at the moment. Just a final point, Marm, in terms of the interim potential growth and impact on Junction 14. There was talk about years six to 10 and, and how much would come online um, in that sort of second phase. But Mr. Russell did comment this morning that 700 units would come forward between 2025, 2030, which is in the revised trajectory. So those impacts would be starting from a very early stage, albeit sort of slightly sort of gradual gradual development sort of uh, through to 2030, but it isn't just a post-2030 issue. The trajectory still incorporates um, delivery from those sites that impact on that junction and have been evidence to impact on it. Um, so obviously that, that, that point needs to be obviously sort of tackled and we may come on to that on the other questions. That's all on. Thank you. Ms McCaffrey. Thank you. Um, for those that don't know, Lisa McCaffrey from National Highways, um, not to go over old um, grounds, but I can confirm that National Highways are content with the infrastructure identified within the plan. We're satisfied that um, strategic infrastructure will be required, and we agree that the form of grade separation, so separated junctions would be appropriate. Um, just on the point that uh, Mr Flan Flanagan raised, um, I'd be interested from probably Stroud to identify how the um, matter of detail is dealt with at DM in terms of who's bringing forward what, when. It's not something that I believe DM process would normally progress. For example, um, one of the consultants working with everyone else to undertake modelling for a cumulative impact assessment. We don't often see that happen. It's normally led by one of the councils or national highways. Yeah, I, I think that it probably al almost touches on really what we were talking about this morning, doesn't it, about needing to look at 
a way forward and one of those was looking at sort of what modeling needs to be undertaken so I'm wondering if whether that's something that can be sort of picked up as part of this conversation that's going to be had with the sort of strategic partners about things that can be taken forward um, I don't know if Mr Carter if you could sort of add that point um, to your list of things to agree or disagree on But very very quickly um apologies to mr cockett um if i've missed if, if i've said something that hasn't uh, that i haven't recalled i don't believe i said comprehensive detail um i think we, we were talking about this morning was that the um, effectively the principles are in place we all understand mr carter you need to put your microphone down can't hear you apologies um sorry yeah very quickly um i didn't unless uh, unless I'm proved wrong, say comprehensive detail was in place. We did talk about principles um, and the scale of the scheme and broad agreement on um, on, on those elements. Um, I think we've covered this morning why we are where we are on these points. Um, and I think in terms of the, um, the DM process, I think it's, again, just to clarify again, I did not say that this would be agreed through the development management process. I was specifically referring to the timing of the need for the schemes, which would be um, established through DM. Now we can, as part of this next steps exercise, we can try and move that element forward. Um, but I think we did also hear about the, um, the the position that we are in in terms of the lack of certainty of um, of growth outside of um, out, outside of Stroud, which does inherently place challenges on us being able to get to that point. Now we're very happy to try and move that forward, and we. We, we want to and I think it's clear to clear that we have been trying to drive this forward but there are factors outside not of just our control but also outside of South Gloucestershire's control at play in this instance. Yeah and I, th I think we had a, a good discussion about that this morning um, so I don't think it's necessarily helpful to sort of re re repeat that necessarily um, but I think it's it's part of what could be discussed offline again because it comes down to sort of fundamentals where there's disagreements around between the, the sort of the main parties. So you know, um, I don't think agreement's going to be reached in in this session. It's it wasn't this morning. So um, I I think uh, perhaps you include that in uh, your further pondering, uh, as as it were, over over the issue will be useful, um, Mr. Cockett. Mom, that was a latent hand. Apologies. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mom. Uh, my name's Hayden Jones. I'm a district councillor for the Barclay Vale Ward. Um, a lot of what I was going to say, Mr. Cockett raised earlier, but I will just uh, mention I listened with interest this morning, uh, and in particular to what Mr. Drover had, had to say. Um, the Stroud Transport Group has been, uh, we are told, uh, working for a number of years on trying to resolve the uh, highways and strategic highways issues in particular. So I'm, I'm slightly surprised that we are still where we are. Mr. Drover in particular was raising the concerns. Someone from South Gloucestershire Council, I think it was, mentioned uh, the West of England combined authorities. And I know that they, they fell away, but someone did raise the issue that they, they are and sh should still be involved in elements of this. So I do wonder what um, is going to happen about that and if we if we could have some feedback on that um, i won't go on to the sustainable transport too much but people did touch on it this morning mr small uh, sorry this afternoon mr small mentioned it and others have commented on it um, even if we do meet the most ambitious and optimistic levels um, it would still only uh, equate to a tiny proportion of people traveling by uh, public transport um, and uh, for walking and cycling as mr pong mentioned um, that's fine, and uh, the government are pushing for it, I know, and hallelujah to that, but uh, in the real world, I think people will still be working uh, around the use of the car, and therefore, whilst Mr Flanagan mentions that um, we shouldn't um, have everything completely nailed down, and I do understand that, some of the fundamentals need to be addressed, and clearly, Junction 14, which is of particular interest of me, um, has, has not been resolved. Mr Drover did mention this morning that um, it, I, I think, I won't put words in his mouth, he's very capable of that himself, but um, that uh, there was perhaps a bit of a disconnect between the Stroud 
plan and um, the strategic road network. And he mentioned that perhaps if um, a site perhaps nearer to Junction 13, where there is capacity of being considered, it, it might have been different. But I'll, I'll save the sustainable transport piece until later, Mum, because I know there are, we have an opportunity to speak on that then. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Alexander. Thank you, Mum. Yes, I'm Julian Alexander from PFA Consulting on behalf of Robert Hitchens Limited. Um, I just want to talk about the, with regards to the question, the location of proposed development. Given the issues that we heard this morning in respect of the motorway junctions in terms of their costing, timing, delivery, to me, it's um, logical that more development is placed around the one remaining junction um, at junction 13 which does have capacity to accommodate um, more levels of development, specifically early on in the plan period. Thank you. And hopefully that's something that will come out of the work that was, I don't know if you were listening to the session this morning that um, we discussed this morning, just looking at, you know, what's, what sites could come forward um, in, in that early part of the plan period. Um, and we'll hopefully get a bit more clarity on that once, uh, once that's been done. Thank you. Um, Mr. Choke. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Stuart Choke from Calibro, uh, representing Crest Nicholson in relation to uh, Hunts Grove Extension. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the terminology of essential transport infrastructure and also related to location. Um, <clears throat> this does cross over with the sustainable transport strategy, and so I won't go into too much detail, but I just wanted to draw attention to policy DCP1, which, which does require development to uh, reflect the importance of walking, cycling and public transport to deliver the highest possible, importantly, the highest possible share of trips by most sustainable modes. Now, that's obviously quite supportive of the uh, National Highway Circular released at the end of last year as well. What that does in combination with um, delivery policy EI12, which identifies that increasing traffic capacity should not be seen as the default mi um, mitigation mechanism and will only be accepted where residual traffic impact remains severe. <clears throat> um, that Those policies in combination we don't feel have been fed through into the sustainable transport strategy and in turn, which has informed the traffic modeling. Um, we therefore think that the traffic modeling has gone above and beyond the precautionary approach to be more than onerous. And that in itself may lead to um, larger scale uh, infrastructure, particularly in relation to the motorway junctions and particularly earlier delivery. This is set in the context that some sites may also have greater opportunities than other sites to consume their own smoke. Uh, again, I'm referring to uh, my client's interests, where there is a potential to work in combination with other allocations. Um, <clears throat> so again, um, the um, Javelin Park allocation, the Quedgley East allocation as destinations, um, but also referring to policy G1 south of Hardwick. It create that together they create a corridor approach that if reflected properly within the sustainable transport measures will help to reduce pressure on the motorway, potentially to a point of negating contributions to those improvements or also to enable early delivery of those developments. Um, it's something that we'll no doubt pick up on later, but I just wanted to raise those points early in, in uh, proceedings. Thank you. Um, Mr. Russell. Uh, just, just a couple of quick responses, really. Um, firstly, the Charfield landowners um, that I, uh, criticised aspects of the plan in, in terms of um, the plan still having some fundamental issues about uh, um, improvements at Junction 14. Um, and that we should provide reasonable certainty. Absolutely, we would fundamentally agree with that. And we have tried to work with um, with developers uh, when the in the context of South Gloucestershire being part of the the, the JSP uh, proposals, and indeed um, as part of the WECA proposals at, at the SDS 
level in the past, but the, the position is, um, as, as we said this morning, that uh, we can't move forward until um, we've got a firm view on the scale of growth at South Gloucestershire. And indeed, if, if, you, if you review Charfield landowners' uh, response to the matters, you'll see that they say themselves that a portion that needs to get the agreement of South Gloucestershire Council in order for us to move forward. We cannot get the agreement of South Gloucestershire Council on apportionment until we know the scale of growth that's coming through the local plan. So um, it, I, I don't want to reiterate all the points that were made previously, but I think this just 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 confirms that essentially we've done as much as we possibly can and we cannot do any more until we get more certainty on that aspect. Um, I, ju I, I just want to come back on the point raised by PFA in terms of Robert Hitchens. Um, we're not talking about emission sites, but um, there no. was a vac, and, and, I'm, and I'm certainly not going to be talking about them. The point I raised in the spatial strategy is that we we don't think it's a, a, a great strategy to have housing located on a motorway junction. And uh, I'll draw your attention to the proximity, the closeness between junctions 12 and 13. If you're looking at significant growth in the vicinity of, in terms of a new settlement, in terms of uh, proximity to junction 13 for northbound traffic, you are going to immediately impact significantly on Junction 12, where we've already established in the morning, we have similar issues, capacity issues. So the point I want to make is there is no easy solution. There is no easy solution. We have 12, Junction 12, Junction 13 in close proximity, and then we have Junction 14 in, an, in, a, in another authority's area. And all of and the topography and the nature of Stroud means that all growth, wherever you locate it, at some point is going to channel down onto those motorway junctions. It is a sub-regional issue. We've tried to do as much as we possibly can as a local authority. And we believe we've we have uh, provided an element of certainty to pick up um, Connor's point in terms of uh, providing a reasonable prospect of, um, of infrastructure coming forward. We've identified a funding and delivery plan. Now, the point that I think I finally just want to make is it, we, we're not, no one is suggesting we leave it to the development management stage. The point, the point that I would like to make is the local plan identifies through policy CP6, through specific references to the IDP. And if necessary, and if we get progress on a further iteration of the funding and delivery plan, we can reference that in the plan. So we will provide through the plan, the mechanisms for delivery. Uh, in terms of the actual um, delivery itself and the detailed designs that has to be left through the development to, to the development management stage. There are instruments that national highways can use through, um, through uh, as we know, to help us in a positive way to ensure that local plan growth uh, is delivered rather than speculative development. Uh, and, and we think we've gone as far as we possibly can on, on to deliver um, certainty on those points. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure um, Ms McCaffrey from National Highways could um, can come in if I'm wrong, but I would have thought it would be a reasonable assumption to make that if you've got three motorway junctions and the one in the middle is currently reasonably OK, if you suddenly start loading all your development around there, then you'll end up with issues there. I think was probably a, a reasonable as assumption to make. Quite potentially. Again, um, it is our junction that doesn't have capacity, significant capacity constraints at present, but yes, quite possibly. Thank you. Uh, sorry, sorry to come back on that point. The, the point I was making was not that Junction 13 doesn't have capacity. The point is that its proximity to Junction 12 means that if you have a large scale strategic for example, a new settlement, which is which is adjoining Junction 13, you will have immediate impacts on Junction 12 for northbound traffic. That so it's not uh, it, 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 it's not the point that Junction 13 is is the solution because it has a direct impact on Junction 12. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I I understood that. Um, Mr. Carter. Yes, just to. Um, just to elaborate on Mr. Choke's point, um, so we are, I think we are effectively in agreement in that um, our, what our policies set out um, is, is the strategic approach to promoting sustainable transport over providing traffic capacity. 
the STS guides how that direct how that um, how that will come forward, and um, we're fully supportive of the work that um, that Mr. Choke and others are doing at um, at development planning at development management stage as part of the as those sites come forward. Now, within the SDS, we um, we talked about mode shift and we talked about reductions to traffic growth that um, that would come forward um, as a result of of these measures. Now, I'm sure you'll you'll appreciate. Um, this was done over a number of years, and we also um, we we had to be in a position where you can't we couldn't go into an examination and say that we disagree with National Highways and Gloucestershire over the modelling assumptions. So we had to get to a point where we, we where the where the county and National Highways were content with the assumptions that they were placing in the model, um, and we also had to be in a position where we were presenting scenarios of modelling where you looked at. A, um, a scenario where you had the traffic growth, you had the traffic development, and then you had the traffic mitigation to show that um, as a as effectively as a, a robust scenario, that would be um, that sufficient mitigation was identified and 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 would be and would be needed. Now, a lot of um, as development management progresses, um, it's um, the the more detailed management, um, the more detailed modelling for individual schemes will be able to go further. With mode shift, if they can agree those um, with the county at, at that point, um, and what we feel that that will do is um, for the for the motorway schemes, as I as I set out this morning, um, we feel that that effectively is more likely to buy us headroom than replace the need for the scheme. So, given we are talking specifically about the motorway junctions in this instance, um, we're talking about providing additional headroom, um, but we don't consider that it's likely. I mean, we would be very supportive if it did. Um, to um, to replace the need for a scheme being delivered within the plan period, which is what the um, what, what the IDP sets out. Thank you, um, Mr. Fong. Well, just just a quick point. I I, I with Mr. Russell was finding, um, perplexed by PFA's comment about loading up motorway junctions that aren't already loaded. Um, simply because uh, we, the, the underlying theme behind this plan is a decarbonisation theme. It, it's trying to get to a net carbon result by 2030, uh, not 2050. Uh, I, I don't know if it all escaped you, but only three days ago on the 20th of March, the UN released its report on climate change, and we've got to reduce our emissions by 43% by 2030 to get just to a 1.5 degree uh, temperature rise. It's virtually impossible. I think Gloucestershire County Council have to get 50% of their population out of cars if we're going to hit a target by 2050. So it's 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 fascinating that we are talking about business as usual. I understand why we're talking about that. But equally, the emphasis has changed nationally. And I think we also need to focus on that. We've, we've now moved from a predict and provide to a vision and validate uh, proposal. And that's critical if we are going to balance up all the uh, agenda items that the government wants us to do in, in terms of providing growth as well as reducing our carbon output. But I think the next element on sustainable transport, we, we must focus on that as well, Mom. Thank you. Right, I'm now going to pause for lunch because um, we've already gone about 10 minutes into our lunch break. So I think um, we could all benefit from an hour to go and have a little stretch of our legs and something to eat. Um, also conscious that in an hour we've managed to cover one question. So we, we must do better this afternoon um, if, if we can try and sort of uh, focus on the MIQs rather than sort of drifting off. That, that would be useful. And rest assured things like you know when planning everything is interconnected isn't it so rest assured if you're wanting to sort of raise something that's not covered in these particular miqs they will be covered at some point in the session um you know in subsequent hearing sessions so um you know don't don't feel the need to have to say it now because you will have the opportunity to do so later so uh we shall break now and uh resume again at two o'clock thank you very much
Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the afternoon session, um, continuing matter 11b, part one. So um, I am going to pick up by starting with um, delivery and viability, um, purely because um, I've had a look through the statements um, that everyone submitted on the uh, questions uh, three to six, and I am quite content with what's being said. And I'm conscious that we uh, we want to move on to talk about delivery and viability, um, which is sort of the, the real focus of this session. So we will start with the section on that, which is questions 15 to 24. Now, what I propose to do, um, I think a lot of these questions are essentially going to be answered as a result of some further discussions that need to take place outside of these sessions. Um, so as we go through, I will sort of indicate which questions they, they are. Um, and I don't think, I mean, for example, on the apportionment methodology, um, it's it's been fairly well established that there is a, a lack of agreement about that and further discussions need to take place. So I don't think there's any further merit in, um, in going through that again uh, in this session because uh, we've already established that and uh, discussions need to take place um, between uh, the, the councils involved. So um, if we start off with question 15, um, so that asks, uh, does the viability evidence supporting the plan make realistic assumptions about costs? Now, in this respect, we're focusing on um, the sort of big ticket items, if you like, the, uh, the strategic infrastructure. Um, so we've already heard in the um, in this morning's uh, more focused section that the um, the scheme costs for the motorway junction improvements um, need to be looked at again. Um, so that's already been established, so we don't need to go through that. Um, so bearing that in mind, um, does anyone else have any comments that they would like to make regarding uh, the viability evidence and it making realistic assumptions about costs in relation to the plan? Looking for hands, can't see any. Okay, right, excellent. So, oh, no one's gone up. Uh, Mr. Drover from uh, the County Council. Yeah, so it's just a question: are, are we are we covering rail infrastructure viability in this section, or in the question seven onwards, by um, sustainable transport section? The, there are some questions a bit further on um, that look at railway. Um, specific related questions um so we will be covering them a bit further down in in this set of questions and i will go into them because we obviously didn't talk about the railway this morning that's fine thanks okay um right so uh mr small yeah just very quickly um we've got and discussed costs for packages with each of the promoters and, and I think Gloucestershire County Council are party to most of that I can clarify with Mr Trover and other the colleagues that they, they are indeed party to all of that but of course there's no assumptions about the costs of public transport measures so far um, which makes me nervous makes us nervous um, in as much as if all of the there's only so much land value to be captured obviously we've we've got pressures we see this all across the country where big ticket pieces of infrastructure effectively are the things that are the focus and then when there's need for actually relatively small amounts of money to ensure that a reasonably high quality public transport offer can be put in place early um and, and pump primed that 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 that, that, that money uh, becomes a bit of a difficult issue um, because there is no more land value to be captured so um it's not that we don't have an understanding and we haven't shared that understanding with with promoters, but I think it ought to give everybody, including yourselves, um, moms, you know, some confidence that, yeah, those numbers exist, but it needs to be set within the plan such that everybody knows roughly what it doesn't have to be exact, but just rough budget figures, um, not just for services, but where there are particular items needed to facilitate for example, bus priority and whatever, that, that we know what those are, we know what those costs are, we know that that's realistically deliverable as uh, 
I think it was um, uh, the planning consultant for uh, for G2 Wadden very very helpfully reminded us earlier. Thank you, and hopefully um, the discussions that uh, you have with uh, Mr. Carter regarding any sort of um, potential modifications to the plan should um, make sure that you've got the necessary hooks for things like that. Um, Mr. Millard. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, this may not be the, the correct place to ask the question, but it relates to Appendix A of the IDP, which lists uh, specific projects for each of the allocations. Um, so by way of introduction, I'm representing Pasima Homes in respect of PS24. Um, so Appendix A of the IDP lists the various infrastructure projects um, and the introductory paragraph to each section says that no apportionment analysis has taken place and that the costs provided are, to are total estimated costs. Um, but going through the list of those items that are listed for individual projects, by way of example for PS24, the Woodfield roundabout improvement, the cost comes in at 1 million under PS24, but under PS25 is 200,000. And if no apportionment has been made and their total costs, I'm just wondering why there's differences in figures. Uh, perhaps Mr Carter could answer that for us. That's possibly one for myself, Inspector. Um, yeah, I was just going to also respond to uh, Mr Small's points just around um, the lack of inclusion of, of, sort of bus related projects within the local plan. There are a number of projects that are identified in uh, the, the IDP in relation to bus priority corridors and also within the sustainable transport strategy. But if there are any other projects that Mr Small thinks should be included within the local plan, obviously, we can pick that up outside of these um, hearings. So, yeah, we're, we're happy to have that conversation. Yeah, the corridors are mentioned, but there's nothing specific. That's the problem. There's very little specific. There are specific projects which are, are listed, but yeah, again, we can share those with you and, and you can provide comments on those if that's helpful. Um, I, th I think if if you probably sit down together and yeah, have, yeah, that's, have that's a chat and, and get to the bottom of what needs to be in there, that, that would be useful. Um, and then in response to Mr Millard? Yeah, ju just in relation to apportionment. So that, that reference is um, the fact that the IDP work hasn't done apportionment itself in relation uh, to those schemes that are tested through the uh, traffic, um, the sorry, the funding and delivery plan, which obviously is a um, and it includes an approach to apportionment, which we've covered in detail this morning. So there is some apportionment, but it's not been done within the IDP itself. And then there is a, a general principle, I think, within um, let me just refer to the IDP, um, where it explains the methodology for apportionment for those schemes that have been apportioned. Um, which is based on um, the number of sites which are contributed, um, expected to contribute through the traffic forecasting. Um, so the total number of site, um, total number of dwellings that are contributing towards um, the impacts are then split in terms of the schemes for the costs. Um, but yeah, there's no specific additional apportionment undertaken beyond that methodology that's set out, apart from within the work that. Um, Chris and uh, his team have done as part of the funding and delivery plan. So just to clarify for my own sake, when you're talking about apportionment in that sense, you're talking about between sites as opposed to between district councils? It, yes, it focuses purely on the growth in the um, in, in the, the local plan. The funding and delivery plan is, is the only one where we've tested um, growth or also made assumptions about growth outside of Stroud. Thank you. Uh, yeah, bef before when I said um, we covered apportionment, I was talking to apportionment between the councils, not not between sites. So, uh, Mr. Millard, just uh, so for your own uh, uh, clarity there. Um, okay. So, if we move on to look at question sixteen, which is the transport funding and delivery plan. So that sets out. The, uh, the two M5 junctions and the A38 corridor. So we we covered the motorway junctions um, this morning. Um, so what I wanted to, so I was conscious, uh, Mr. Drover, you, you sort of mentioned at the back end of the session about the A38 and we didn't really touch on that this morning. So was there, 
But anything um, that you wanted to add about the, the mitigation measures for the A38s in terms of, you know, the, are they necessary, justified, um, you sort of reasonably content from the County Council's point of view that there are a comprehensive set of measures that are required? Thank you, ma'am. Um, yeah, I think we've agreed uh, the modelling impacts at the A38 junctions, excluding St Barnabas in connection with Wadden, and we'll deal with that on the um, on the Wadden day. Uh, so the list um, that's priced doesn't include that junction. I think it's six junctions, and they principally are orientated around Berkeley Junction 13 um, and Junction 12. Uh, so they're the corresponding A38 junctions, and we were quite relaxed that you know Berkeley, um, sorry, Sharpness came forward then. Uh, there would be a requirement to direct, directly mitigate them. So I wasn't actually that bothered about the um, amount of money. It, I mean, if, but if we are having further discussions on it, then we can refine it. Um, and it's not uncommon for those, you know, a road rural junctions to be in the order of one to two million when you're upgrading from a simple junction to a signalized or an existing signalized to increasing the entry capacity so I, I think we can deal with that and i think um we'll deal with um St barnabas on on the wadden day thank you that's helpful um mr carter thank you um yes and i broadly agree with with mr drover just for the benefit of um of, ev of everyone um just to clarify st barnabas isn't on the a38 just for anyone who isn't quite isn't aware of that point um it's a separate um it's a separate location um and just as an overarching point the um the production of these mitigation packages and the further work done in, into each of them was effectively in response to um to representations from um, national highways and gloucestershire in terms of needing a bit more detail on um on strategic mitigation and I think the, um, as, as Mr. Ava mentions, these are the locations on the A38 are the ones that have been um, effectively picked out through the strategic modelling as being um, likely to require capacity interventions. But they are also on, um, on what we consider to be a, a key public transport corridor. So we see those, um, those schemes coming forward as, um, and the detail of those schemes coming forward, incorporating um, a, a kind of a more holistic approach to, um, to, to capacity um, across a range of, um, a range of modes as, um, as those schemes come forward. And I think the important point um, on these is that um, the, these um, they can be delivered in multiple different phases. They don't all need to be delivered in one go in response to one site. Um, they can they can come forward staged as individual sites come forward and as um, and as those uh, those needs are identified through through DM. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jones. Thank you, ma'am. Just quickly, I'm not sure if this is, this is the correct place. I note um, that the A38 stroke B4066 junction is mentioned, as is the A38 Alpington Lane junction, but no uh, mention is made of improvements required to either Alpington Lane, the B4066, or indeed the junction of those. Um, as someone that represents this area, this is um, a really important factor for local people and if sharpness was to go ahead this would be a big issue it is at the moment and it would be become worse i just wanted to highlight that fact thank you i think probably the best place to pick up those particular issues is going to be actually on the day covering sharpness site itself because then we'll have the opportunity to really get into the nitty-gritty of it and talk about the the local roads um, <coughs> on it then thank you ma'am yeah Thank you. Um, Mr. Brandt. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Um, just to introduce myself, my name's Neil Brandt. I'm a highways and transportation consultant uh, appearing today on behalf of LNQ Estates with their land interest at G2 Wadden. Um, relating to the A38 and uh, Mr. Drover's clearly mentioned that we will discuss some Barnabas roundabout mitigation works in a separate session relative, uh, particular to the Wadden allocation. But regards to Junction 12, I'm afraid, and bringing back to that, but the apportionment of that is that when we're looking at the time and cost, it's not just the case of the right place and the right time for the delivery of the infrastructure, it's the right time and the right place for 
the development relative to that infrastructure in so much as sites such as G2, Wadden will have probably one of the lower end impacts at Junction 12. Um, and as I'm sure it will be evidenced in the further work that will be produced for the, the examination that those impacts may not actually uh, result in any worsening of the operational impacts at Junction 12. So there, there has to be some relationship of the phasing and the timing in which certain sites can come forward relative to the high ticket item um, SRN motorway improvements, um, as well as obviously providing the more localized improvements on the A38. So I think the point here is that the relationship of the timing and the true traffic impact of those locations can actually give confidence to the plan that strategic sites can come forward without having a significantly detrimental impact on some of the, these more difficult junction locations. I, I think um, such sort of questions like that should hopefully come out of uh, the work that Mr. Russell is going to be having a look at in terms of which sites could potentially be delivered in the, the early part of the plan period. So we'll, we'll have a look at that in due course when uh, that materialises. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Is it Tom's? Mr. Tom's Whistler Action Group. Mr. Tom's, have you you got your hand up? Would you like to speak? Sorry, I was still muted. <laughs> I I've got a point regarding the A four one three five, but. Um, it does raise a, a rather wider point, which I would like to uh, put to you. Um, we've heard today that the forecasting tools that have been used are the best available. <clears throat> and I've no doubt at all they are. I've no doubt at all that the very best tools are used. However, all of these are dependent on using good quality data and a good set of assumptions. Now, one of the things which is reckoned to be quite useful when doing any sort of for forecasting is local data. And I would maintain, in fact, that local data, and to quote two examples, uh, the census data for 2011 and 2021, throw some very interesting light on traffic patterns around the A4135. And also, as I referenced on the 7th of March, the emerging Slimbridge NDP evidence base provides very useful information on traffic patterns as well and work patterns. And unless these data are used, inevitably the forecasts will be flawed. And if the forecasts are flawed, it's inevitable that any mitigation is also very doubtful. We've got comments on traffic and PS37, which with your permission, examiner, we, uh, Inspector, we will bring forward under matter five. But I think there are more important issues than that. I think there are questions regarding a lot of the forecasting. Thank you. Yes, I think if you bring those more specific issues forward as part of um, the site specific um, session, then that, that would be quite useful to do that. Thank you very much. I have two other points to make, but I will, I will raise them later on. OK, thank you. So moving on to um, question 17, um, that looks at the proposed duelling of the B4008 and the new park and ride. So um, part A asks, should these be included in the M5 Junction 12 mitigation package? So, Mr Carter, you'd like to respond to that? Um, yes, so coming first to the um, to the proposed duelling. Um, so this was identified um, at um, one of the later stages within the um, within the plan making um, and the modeling as a result of um, a significant increase in the scale of development at um, proposed at Javelin Park. Now, as you've you've heard from um, the chat from Tritax Symmetry earlier, um, the modelling for Javelin Park is a um, it, it is based on a um, an employment scheme. Now, there's a lot of doubt in terms of what type of 
employment comes forward and the um it has the, the local plan has to effectively cover the eventuality so it includes a proportion of um of what used to be known as b1 b2 and b8 employment types um now it was reasonably fair to say that it was likely that Devlin Park was going to be coming forward predominantly as B8, so effectively a lower, a lower scale of um, of traffic generator for um, in in that location. So, um, and uh, coming forward as B8 would have meant, and I believe um, is is potentially being evidenced through the through the DM process. Coming forward as B8 is going to lessen the impact as a result of. Um, uh, as a result of the um that the enlargement of that particular allocation um and also um that allocation that that increase coming in relatively late um meaning that uh, it wasn't possible to incorporate into the modeling um a more sustainable led approach to reducing the um the, tr the trip generation and the impact of that scheme it meant that effectively we knew that a dueling would mitigate the capacity issue in that location However, we felt that there were quite likely to be better options, either the, the scale of impact not being as great um, at the DM process or a more sustainable led um, approach to mitigation coming forward in that location. Um, and therefore, we detached it, that section from the M5 Junction 12 package, as it were, um, on the grounds that, um, that we felt that it could be addressed in isolation rather than from a strategic perspective um now on the other part of that question the new the new park and ride um so we understand that's an aspiration in um well it's in the gltp um and we were requested by gloucestershire so um as part of the sustainable transport addendum the gltp had been made since it was originally published so as part of the addendum we were updating it to reflect sustainable transport schemes um now, I suppose it's for Gloucestershire to advise on the status of such a scheme, but the difference between a park and ride site um, and a capacity solution at, um, at Junction 12 is that um, the park and ride site would actually be more, whilst located by Junction 12, the benefit of that would actually be extracting car trips as they go into Gloucester. So it effectively addresses an impact elsewhere on the network rather than the impact at Junction 12 itself. So it... it it wouldn't necessarily, um, I mean, you could argue it might even attract trips to Junction 12, but broadly speaking, the idea is that you take the trips that have come off the motorway and put them onto a bus before they go into Gloucester. So that was the rationale for those two schemes being um, being dealt with separately rather than as, as part of a, um, a Junction 12 package. Thank you. Um, Mr. Drover. Thanks, ma'am. Um, yeah, so the B4008, well, I just want to bring it back to the uh, predict and provide discussion, which we're not doing anymore. So uh, there's some point between Stonehouse and Stroud um, where it's sort of equi, it's not equi distance, it's equi time travel between um, going up the B4008 or going to junction 13 and up the M5, uh, sort of a triangle, if you will. Um, and I mean, just making it more attractive to use the B road in terms of regional or sub-regional movement across there um, is not going to serve a great deal of purpose. Probably makes sense to keep the road, the traps, traffic, traffic on the strategic road network. But that said, I think there is a there is a case that the, um, whatever Junction 10 solution comes forward, there will be a limited amount of dueling on there, just so the junction operates properly. So. Um, goods vehicles, whether it's B1, B2, B8, um, it could be anything combined heat and power, tomato um, plantation, whatever's going out of there, um, wishing to turn left, uh, northbound, wishing to turn left on the M5, those movements ideally shouldn't obstruct um, the straight ahead over the junction into Gloucester. So I'd, it's a bit of a fudged answer, but uh, so, uh, locally, I think that there's a, a short degree of um, widening just to make the junction work properly, but not uh, predict and provide. We need 600 meters of dual carriageway um, so that regional traffic can can go that way. And then on the on the park and ride, um, so um, I think that, that that is, I mean, it's largely success is driven by town center car parking charges and things like that. 
we've got the water well site and Nick's still on the call. Yeah, it sounds up. He can tell us what's happening with that, but it's not been particularly successful. So that's um, quite a distance north of the um, um, of Junction 12. Um, but there's a statement of common ground with the warden promoters that a service would go from the water well site through. Um, I've, I'm, I'll call it edge of. I'm not. I'm not going to use site names. <laughs> I think I'll just call it an edge of settlement site. Um, and anyway, so there is a, a plan which could enhance that one. But um, I think um, that traffic would be at Junction 12 in any event. So it, whatever the reduction would be, it would be a reduction going into town um, from from Junction 12. So I don't see it um, as relevant to the mitigation at 12. It would be more relevant to air quality and traffic and sustainable transport in Gloucester. Thank you. So essentially with this dueling of the, the B4008, because you're not quite sure about the end user for Javelin Park, and there's a variety of options that you could do around that um, sort of in terms of engineering road solutions. So it, you're essentially wanting to not be too specific in the policy to keep your options open. Would that be a reasonable summary? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay, I understand. Um, Mr. Small. Thank you, Mom. So just to give you some assurance, this, this whole area immediately to the north of Junction uh, 12, um, where, of course, we've got um, commitments in the existing local plan and, and stuff that's going to roll forward as well, that, that, that we, we can also talk. There, this is a great example of where there are a quite a significant number of relatively I, readily identifiable solutions that would damp uh, trip demand around and through that junction whether or not they had some tendency to want to use the m5 or not these aren't just public transport solutions although we're talking with all of the promoters about that and we've got some very clear ideas how that's going to work which i think needs to give you some comfort um there's some really interesting opportunities to actually have buses bypass uh, junction 12 completely um using a, a mode filter on a secondary road again not for now because it's a bit too specific but i just want to give you a, some uh, some comfort that those uh, sort of solutions uh, look to be um deliverable at relatively low cost at very low risk um and of course i'm very pleased to see us re recover the issue of the a38 itself between um junction 12 and junction 13 that's already a major um public transport corridor we can see some really good opportunities to boost frequency hours and operation between Stonehouse, Whitminster, and then south of Gloucester and into Gloucester. We are also running a separate service along uh, the B4008. We see, again, excellent opportunity to boost that service up, um, really, again, demonstrating the, the, the validity of the Sustainable Movement Corridor strategy. Um, both at well, all points between Stonehouse and, and, and the Gloucester Southern Fringe. So um, I just wanted to, 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 to reinforce that point. And the final point, if I may, our Stroud network is stable. It's actually growing. We have more passengers on our buses in, in, into, into the sort of Kingsway and, and, and uh, south of Gloucester Fringe area than we did before COVID, I'm delighted to say. Um, our Service 64, which runs between Gloucester, uh, Hardwick, Whitminster and so on, uh, into into Stonehouse is probably our best performing service for growth in the whole of Stagecoach in Gloucestershire. Uh, significantly more um, usage. Delighted to say that that use of buses in Great Oldbury, for example, which is in the current local plan coming coming forward, um, is ahead greatly ahead of expectations. So I want to give you some comfort that no. We're not yesterday's news. There is absolutely a clear vision. We've got plenty of evidence that gives us confidence what we can make work for bus. Bus is not the only show in town. We're obviously really keen as well to um, leverage sustainable modes, walking and cycling as well, to just damp car journeys and means that our buses don't get caught up in traffic. So I think that's all I need to say. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Partridge. Mr. Partridge, you got your hand up. Did you want to speak? Yes, sorry, I'm just trying to turn everything on, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I've managed to get my name up on the screen. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm the chap from Cytex Symmetry that was speaking earlier on. Yes. Um, yeah, we don't, I don't disagree with 
with what the previous um, speakers were saying, at the time that the local plan um, was put forward, it was as a, a general employment site. Um, the extension from nine hectares to 27 hectares came fairly late in the day. It's obviously in the Red 19 plan. Um, our, our, our application at the moment is on the top of being determined and is for a pure B8 scheme. So all of the traffic impact work has been done on that basis, which is why I was saying earlier, um, national highways have withdrawn their objection because traffic impact from B8 off peak is a lot different to B1, B2, as it were. Um, we've done a lot of work with um, stage coaching and very good relations with them and built in some more sustainable modes of transport. So we've increased the combined cyclewaste footpath to the site. We've put in a bus turning circle and a, a bus shelter into the site to enhance that to mitigate, mitigate some of our impact. Um, so in terms of the necess necessity of dueling of B4008, um, I'm not a highway engineer, I'm a highway engineer, so I'm a WSQ. Um, so I'm going to be doing You've, you've just suddenly gone muffled. Okay. I don't know if you were covering your microphone. Sorry, is that better? Yes. Sorry, big fun. Yeah, so, so our highway engineers, WSP, have said that some of the viewing issues on the B4008 are because traffic can't access onto the junction 12. So it, it, it's an issue of, of cars being able to pull out because of the uh, the inefficiency, inefficiency of that junction. So actually, it's on the solution to traffic queuing on the B4008 is the Junction 12 improvements, which is why in a submission they're saying they, it should be combined. Um, it can't solely be down to PS43 um, to, to dual that road. Other people obviously use it, and obviously the people are causing development. Thank you. Thank you. you. You were muffled towards the end again, but I, I did catch the, 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 the gist of what you were saying there, I think. Um, okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so um, moving on. So uh, question 18, looking at the uh, the cost of uh, the infrastructure packages. So we, we've discussed the, the motorway um, ones this morning. We've just already talked about the A38. Um, we've answered the RIS question this morning, so I don't propose to go into that. And then question 20 and sort of all the, the subsection of that, uh, there's quite a, a number of subsection questions on that. Again, um, I don't propose to go into um, all of those individual questions purely because I've, I've had the answer in this morning's session, which was that the councils don't agree on the apportionment methodology. So I, I don't really see um, what benefit there is with me probing it further because the the, the principle of agreement is not there. Um, so I think um, we need to sort of um, wait until the further work and discussions take place and, um, and see uh, what comes out of that. Um, the one question that I did just want to ask because I, I know that some... Um, I read it in one of the reps uh, for today's hearing was just in response to the um, subsect question I, where it's asking about the um, the trigger point, the threshold point of 150 dwellings. Um, I did read that someone had um, put in a, a slight concern about that, that it was perhaps maybe arbitrary and that maybe it should be looked at in terms of sort of um, traffic impact as opposed to the sort of just the quantum of dwellings before, uh, you know, that would trigger the need to contribute towards any uh, junction improvement scheme. Mr. Carter? I think it's just important to clarify at this point that we weren't, um, we weren't saying that schemes with fewer than 150 dwellings um, would not be able, would not need to, to, um, to contribute. I think it was a, um, what we were seeking to do was try to um, develop a a, a methodology that didn't um, result in relying on every single, every every single area of development um, coming forward, just so that we had a bit more confidence that um, that the that the scheme that 
the, the, the level of contribution that we felt was necessary would be achieved from from um uh, from from the other schemes now clearly we've had that conversation has moved on a bit in terms of the um the seeking the external funding um but we are in we are in no way saying that um schemes that are few smaller than that level but do have an impact um would not need to contribute maybe a question of looking at maybe the policy wording then just to make sure that that's that's quite clear and you've got the the yeah. list books that, that you need there isn't a policy wording saying that um referring to 150 dwellings unless um unless i'm corrected by someone else mark shaking his head it was a um it, it was a an it was an arithmetic it was a, a basically a, a numerical methodology to uh to, to get to a point it's it's from the tfdp isn't it but yeah. presumably if i mean going forwards if you are going to be looking at um developer contributions to fund um, part of these schemes, you are going to need a policy hook to do that. So I presume yeah. that's going to come back to the point that National Highways were making about looking at your specific site allocation policies and making sure you've got quite clear references in there where um, so site promoters mm. are going to know whether they have an expectation of being caught by that requirement or not. And just being clear that it's it's looking at, you know, essentially you're looking at, you know, larger schemes that are going to have a traffic impact aren't you mm. so it's, it's whatever policy wording you you need to kind of um put in yeah absolutely and a lot of our a lot of our policies do reference the need to for specific allocations to contribute to, to specific schemes but as the discussion between mark and, um, and national highways earlier um we will be be looking at um at tightening um tightening that yeah okay that that's sensible thank you uh mr partridge Thank you. I think it, it may have been um, my submissions you're, you're referring to. We did say that it seemed that smaller schemes were being excluded from making contributions on the basis of the formula that, that calculated who, what, who, who paid for what share started off from the basis of excluding a number of allocations. So whether or not it's in policy or not, the, the, the formula um, certainly started off on that basis. And as we say in our rates, we, we can't see that we're being, being like now. Oh, you've, um, you've gone muffled again. I beg your pardon. I don't know why. I'm, I'm going to work off my laptop. Um, so we don't think it could be, can be fair that uh, schemes that are called, such as ours, are paying for mitigation from traffic impacts of schemes who are not being required because of their being slightly below the threshold. So it's, it's set out in, in our reps, but I think it comes... Oh, no. Right. Okay. Oh, you, you're buffering and dropped out a little bit there, but I, th I think basically I've, it, it was your reps that I was reading, so I, I, I get the point that you're making, and um, I think that should hopefully be picked up by looking at the specific policy wording that we just discussed with um, with Mr Carter there. I think it's also clear within within the IDP as well that there is an expectation that um, that funding comes, um, that that there is a level of funding that will be coming from those smaller um, from smaller sites that aren't specifically. I said what I needed, thank you. Thank, thank you. Sorry, you, I know you, you, you're having connectivity difficulties there, but I, I did get, I have, I'm conscious of what you said in your reps and I, I have uh, understood the point you were trying to make there. Um, Mr Stockall? Thanks, Mum. Um, it was a point just to clarify that I know we've skipped over to um, sub point I and I was just waiting to jump in on G very quickly just for some clarification points so you're aware. Yes. Um, that's just to, so I'm representing Talk with Estate who actually we don't we don't have interest in Stroud but the main interest is their land ownership on three sides of Junction 14 and their strategic promotion that we're representing for St Mogburn also on, on Buckover Garden Village and I appreciate we don't want to go into any details on South Gloss now but just to clarify that they have a um, a dialogue. We've had um, dialogues with with National Highways and others, and we're keen to continue that. But there is reference in a statement of common ground from South Gloss about land being safeguarded at Junction 14. 
And just to clarify that there hasn't been any discussion or any formal agreements or, or any discussion on ownership. So so you're aware um, and that, that that the estate would want to be party to any future working groups and, and that side of it as a key party. But obviously they would be pragmatic in that, that anything that helps open up wider land interests is in their interest. But uh, they will need to take a, a semi-commercial view, shall we say. Um, but you need to be aware as well that they're promoting and we're promoting and working with South Gloss in terms of promotion of a wider park and ride option and 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 a bigger piece at the junction as well so there is a you know, potential <coughs> opportunity to explore there albeit outside of the district um and then the last point i'm as well you know, as, as i've got the the floor quickly it's you know as a garden pr promoter garden community promoter it's all about you know zero zero carbon and as mr fong said earlier about these self-containment and and looking at alternative modes and we would expect all the other parties to do everything they can in order to reduce their impact on the junction junction 14 and not to forget the wider aspirations of decarbonisation so it's um it is not a traditional approach to looking at the junction we shouldn't we shouldn't be starting with a traditional approach to uh concrete development as someone said earlier i think um but really i thought i'd just uh, put that marker down quickly as i think i'd miss any other opportunity and other questions coming up thank you and um Presumably, um, if that's something that you're working on with South Gloucestershire and um, they've got a, a scheme around Junction 14 and a park and ride option, you've spoken to National Highways, that's something that South Gloucestershire can pick up as part of these discussions that are happening with Stroud and the County Council um, about what is going on around those junctions and and what your various positions are on that? I, I think I should probably clarify that it's not a South Gloss proposition. It's it's our promotion of a park and ride. And I don't think it would be ah, appropriate right. to say they're supporting it, but we're in discussion right. with them as an opportunity. Um, but right. it certainly has no status. I don't think I would want you to take this away that, that South Gloss has signed up to it. It's a it's a promotion idea that we're in discussions with um, right. South Gloss okay. and representatives. Okay, so... OK, well, Mr. Carter heard that as well, so um, you can yeah. feed that in as appropriate. And just to just to say, Mr. Mr. Tockle's um, input is, is is helpful. And um, as um, we will, we will be led by South Gloucestershire in terms of the engagement on this uh, on this scheme. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Ms. McCaffrey. Thank you. Um, just a point, a point on I, but just while we were on G and I know it's been made clear about the park and ride I'm also not aware that um, Buckover has official garden village status so whilst they might want to be a garden village or badge themselves as a garden village again there is no allocation or status at this stage. Okay I don't really want to get into that at this particular moment but thank you. Thank you. Um, just on point I um, completely support um, Tim Partridge's suggestion and then thank you Chris for backing that up. We will need those policy hooks to pick up all sites that impact or all developments that impact at the junctions in question. Um, other places across the region we have going back to those Grampian conditions had to Grampian very small developments where they only add a couple of trips to the network because cumulatively it is unsafe and unacceptable to national highways so every, every contribution will help to get that funding um, pot far than the schemes brought forward. Thank you. Thank you. So again that's something that you can have a chat with with Stroud in the list of potential main modifications where you think that policy hooks could potentially be strengthened or added then that would be useful to see that um, and uh, we can take a view when we've got it thank you uh mr flanagan mr flanagan did you want to say anything i can't hear you you're still muted Right, okay, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, yes, okay, well. Thank you, well. It's um, James Dowell here from uh, Transport Planning Associates, obviously in relation to G2 allocation, which I know we're going to discuss at a later time in terms of the specifics. But um, at question 20, uh, part G was raised, and obviously in there it's talking about third party land. Do any of the schemes rely on third party land? And then uh, GCC's response and um, representations, they're saying that St Barnabas relies on third party land. And I just want to clarify that we have a scheme that does not rely on that. 
we've um, uh, Nathan Dover is aware of that information and we're in discussions with him at, at the moment um, and hopefully we should uh, enter into a statement of common ground but I thought you should be aware of that. Okay thank you. So um, moving on to question 21 um, so this is looking at the um, sustainable transport strategy addendum which lists a number of uh, interventions um, with some significant infrastructure projects. So um, we've already talked about the, um, the park and ride, um, but this is the point where um, we can sort of touch on rail as well. Um, so I know Mr. Drove, you, you wanted to um, make a point about rail. Um, so now, now is the opportunity to, uh, to do so. Um, but bearing in mind the, the questions that we've, we've asked um, in, in 21. Yeah, okay, so this is probably an answer for 15, uh, but um, I've said rather than um, get off the subject, so things were flowing so well, I probably didn't, it was best not to raise it then. So I think, um, does the viability evidence support the plan and make realistic assumptions about costs? And um, the, so we've got to be quite difficult. On, um, on the Sharp Nest site, I think we'll deal with um, the strategic case and the strategic fit of rail and um, on the day um, and I think we can also deal with the um, the demand issue on the day whether the demand for passengers is there but what I'm interested in is the um, the capital and operational costs they they still appear to be hypothetical um, and unverified um, and not agreed with the rail industry in particular. So it's, I, I know Mr. Fong will have a strong opinion on this, but from Stroud's point of view, it's their plan. Um, how did they, um, sorry, are they in agreement with the um, latest version of um, um, operational and um, capital costs? Um, and do they have any evidence that the rail industry has accepted it? And I, I, I know in evidence there's a timetable that's been agreed, but I mean, that timetable says that, um, you need to go on to make a strategic case that um, the transport solution is solving a problem that can't be solved in another way um, and then that it how it fits into the network not just in timetable terms uh, but in terms of um, the the not interfering with the strategic archery uh, for um, a potentially non-strategic provision if i make sense anyway so it's it, it's it's really that and then this the follow-up from that is how is it covered in the idp because i i think we see 1.1 million pounds um funding allocated in uh, from sharpness in um an apportionment somewhere and another one for the docks uh, but the, the totality of the cost um uh, capital and revenue how how was um stroud envisaging that would be dealt with thank you uh mr fong I'm slightly disappointed that Mr. Driver keeps trying to make this a site-specific uh, agenda, which it is not. No, um, I, I think to be fair, he didn't. We're just talking about rail in in general. So let's let's steer away from getting into a site-specific about sharpness. And it yeah, it, I mean, just just to answer his questions. He's, he's had, he has a paper already that gives him the costs of um, all of the sharpness rail infrastructure delivery and business case and uh, that is before him and that is attached to our statement of common ground which you have as well mom so so that that's a uh, well-trodden ground and um, stroud is a, a very enviable district in that it has the ability to provide sustainable development around existing rail networks uh, and yes there has to be careful work done to that in terms of timetabling i'll, I'll ask my colleague from Stantec, Lee Stolworthy, just to, to, to look at that and how it can be planned and delivered through the district. But we, we need to take up the opportunity to use the rail structure more if we are trying to turn a corner in sustainability. Um, and I'm afraid that the sharp nest development is the only opportunity where uh, an allocation has actually utilised the rail structure successfully. And, and that has to be applauded, Mar, because it will get people out of the cars. Um, it, it's all very well us talking about uh, demand and, and provide solutions. It's old currency. And um, what we do need to try and do is get people out of their cars completely. 
Uh, it's all very well buses running around, but they still send out particulates as do electric cars. And we've got to try and avoid that as well. I'm just going to bring my colleague Lee in about the, the rail structure so he can give you commentary on the costings of that and how it's looked at. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, yeah, I think you, the, the, you've got the evidence on it, but there's, you know, the, the refresh calculations that were done is based on um, Office of the Rail Regulator and comparative costs with other services that are operating and the operational costs of those, which we've used as a benchmark uh, to calculate the operating cost of what the sharpness passenger rail service could be. Um, the timetable study that we, we have done, uh, as well as an addendum to that, considering that there's um, also a business case being developed for Stonehouse Bristol Road Station um, to test the impact of that on mainline scheduling. Um, all of that's been done and been supplied to Network Rail who have uh, replied to us saying that our uh, timetable study is sound and valid uh, in terms of how it, uh, the service could possibly fit in with the, the mainline services. Um, and I think previous comments that we received from uh, Gloucestershire County Council relate to our ability to fit in with plans um, and the fact that the sharpness passenger rail service is not in the strategic rail plan, um, but that's because the strategic rail plan that was produced at the time only looked at mainline hub stations and uh, didn't consider branch lines. And I think it's important to, it's interesting since uh, listening from this morning session and, and right through till now, is that uh, you know many people are talking about vision and validate and the need to get away from predict and provide, um, but yet we're still talking about building roads. Um, and I think we, we need to take opportunities to sweat assets that we have that provide for car alternative options. Mr. Small made the point earlier on that there hasn't been enough discussion about public transport, and he's right. Uh, but we need to talk about that, where we have opportunities to make uh, the switch between car being the preferred choice, uh, sustainable transport being the obvious choice. And I think we need to, to start to push in that direction and stop talking about building more roads. So if, if you've identified um, the costs, have you identified funding sources? So we, ha we have looked at the operating cost and uh, the rate with which uh, the sharpness development will be rolled out and the, the, the provision of housing. And you will see, Mum, in the calculations that there is a, the operating cost spread out over the period of, of which houses will be built. And the rail service uh, we have programmed to, 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 to launch in uh, 1,200 units, uh, by which point there will be sufficient patronage in order to be able to, to have a, an operational subsidy uh, within a reasonable limit, um, and then three years hence from there, um, as the, the development progresses and the patronage increases, provided we don't build um, alternatives um, and th that we can con continue to promote that as the main mode of transport to the north, um, then we should be able to, to reach a balancing point after three years. Um, so th th that information is already in the calculations in the Statement of Common Ground. So... Um... In that, terms of your, your, your set up and the sort of the funding that you need to sort of get the infrastructure to get that service, um, yes. do you have that identified? Yes. Um, so Mark Eden is on the call as well, and his um, rail specialist company has, has done a, a detailed assessment of the, the capital cost required to upgrade the infrastructure to be able to operate a passenger rail service. Um, and, and coupled with the operating cost uh, together, um, our estimation is that it will be between 10 and 13 million to do that, which could be covered by the development until such time as the operational subsidy is no longer required. This is all obviously will need to be monitored in terms of the, the patronage and the uptake of the usage of the service over time. Um, but we have done uh, detailed calculations of the operating cost as well as the capital cost for the infrastructure required to operate the service. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Small, a very quick point ma'am um it's a shame the rail industry isn't here to speak for themselves but it's a matter of public record that the uh line the main line between uh, cheltenham gloucester through cam and dursley station to yate bristol parkway and bristol will be operating every half hour in both directions from the start of May 2023. We did highlight it in our response to the Reg 22 consultation lately. That is now absolutely uh, something that is uh, timetabled. You can buy tickets on this half hourly service. But what, what really I think is worth emphasizing is it, it, it absolutely, um, it's exactly as, as many have said, it's, it's horses for courses, what kind of sustainable modes you'd use. So given that we have now this half hourly 
rail service from the uh, Camford Dursley station right the way down to Bristol, calling all those key stations. The, the, the business case even that we were looking at and that I was looking at for even a, a coach service down the M5 to Bristol just falls away from those localities. It's already there. There's a highly relevant choice that uh, uh, that, that has uh, been done in partnership between Wecker and the Great Western Railway. So again, I think, um, Marms, you, you know, you and all stakeholders um, should have confidence that there are already major uh, rail improvements taking place that that that, that tend to support the, the basic sustainable movement corridor approach that, of course, lies at the, at the heart of the plan. Um, it does have some implications, no doubt, for uh, what happens on the branch line. That's not for me to talk about. But uh, anyway, I, I just thought it was worth mentioning that in the absence of the rail industry being here to make that point. Thank you. Mr. Drover. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I, I, I mean, there's so much going on there. That I think we'll save it for the sharpness day. I just wanted to bring it back to question 15. Um, uh, does the viability evidence support the plan make realistic assumptions about the cost? And we've got, there is a paper in on operational and revenue costs. And I think when the question I wanted answered was, and sorry, it sounds a bit petulant, it's not meant to, uh, Network Rail, have they, or the train operating companies, have they agreed uh, those costs? Um, it, it is very important for you know with the viability of the plan and the evidence um because we have a 2021 agreement to um the tie eight theoretical timetable which goes on to say all these other um bars must be met and i've seen no evidence that that, that anyone um, from the train operating company or, or network well have bought into those elements and i won't go into the detail but um 1200 units uh, the prevailing um uh, gloucestershire average rail is um, proportion is about two percent i think uh, so that would be uh, assuming one working person per household that would be 24 people uh, standing on the platform assuming they got all gone in the same peak hour so i mean it, we'll save it for the sharp nest day but then um, that's yeah. why I, I wanted sorry at the beginning to redirect to nick because i expect that we'll move to coach drt um, um, and other things like that um, as the the means to make it um, sustainable or try to make it sustainable um, and that's highlighted because the promoter has said it's the train service is not necessary to make the development acceptable uh, so I, I just want to fast forward through that but go back to the point um, yeah, realistic yeah. assumptions about cost I would the train operating rating company would be um, have quite would have something to say about the uh, operational cost, I'm sure. And have we got anything from them? Thank you. I, I, I've um, I think I've heard enough about sharpness. I don't really want to hear any more about that because um, we can talk about that in the sharpness specific session. Um, so just just looking specifically at the the question and just thinking about a more of a strategic answer. Can I ask the council? And presumably that's going to be Mr. To responding, um, just in terms of um, the level of um, response and input, have Network Rail had into the local plan and the the various sort of rail proposals that you have identified in here? I don't think that question's for me. I think it might be for yeah. um, Alex. Sorry, Chris. Yeah, I, I can come in there. Yes, we have engaged with Network Rail. Um, and we have in our IDP addendum an updated section on rail, which covers Stonehouse and Sharpness and the positions of network rail. And then also in the original IDP, which was published back in 2021. And um, so it's section 2.1.3, which covers um, the latest on Stonehouse and on Sharpness from network rail's position through that consultation. So from, from what... I could gather from that is that you have been talking to them and you've agreed to talk some more, but as yet, there's no sort of firm specific proposals. There's no funding specific identified. Um, there, there's no sort of talk about, you know, potential, um, you know, timetable gaps where there might be capacity for them to, to fit additional services in. Um, presumably there's the question of, um, you know, franchise specification, things like that. These things need to be sort of planned for in, in advance. So I'm just sort of trying to get a feel from you in terms of 
time scales, um, it, it takes quite a, a number of years for these things to feed through into the system for a, a train service to be up and running. So there's quite a long lead in time. So what I want to understand from you is, you know, where are the council with that? Because if you're still at quite early stages where you're agreeing to talk, then the actual point at which a train service will be being provided could potentially be some way down the tracks, if you'll pardon the pun. So, so in terms of the feedback that we've had from Network Rail, they've advised that there is capacity on the line between Bristol and Gloucester for an additional station. I know um, Stroud District Council have been um, working with Stonehouse Council on promoting the um, the Bristol Road Stonehouse station, um, and obviously feasibility studies. And the, there was a successful funding bid there. Um, and I think Mark has potentially got his hand up to come in and provide a bit more detail on that. Um, and then obviously the Sharpness um, promoters are, are working on their own proposals as well. Thank you. Mr. Russell? Uh, yes, just, just well, three points really. Um, point number one, we, we've got a statement of common ground with Network Rail, uh, which was submitted in February. So um, I, I, it essentially a short um, agreement that summarises the nature of the projects that we've, that we've been involved with so far and also puts forward um, some modifications relating to um, level crossings and the impact of developments on those on the rail network. So uh, I, I draw, draw your attention to that. In terms of the specifics, um, yes, so Stonehouse Station, we have been engaged very actively with Network Rail and indeed the train operators, particularly GWR, um, in terms of um, uh, uh, developing an outline business case for Stonehouse Station. So what that does, and am I, uh, the, the matter, the matter um, 11, uh, I think I summarise it 11.21.3 uh, 11 is essentially that the strategic outline business case concluded that there was a strong strategic and economic case for a new railway station at Stonehouse. Uh, served by one or two trains an hour. Served by one, definitely. Served by two, it would, de would, depend, would be dependent upon um, other um, infrastructure improvements at Gloucester, but that, they're also related to the Charfield station proposal in in south gloss so there is a there is more of a sort of sub-regional element to to to, to increasing the, the the transport services but there is certainly capacity on the line for um for an, for at least one service to stop at stonehouse in terms of the sharpness um case um we have been involved partly through the original restoring or railway bid but but more latterly through the promoter side promoters for sharpness um, have been in discussions with Network Rail about uh, identifying capacity to accommodate um, a service from Sharpness going northwards uh, to Cam and Dursley and, and onwards to Gloucester. Um, I'm sure the promoters would provide a little bit more of an update on the status of those those discussions. Um, but certainly, we believe that there is you know there is a reasonable prospect of the of that of that um infrastructure improvement coming forward through the development and because of the general uh investment in that line as as mr small has already indicated you know the the, the and also a, a, a more refer a more more of a reference to a a regional service rather than an, an intercity service there there is there is traction on that so the idea of intermediate stations and and picking up passengers from from beyond Birmingham and Bristol, uh, that's very much kind of on the agenda now. So we we believe that the, the direction of travel is very much in support of the, of the yeah. rail network improving and and and, and increasing the capacity to to develop a, a genuine alternative to the private car in terms of um, travel around Stroud and to its immediate neighbours. And Thank if. You. Um, thank you. So if the, um, the strategic outline business case concluded that a new station at Stonehouse wouldn't be viable, um, would that have any implications for the local plan? You know, are there, are there developments that would not be able to go ahead as a consequence? Um, so we, um, within the sustainable transport strategy, the key issue um, of effectively how do you improve sustainable transport to um, between the Stroud Stonehouse area 
um, and uh, and Bristol because it's the, the, there's a reasonable bus service already heading up in towards uh, towards Gloucester, but it's not particularly well served down towards Bristol. So we had three different options in terms of how those could be um, how, how that could be addressed. Clearly, the um, the new station at Stonehouse is our preferred option. Um, but there are also other options, including in, um, improvements to a bus service to Cam and Dursley um, and a more express coach service, potentially including interchanging at Junction 13. So there were three different sustainable transport options. And if the station falls away, then there are two other options waiting in the wings to replace it if, if needs be. Thank you. OK, now I have probably heard enough on question 21 for the time being. So bearing in mind, um, I don't want to get into sharpness um, because we have a specific site for that. I'm aware I've got Mr. Eden and Mr. Stolworthy's hands up. So um, bear those caveats in mind and make it brief, please. Thank you, ma'am. I'll go first. It was just really just to respond to a question that you'd raised earlier about um, speaking to Network Rail with regards to funding. And I just wanted to make the point that in case I hadn't made it earlier, that um, the, the detailed costing for the infrastructure improvements required to support the rail service doesn't require funding from Network Rail, um, and that can be funded by the developer. Um, and there is a, a rail service operating on there currently, which is the DRS service operates weekly, and so the, the, the line is maintained, and we've assessed the infrastructure requirements in order to bring it to a, um, a level which, which a passenger service can operate on, and that is, will be funded by the developer. So there's no requirement for funding from uh, Network Rail. Thank you. Mr. Eden? Mm -hmm. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to make a point that the um, uh, Mr. Small made. Um, <clears throat> it, it's, it's great that there is a half hourly um, service now uh, through, through Cameron Dursley, north and south. That doesn't invalidate um, any, any other rail proposals. Um, any, anything that, that, that might come from the branch line is then complementary to that, especially for anybody that wants subsequently wanted to make a, a journey southbound. Uh, because of course, then you're removing highway um, ca cars uh, from the uh, from the network that might otherwise um, use what would need to be an enhanced park and ride facility at Cameron Dursley because that actually isn't big enough to accommodate the number uh, the, uh, the the uh, the number of uh, trips that uh, that are likely to be made. Um, and then just picking up on Mr. Drover's point about costs being hypothetical. Um, the costs are not hypothetical. Um, we've got, we have a high degree of confidence in the costs that have been submitted. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so move, moving on to question um, two, just looks at the, um, the safeguarding um, of the Stonehouse site. Um, so it was just a, a query as to um, why Charfield uh, wasn't included. Um, and if there's uh, sufficient evidence um, at this stage to justify safeguarding land for these two potential stations. Uh, Mr. Carter. Sorry, on, on muted. Um, I, I think, well, to be honest, the reason why Charfield wasn't included is because it's going to be, it, it's in South Gloucestershire and it's not for Stroud to, to, to do that. Um, I think it's safeguarded in in terms of the Stonehouse Bristol Road station. Um, it's uh, it's safeguarded, um, and it's because it's the, the I mean it's the status of a of, it's a subject of a of a DFT funded SOBC. There's been a lot of extensive consultation with Network Rail and the train operators. Strong positive case for it, um, but we feel that there is sufficient momentum and sufficient evidence in order to justify um, safeguarding the land for um for the stonehouse station at this time thank you um uh, mccaffrey um thank you just a point on the rail um it's my understanding that there are some assumptions within the modeling so if for any reason rail didn't come forward traffic impacts could in fact be worse than modeled thank you thank you um C can i just clarify that that point yes, um on National Highways' request, we have a um, we have a scenario where we model um, the traffic mitigation in advance of modelling the sustainable transport mitigation. So the um, so there is a there is a scenario that does not rely on rail, um, which is part of what the mitigation scheme has has been based on. Um, and the I suppose the other point is in the sustainable transport scenario, as I referred to you earlier, um, we have three different options. 
for improving public transport between the Stroud Stone House area and and Bristol. Um, and if the Stone Stroud Stone House rail doesn't come forward, um, then the same trip destinations and the same mode shift would be then applied to um, uh, to, to the traffic forecasting. Um, I believe we are five percent lower if the Stonehouse station doesn't come forward in the earlier iteration of the modelling. But I think that's probably a point of detail that uh, that you may not be concerned with. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cockett. Thank you, Mum. Just some um, clarification in terms of Charfield. Um, that's at a far more advanced stage in terms of the business case for it compared to the other proposals. Um, so Wecker allocated about 2.9 million for the full business case to be prepared back in December 21. And Wecker's investment fund has since allocated 4.1 million to the station until 25, 26. Um, the planning application for the station was determined a couple of weeks ago uh, by South Gloucestershire so, um, and was approved. So I think it's a far different um, sort of uh, position within the stage of, uh, of making that overall case. Thank you. So we're now going to uh, skip ahead um, at this point through quite a few questions because a lot of it was really specific to the uh, discussion we had this morning. So I don't propose to ask any of those. It's just looking really at the um, exploring the junctions of the motorway network, which I think we had a, a, a fairly comprehensive discussion on this morning. So that being the case, I think actually I've probably got to the end of my uh, of the questions that I wanted to ask for today, um, because the rest of them were largely fairly detailed ones on the motorway junctions, um, and I've got the information that I need uh, sufficient to answer those. Um, so, has anyone got any further points that they would like to make at this stage, Mr. Long? Uh, thank you, Inspector. Uh, Chris Long, um, Ridge Traffic and Transport for Eco Tristy. Just a point of clarification, both um, Tritax Symmetry and National Highways appear to be represented by WSP today. Could you just ask them to clarify if there's any conflict of interest? Uh, I'm sure, <laughs> I don't know who wants to answer that, Ms McCaffrey. I'm happy to answer that. I can confirm there is no conflict of interest if um, if it's necessary, we can send the conflict register, but they are completely separate um, offices and offices. We did work with Tim Partridge and WSP through their planning application process, but it was um, Chinese wool. But if that is necessary, then it can be shared with you. Well, um, this is a matter of public record. It's gone out on uh, on uh, YouTube, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm happy to take that as your word. So thank you. Um, Mr. Toms. Are you muted? I think you're muted still. Is that better? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah, thank you very much. I've just two points to raise, really. It's, it's uh, the first was that um, Councillor Jones earlier talked about modal shifts, and uh, he was perfectly correct in what he said. And I'd like to quote one example to you and it's it, it bears on the discussion we've just had on uh, on rail um the plan has got a 30 percent aspiration for a improvement in rail services or improvement of rail take up um unfortunately the uh, amount of journeys undertaken by rail from Kem and dursley station is one percent of all journeys now uh, an increase of 30% on 1% makes it 1.3%, which I can't really think would make a great deal of difference to anything. Uh, the, the, the second point, and it comes back to local knowledge again. Earlier today, Mr. Russell made an assertion that because of the proximity of junctions 12 and 13, they're close to each other, that uh, residents of Whitminster, in fact, would... Uh, would use junction 12, they'd load it up. <clears throat> I can assure him based on local knowledge that that simply is not the case. Residents of Whitminster use junction 13 for any journeys, both north and south. They do not use junction 12. Thank you very much, Inspector. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gaze. Uh, thank you, Inspector. Yeah, just coming back to the comments uh, that were on the morning session that we were not uh, joining in on. Junction uh, 12, um, issues with that. Of course, people have to get to Junction 12, and it's how they get there. <laughs> and they get there from Wadden, they would be using the local lanes identified in the Mott McDonald report of March 2021 as a rat run running through from Matson, Upton Lane, and Hairsfield Lane, <clears throat> already running at something like 4,000 vehicles a day peak. Time, uh, peak. Um, so it's all right having issues to do with the junctions, it's how you get to the junctions. And it's the loading on our local lanes that is a real concern, uh, especially when Mark McDonald's report says their mitigation measures were don't take any action because it might encourage people to use the road. Well, is that burying your head in the sand or what? Because it really is a major issue and it needs to be looked at. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Alexander. Yeah, I've just got a, um, a point of clarification with the IDP addendum. Um, the Appendix A there details on a site-by-site -site basis um, the various schemes and costs associated with them. Um, it doesn't appear that the employment sites have been included there. It's just purely uh, residential sites. I don't know whether that's a, an oversight or not. And the other clarification I had um, was in terms of the work that's done on the sustainable su sustainable transport strategy addendum, um, has the modelling work been undertaken um, in the updated traffic forecasting report reflected the amendments made in the addendum or was that work to be done? Thank you. Thank you. Could the council just respond on those points, please? Uh, yes, Inspector, I can come in in relation to the IDP. So um, in terms of the costs that are included in um, Appendix A, that is largely due to um, inputs into the viability assessment for housing sites. So that's why we have those costs published there. Obviously, the IDP establishes itself a principle where if a development causes an impact on infrastructure or requires mitigation, then it's expected that necessary um, obligations are, are secured or, or new infrastructure in kind is secured. So it would be expected that employment allocations contribute towards improvements as necessary. Thank you. And again, presumably that's something that will be picked up through this sort of uh, look at the, the relevant policies with national highways to make sure that you've got the hooks in there that you need um, to make sure that all types of development are contributing where necessary to uh, the highway improvements required. Thank you. Um, Mr. Come, oh, shall I come back on the second point? Yes, about the, um So the revised mode shift in the STS addendum hasn't been run through the strategic model. Um, it's presented in the tab in tabular form within um, within the STS itself, um, and the main reason for that is because as we were, um, well, we were at effectively at the time of um, of of submission and imminently had progressing towards examination, and the matters that were outstanding between ourselves um, and the and the highways authorities were predominantly around. The impact on the motorway junctions and um, their, the scenario they were most concerned with um, was the was the impact without mode shift. So therefore, effectively rerunning another scenario um, with a slightly different level of mode shift um, wasn't seen as valuable to the evidence base at that time. Thank you, Mr. Choke. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, just a couple of points, if I may. The first one, going back to the point I raised earlier and res responding to Mr Carter's uh, response relating to um, policy DCP1 and achieving the highest possible share of non-car trips. Um, 
Mr Carter suggested that that was to be encouraged and was reliant upon the DM process to deliver that. However, if that were that approach were to be borne out, whilst there were fixed contribution formulae, uh, formulas attached to individual sites on a roof, um, um, <clears throat> roof tariff, <clears throat> there, there would be a perverse incentive for developers to simply accept that contribution and to curtail their efforts to invest in non-car travel modes, and particularly on the vision and validate approach. Um, this is something that we are looking at at the moment um, in relation to the Huntsgrove extension, um, which will be aware um, PS30 is a rollover of the existing allocation for Huntsgrove. Um, a planning application will be in this year on that basis. Um, the vision and validate <clears throat> approach, if taken to the extent of policy DCP1, requires investment. Um, it is not a simple travel plan approach. The STS takes a simple travel plan adjustment of 10%. It's not aspirational in its context. So there is a bit of tension between um, the infrastructure mitigation strategy, which I appreciate from this morning is a moving feast. Um, and dare I say, with the uncertainty raised about traffic growth forecasts, the point I'm making in terms of um, vision and validate, and particularly the uh, proposed allocations on the South of Gloucester Fringe, having a unique opportunity to exploit um, vision and validate, there, there could be merit in rerunning the model um, to account for that. But a more appropriate form of contribution, <clears throat> um, should it be required, um, would be a vehicular impact based assessment. Um, again, the work that we're undertaking suggests that um, a roof tariff for uh, the Huntsgrove extension would be disproportionate. And we do need to encourage each individual allocation to minimise <coughs> their car use. Um, the second thing I um, wanted to note, which I've alluded to already, is the fact that the scheme that I'm representing, the Huntsbury extension, is an existing allocation. Um, a planning application is being prepared to be submitted this year. Uh, Let me just jump in because we do. We are going to have a specific session on that, so there's no need to sort of dive into the specifics. No, that, that's absolutely fine, Inspector. I, I just wanted to make the point that um, this will be coming forward um, in a way that may, if, again, if there's a delay to the infrastructure. Um, our consideration may come forward in a way that um, either conflicts with that or perhaps sets a certain direction, particularly in the vision and validate approach. Um, and again, just picking up on this sort of viability um, point of view that there's only so many ways you can cut the, cut the cake. <clears throat> what policy DCP1 seeks to do is to give priority first and foremost to the non-car investment and to deal thereafter and only thereafter <clears throat> um, with um, accommodating uh, infrastructure improvements. And again, that is supported by Circular 0122. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fong. Come on, yes, I just, I just wanted to bring that point up as well. DCP1 is the focus of this local plan. And I think we need to just look at the criteria there. But firstly, it's delivering carbon neutral by 2030. Uh, and the first two criteria there is firstly minimise the need um, to travel. I, there's no need to repeat the policies in the, in the plan, I've, I'm, I'm okay. aware of uh, and, and obviously, I think what Mr Chek said has lots of validation there, because um, rather than looking at the previous predict and revive, we should be looking at vision and validate, but I think we should go a step further and look at the carbon calculation for each development, because that is exactly what we've done for both um, sharpness and for ecotricity, where we can demonstrate that there will be a significant reduction in the amount of carbon because of the uh, mitigation measures that we've adopted on both those developments. Now, it's, it's not a matter of business as usual, predict and derive, see how the junctions function, but it's trying to tr uh, change uh, the way we do things and change the way we actually travel within the district and despite our differences, myself and Mr. Small probably have the same ambition is to get people out of cars, get them into walking, cycling and public transport where we can. And that's a matter of 
prioritizing those measures where we can as well. So that, that, that would be my concluding note, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, I wanted to come back on uh, what Mr. Thomas mentioned earlier, but I'll just briefly respond to the point Mr. Fong raised. I, uh, I think we all agree with the uh, aspirations for sustainable transport and walking and cycling. But even looking at the most opti optimistic levels, there will only still be a tiny percentage increase. Um, however, however you cut it, that's where we are, um, like it or not. And we've got to deal with the practicalities of it. And I represent people in my ward, and um, it wouldn't be fair to suggest that there's going to be some massive move where almost everyone will be on public transport. That's not going to happen, I'm afraid. Um, coming back to what Mr. Toms mentioned with regard to access at uh, Junction uh, M5 Junction 13 and its impact on Junction 12, which uh, Mr. Russell raised earlier on. I absolutely agree with him. But uh, I think if we're bringing more people to this district, more houses, more employment, uh, I don't want to state the blindingly obvious, but a lot of people will be using cars. They will be joining the motorway. Uh, there will be more cars on the motorway and that will have an impact whichever junction you put them on. If you put them on at Junction 14, where we've talked extensively about the improvements that will be required, That'll have an impact up and down at 15 and 13. If you put them on at 13, it'll have a, an impact at junction 14 and 12 and so on. So to suggest that putting people on at junction 13 will have a terribly negative impact on 12, it may well have an impact, but that would be the same wherever you were on the motorway. So I, I just wanted to, uh, to make that point, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Drover. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, it was uh, just to uh, follow up Mr. Choke's point about um, vision and validate for, I'm not going to discuss sites, the Gloucester Fringe, we'll call it. There, There's definitely a scope um, for a more coherent um, movement pattern there to offset traffic vehicle trips. I mean, the severance caused by the railway and uh, the A38 and how people get away, get around and where they get to um, is, um, um, is something that yeah, all the promoters in that area could probably get together and um, and come up with a more coherent vision, uh, which would um, uh, obviously allow uh, um, more containment in the site and less uh, trips ending up at Junction 12 and at St Barnabas. Thank you. Um, what I would propose to do now is hand over to the council just um, as a the final response, um, just to sum up. Um, so I know, Mr. Carter, you have your hand raised. So um, if you want to sort of make any kind of final points that you would like to, and then, um, so I don't know, then if Mr. Russell, if you'd like to just come in to just sort of make any final, uh, oh, I can see my colleagues uh, got a hand up. Is there something you'd like to? Thank you. Um, I just wanted some clarity on, I'm looking at the transport funding and delivery plan, and I just wanted to understand the implications of our discussion, the focus discussion this morning, the implications of that on this uh, TFDP, because obviously this sets out uh, the amount of funding requirement per allocation, per site. Um, so if, as was discussed this morning in relation to the strategic uh, infrastructure, uh, particularly the motorway junctions, the costings is significantly higher than what is set out in here, what implications does that have on the viability of, of that, those schemes and the viability of the allocations so what i'm trying to understand is does i know that everybody's going to go away and and from the focus discussion this morning and have a uh, a discussion about whether some form of agreement or non-agreement uh, can be set out i'm trying to understand what the implications for this would be as in would the proportions still remain the same therefore the figures would go up Therefore, how would that impact on the viability of bringing those sites forward? Or is the, are the figures proposed as set out in the DFDP proposed to stay the same, as in the amounts that those developers would contribute towards those strategic infrastructure costs be the same? Um, but then there would then be more 
uh, requirement for external funding. So I'm just trying to understand, looking at this technical note, what implications would that technical note? Because it would basically, I'm just trying to understand what the implications of the discussions this morning has on this technical note, because the figures are now wrong in this technical note. So I don't know who, uh, well, council produced it. So, well, ACOM yeah. on behalf of the council. So, uh, Mr. Carter, is it your, yes, do you want I'll, to respond on that? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll So I can up. understand. Thank you. Yes, um, I mean, the, the, the original purpose of pulling this transport and funding and delivery plan together goes slightly deeper than um, than simply the apportionment. Effectively, we were at a position when, um, when the plan went through Reg, Reg 19, where we had responses back from Gloucestershire and National Highways wanting to know more detail on um, on how infrastructure was going to be um, was going to be packaged and delivered. So the first exercise we went through, um, which actually was actually pulling the packages together and effectively identifying what was and wasn't um, part of the strategic infrastructure, so that we could ma man manage the level of um, we, we we could manage the effectively the, the discussion um, going forwards. Now, part of that, um, as you will have heard throughout this morning. Um, we came across a number of hurdles in trying to progress the actual elements of, of this scheme, um, and but we have we've moved um, the, the issue a significant way forwards, but from where it were, was previously, which was that we now have a broad agreement about the scale of the schemes needed and what um, and what actually wasn't part of the funding and mitigation plan as much as what is part of the mitigation plan. Now, from a um, and the apportionment perspective, based on the traffic impact, and we may need to do some re refining some of this in light of comments around 150 dwelling thresholds, etc. There are some points of detail um, on, but the actual fundamental apportionment within Stroud um, is re is uh, is reasonably well um, reasonably well progressed. Um, now, the apportionment between Stroud and external areas no um, I, i'm not i'm not discussing that i'm looking at so for instance i'm looking at table you know table 10 table 9 and 10 in the yeah. tfdp yeah i mean i'm trying to explain what um how the process works and, and how it gets to a point and then what happens then okay so effectively we then have um the apportionment within stroud um as a percentage of, of the of Stroud's impact yes uh, now, the bit that. That, now the bit that we um is effectively the total number to which that percentage is is then applied now the um there is a there's an acceptance amongst everyone that we will need to be applying for for public funding um whereas the tfdp originally sought to try and get to a point where we could deliver it without reliance on public funding particularly because Stroud is a lower tier authority, is not in a position to be putting forward bids for public funding. And as you've heard, um, National Highways in Gloucestershire are not in, those in, in that position at this stage either. Um, so we tried to get to a point where we could, could get it like that. But ultimately, um, in terms of the viability impact, the gap in viability and the gap in funding with the top level scheme cost um, being undervalued, we will be seeking to progress that through a public funding source. Um, there are multiple public funding sources that uh, that could be available to us. Obviously, we need further detail on the planet uh, on on the planet itself, the housing on the um, on the other side of the border. Um, but fundamentally, we have. Um, I'm just trying to find the list of funding sources. Um, so we've effectively got funding from DFT, which could be applied for. Um, RIS is probably not going to be an option for, in this case. No, I, I, I don't. infrastructure funding. I don't need you to go through that list. All I want to understand is what the implications on uh, the funding amounts that are set out in this technical note would be for the individual sites. So that then when we come to look at the viability of individual sites, Am I looking at these figures that are in the technical note, or am I going to be looking at completely new figures? We would our, our position at this stage is that we would be seeking to um, fill the gap with public funding, and we've identified a significant. I mean, these schemes will. So these, so these figures in the uh, technical note then won't change. Is that what you're saying? 
I'm, I'm not necessarily saying they won't change, but we would seek to plug the gap through public funding. We no, I understand that. I understand there would be a a, a public uh, there would be a gap, a significant gap. But I'm trying to understand whether there would be any implications from the discussion this morning on viability of bringing forward any of the site allocations based on the evidence that we've got before us. So I'm looking at this technical note that obviously provides um, quite clearly provides some uh, apportionment to sites and I'm only talking about within the district not outside mm. so I'm trying to understand when we start to look at the viability because we'll be coming to look at viability in much more detail later in later session um, it, will that be changing will this technical note be changing or is it just staying as it is it's done its purpose and uh, so for instance let's just pick a you know, a site. So Javelin mm. Park, for instance, M5 Junction 12 has got 1.14 million in there. Will that, as a contribution, is not won't cover the entire cost, obviously, of M5 Junction 12, but is that contribution, because of the discussions that we've had this morning, that the cost of that um, uh, intervention at Junction 12 will now change, because there's an it's been accepted that it's a it will be a lot higher. Would that figure in the technical note before us change, or it, no? That's the figure that's in there. That's been plugged into the viability assessments. And yes, we know that the cost of the junction uh, twelve improvements will be higher, but that will be plugged by. We'll have to go for more external funding. So I'm just trying to understand: will the technical note change? Or not. We're not intending to change the technical okay. note. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the clarity on that. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Lucas. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Mr. Carter, if you'd like to continue, please. Um, yes, sorry, I lost my train. The uh, Sorry again, pun. Um, the So in terms of, I, I think that I was intending on coming back on a few um, on a few of the final points, but I think it's uh, as the nature of the session to try and make it a little bit more of a of a strategic comment. Um, I think there's been a lot of criticism of the plan and in either actual or or implied as a predict and provide plan. I think that that criticism isn't fair in terms of how it's been put forward and the evidence base around it and how. The, how it's intended to be applied through the development management process and in terms of the guide of the interventions that we want to come forward. There's been a lot of focus on motorway junctions because those are the strategic issues. And we are at a local plan examination it's hearing about strategic issues. Um, I think when we started preparing this plan in 2018, I believe 2018, 2019, it was quite uncommon for um, local plans to have a sustainable transport strategy, let alone have a sustainable transport strategy that's being um, that, that's actually being um, used at front and centre of an evidence base at, by the time it gets to examination. Um, so I think that's particularly laudable for Stroud as a highway authority, as a planning authority without a, a highways function. Um, and I just want to come back on a point that the, the sustainable transport strategy is not a business as usual travel plan. The first line in it in terms of getting mode shift is that 10% travel plan, but that's just the first line. There is, there's a lot else in there that's looking to, to come forward and the hook in order to do that is those delivery policies that require us to put forward a sustain, to require people to put forward sustainable transport solutions and, that allow, and the sustainable transport strategy that guides that investment. And it's really positive hearing what all the, what various site promoters are doing outside of that. Um, and that, but and that is in line with the strategy of of the plan as as a whole. Um, I won't go too much over to mom, over this morning session, um, but we have a um, we we are going to seek to agree those next steps on um, making progress on the um, on the strategic junctions. Um, in part of that, I think we need to be talking about as what well, yes we are we're being asked to look at the timing of it. How can we um, how can we meaningfully progress a timing point given the um, given the uncertainty around us? And we will be um, we will be looking into that as a as a as a, as a discussion point. Um, and also, given the change in in the world over the last couple of years, um, 
what does that do in terms of um, in, in terms of growth forecasts? And actually, are we looking at a? Um, I, I think it's a, I think it's going based on the evidence that we have in front of us. I think it's unlikely that the need for schemes at these two junk at these two motorway junctions goes away. I think the um, I think the timing of it. Um, I think there was potentially more headroom than we uh, than we currently have um, is uh, um, within the um, within the evidence base. Um, that is effectively. Um, I think that's the summing up comments from from me. I don't know whether Mark or Alex want to add anything as on behalf of the council. Um, look, I can see Ms. McCaffrey has just put her hand up, so I'll just. I don't. I don't want to open the floor up again. Um, but I'll just ask. Um, Ms McCaffrey to just come in with your hand being up. Thank you. Um, apologies. It was in response to the question that um, your colleague um, asked, actually, and I know it's not our local plan, but just a, a view from National Highways is actually the contributions probably have already changed. There are promoters already um, suggesting the contributions aren't correct and if infrastructure is significantly higher that has to be considered. Yeah. I mean we noted that WSP negotiated down the impact at um, at Junction 12 based on a revised scheme but what that um, what that did is actually part of that negotiating down was as a result of um, a reduction in actually the level of impact of the scheme in the first place so I think there's, I mean, clearly we're at, we're at plan stage. We don't know what, where the contributions are coming, coming from, from, from elsewhere. But um, the tech, what I think what the other inspector was asking is, are we going to be changing the technical note in, um, for the viability hearing, or are we going to be taking this as a point in time, which will then be progressed when further public funding bids are, um, are, are looked into? Thank you. Having said that, if there are figures in there that you know are not correct, then that's not really much use to us as inspectors in terms of looking at sort of sites and the, the viability. Um, but I mean, to your knowledge, are there? I mean, you've mentioned one instance. Are there other figures in there that you that you know have changed subsequently? Not to my knowledge. Um, that was specifically as a result of a change in the. Um, in the actual impacts of the scheme. Um, and that was addressed through the development management process rather than through the local plan process. Okay, well, I think it would be useful if the council could just have a look at that um, particular table that my colleague has referred to. And if there are figures in there that have changed as a, as a matter of fact, um, then it would be useful to have the, the updated position because that will certainly help feed into um, the, the site allocation sessions on it when we're having discussions about viability in the in the more detailed sessions on that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Russell, would you like to make any comments? Oh, Mr. Small, I can just see you. I, again, I'm just- Very, 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 very quickly. Is right. it, yeah, is, no, very quickly for clarity, is it not the case that, Madame, you'd want to have the public transport figures, rough, you know, budget figures in before you as a, you know, so you've got a single point of truth about the, the various measures, including public transport, whether services or infrastructure as part of that, of that refresh of that, of that work by, by ACOM. Well, what, of, what my colleague was asking about was the specific bit of evidence that's already been submitted and right figures in that that may or may not need updating so when we're not at, we're not at this stage asking for more evidence it's just the evidence that we've got if it transpires that the figures aren't correct or will no, be I understand that was her question yeah. but the issue that we've had is that there's a whole raft of costs that are not actually specified within any part of the evidence base related to public transport and obviously as you're looking at viability and around you know surely you'd want those as well um, are they going to be tied in with specific sites? Yeah, they would be, absolutely. Yeah, so it would be most useful to us, I think, when it, it comes to the specific sessions that where we are talking about those sites, that you flag it then, because then we're going to be really drilling down into the... Uh, that's great, that's great. 
but okay. the, the promoters have got all of that so they'll they'll be able to to speak to that very very okay. adequately i'm sure Perfect. brilliant thank you okay, great thank you um if i could pass to mr russell then just for uh, any final comments or remarks that you would like to make on behalf of the council thank you uh, it's been a very interesting session today i i, I don't well, I'm not going to go and repeat uh, all of the detailed points that we made, but just wanted to come back to the, the fundamentals. The fundamentals are we, um, as, a, as a district, we do have a north-south transport corridor, which is focused on three motorway junctions, uh, which are, um, two of them are under, uh, are at or nearing capacity. We have undertaken a sustainable transport strategy to try to minimise the impacts on the um, on those motorway junctions and those uh, interventions are positively identified in the plan in the strategic site allocations. We've also undertaken a, a, a robust uh, highway impact assessment, which all parties agree in terms of the, the best available evidence. Um, and the and, and the best approach that we could have taken in the circumstances. And we translated that information through into the IDP. Now, I, I do accept that there's a little bit of additional work to be done in terms of translating those highway improvements, particularly in terms of the motorway junctions into the strategic site allocation policies, and also clarifying in the policies, particularly EI-12, to ensure that there is a clear trigger uh, between the policy and the and the um, infrastructure improvements themselves, uh, what we try to do is it, to deliver this in very taxing and difficult situations. Given all of the uncertainty that we've already talked about, is is put forward a funding and delivery plan which is robust. Now um, we discussed that today. I don't think anybody has. Uh, fundamental objections to the principle of that funding and delivery plan. I think there's matters of detail to be undertaken in terms of um, costs, uh, apportionment, um, and phasing. And, uh, uh, and uh, as as Chris has said, we will try our utmost to do to, to work with all parties to achieve a successful outcome on those on those points. But I suppose ultimately, I want to to rest with with our position which is given these trying circumstances and the, the fact that we are in a we're in advance of our neighboring authorities we try to provide an evidence base which is proportionate which provides a reasonable prospect of this uh plan being delivered and the infrastructure that's required being delivered um and um i i just i just uh, just a heartfelt plea to uh, the inspectors that you know the, the bigger picture here is that we're trying to deliver the government's growth agenda and we're trying to do it in the most sustainable locations that we possibly can we cannot kick the can down the road we must find a solution and if that is um parties beyond us including national highways uh, as custodians of the strategic route network uh, coming forward and being positive and identifying solutions with us in a collaborative way then we are more than happy to uh, keep talking and uh, hopefully by the end of this examination process have a robust solution that we can re recommend to you thank you very much I think Alex wants to come forward with yes. the final comments sorry thank you inspector it was just in relation to um, the comment around the absence of public transport interventions in the local plan there are a number of different public transport schemes identified both in the sustainable transport strategy and also in the IDP. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, we welcome Mr. Small's um, comments on those and, and we're happy to share the, the project tracker and the IDP with him for review. And if he has any updated schemes that he thinks should be included in the IDP, obviously we can consider those, but uh, we have considered it. Um, so I just didn't want to let that um, be unheard. Thanks. Thank you. OK, well, thank you very much for everyone's contributions today. It's uh, it's very much appreciated. And as I've said, um, myself and my colleague will uh, will go away and uh, reflect on uh, what we've uh, heard today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.